Chapter 34 of The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Andy Glover The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls By Elizabeth O'Neill Chapter 34 The Seventeenth Century the seventeenth century was different in many ways from the sixteenth. Things were settling down. Religious questions were still very important, but other things became still more so. Yet one more great war of religion was fought in the first half of the seventeenth century. It was the great struggle between the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation in Germany. It began in 1618 and ended in 1648 and is always called the Thirty Years' War. The emperor at the time was Ferdinand of Styria, who had been a pupil of the Jesuits, and was as eager a Catholic as Philip of Spain had been. He was anxious to make as many of the German states as possible Catholic again. The little Protestant kingdom of Bohemia, generally elected as its king, the prince who was going to be the emperor, and it elected Ferdinand in this way. But when the Bohemians saw that Ferdinand was going to be hard on the Protestants, they said they would not have him for their king, and chose instead Frederick, the Elector Palatine, the ruler of one of the German states called the Palatinate. Frederick had married the daughter of James I of England, who had become king of England when Elizabeth died in 1603. James was the son of Mary Queen of Scots, but had been brought up as a Protestant. Frederick naturally thought that James would help him, but James always took a long time to make up his mind about anything. He was a clever man in some ways, and proud of his learning, but he never really understood other men. He was always so long in making up his mind how to act towards other countries that people despised and laughed at him. Someone said that he was the wisest fool in Christendom, he was the only one of the Stuarts who was not good-looking. His curious loose limbs and weak face gave a good idea of his character. Frederick was driven from Bohemia, and even from his own Palatinate, before James had made up his mind to help him. And when he did send help, it was of little use. James was full of an idea that countries should not fight with each other about religion and he was anxious to show how tolerant he was by marrying his son to a Spanish princess. Then he thought that Spain would help him against the Catholic emperor, but all this was nonsense. The Spanish king would never marry his daughter to a Protestant prince, though he did not say so immediately to James. Meanwhile, the struggle between Ferdinand and Frederick had become a fight between the emperor and the Protestant princes of the empire. It was the last great war of religion, and one of the most terrible that have ever been. For thirty years the Germans suffered in the most terrible way, and at the end of the war, half of all the people had been killed. A great soldier called Wallenstein was the chief general on the emperor's side. He did not really care very much about religion, but he wanted to give the emperor real power over all Germany and this frightened the Protestant princes very much, for till this time they had been like little kings in their own states. Wallenstein's soldiers loved him and were proud of him. He won many victories, and the Protestants were almost in despair when the great Protestant king of Sweden, Gustavus Adolphus, crossed with an army into Germany to help the Protestants. The king of Sweden was afraid that if the emperor got real power over the northern states of Germany, as far as the Baltic, he would then threaten Sweden. Gustavus Adolphus was a very earnest Protestant, too. When he landed in Germany, the Protestants crowded to follow him. At first he was victorious everywhere. He encouraged his men by telling them that a good Christian could never be a bad soldier. At first he did not fight against Wallenstein, but against another general named Tilly. But at last he met Wallenstein at the great battle of Lutzen. Even here the Swedes were really victorious. But towards the end of the battle, a thick fog covered the armies. And in the darkness, 
Gustavus Adolphus, the Lion of the North, was killed. He had said goodbye to his people before he left Sweden, holding his little daughter Christina, who was only three years old, in his arms. She was now Queen of Sweden, but when she grew up she became a Catholic and so gave up her crown. She lived most of her time in Italy and was one of the cleverest women of her time. In a little over a year after the Battle of Lutzen, Wallenstein was murdered. He had always wanted to have things very much his own way, and the emperor was afraid that he might even turn against him, and as the general could make the soldiers do anything he wished, this would have been very dangerous. So Wallenstein was declared a traitor, and soon after, some men, hoping to please the emperor, for whom he had done so much, murdered him. After this the war went on for many years. The French, under the great Cardinal Richelieu, helped the Protestants, although, of course, France was a Catholic country. He did this to keep Germany weak, for, in the 17th century, there were only a few statesmen, like Gustavus Adolphus, who were really fighting for religion. The others made it an excuse to bring about the things that they wanted. At last, when peace was made by the Treaty of Westphalia, in 1648, things were not altered very much. The northern states remained Protestant, and the southern states Catholic. The son of the elector Frederick, who was now dead, got half of his Palatinate back, but Bohemia remained to the emperor. After this, the emperor had less power than ever in the empire. He became, really, the ruler of Austria, with Hungary and Bohemia, the countries which still belonged to the emperor of Austria. The little states of the north and west of Germany remained separate, until two hundred years later, the ruler of one of them, Prussia, which had grown stronger and stronger, won the rule of the others, and so began the German Empire of today. In the seventeenth century, all the rulers in the countries of Europe were really absolute. That is to say, neither the people nor the nobles had any power, but had to do just what the kings ordered. In many countries in the Middle Ages, there had been the beginning of parliaments, in which the people had power to help in the government of their country. But only in England had this power grown. In England, too, Parliament had lost much of its power under the absolute rule of the Tudor kings. Still, Parliaments did meet, and even the Tudor kings pretended at least to take the advice of Parliament, though really the Parliaments passed any laws which the king ordered them to. But, towards the end of Queen Elizabeth's reign, the Parliament, several times, sent very plain messages to the Queen. They complained of the way in which she gave some of her favorites monopolies, that is, the right to trade in certain things. When a monopoly was granted, no other person could sell that thing, and the favorite could charge almost any price he liked. This was very hard on the people, but when Parliament complained, Elizabeth was wise enough to give way. But when James I came to the throne, troubles began between the king and Parliament. And when his son Charles I became king, a real struggle began, which ended in the Great Civil War. The Great Civil War in England. Charles I became king of England in the year 1625. He was a handsome man and very good and religious. He married a Catholic princess, Henrietta Maria of France, and he always loved her and his children very much. Charles was almost a saint in some ways, but he was not a wise king. He could never understand that Parliament had a right to help in the government of the country. He saw how other kings ruled absolutely, and he could not understand why the English king should not do the same. Parliament first really began to quarrel with the king about religion. Archbishop Laud of Canterbury was a great friend of Charles. He wanted to make the English church very much more like the Catholic church that it had grown to be. He was fond of ceremonies, and he had the communion table railed off like an altar at the east end of the churches. He said that the sign of the cross should be used for baptizing babies. The Puritans in the church hated these things, which seemed to them popish. There were many Puritan gentlemen in the House of Commons, and they complained about these things in an act called the Petition of Right, 
Charles had to give his consent to the petition, but he soon sent the Parliament away, and for eleven years did without. But the king required money. Generally he had got it through grants made by the Parliament, but now he had to get it in some other ways. He began to gather taxes which had not been used for hundreds of years, especially one called ship money, but even then he could not get enough. The Scots too rose in rebellion, because Archbishop Laud had tried to force them to have a new prayer book, which was very like the English prayer book read in their churches. Scotland was now joined to England, but had a separate parliament. The Scots were much more Protestant than the English, and they hated the new prayer book. On the first Sunday it was to be read in the churches, a servant woman called Jenny Geddes threw a stool at the head of the preacher in St. Giles Cathedral, Edinburgh, and the people had to be turned out before the service could be read. When the Scots rebelled and an army marched into England, Charles had not enough money to fight them, and in the end he had to give way about the prayer book. He had to call Parliament again, and in 1640 the Long Parliament met. It was so called because it did not really come to an end for twenty years, though the friends of the king left it, and it suffered many other changes. The Puritans were now very angry against the king, and tried to take all power out of his hands. They tried, too, to get rid of bishops altogether from the English church, and make it much more like the Calvinistic churches of Scotland or Geneva. This made many gentlemen leave the Parliament and take the king's part. The Earl of Strafford, Charles's friend and chief servant, had his head cut off. Archbishop Laud was put in prison, and in the end, his head was cut off, too. At last, in 1642, the Great Civil War began. Nearly all the great lords were on the side of the king, though some fought against him. Charles had splendid horse soldiers to fight for him under his brave nephew, Prince Rupert. At first, the two sides were equal, but later Oliver Cromwell, a Puritan gentleman, got together a splendid army of foot soldiers. He drilled them splendidly and would have no drinking or swearing. They had to be what he called godly men. They came to be called Cromwell's Ironsides. In the end, Cromwell won. The king was taken prisoner and had his head cut off in front of the people at Whitehall. It was chiefly Cromwell who was determined that the man Charles Stuart, as he called him, must be got rid of in this way. Many people looked on Charles as a martyr, and he died very nobly and bravely, after saying goodbye to some of his children. On the morning he was to be executed, he put on an extra shirt, saying with a smile that he did not wish to tremble with the cold for fear his enemies might think that he was shaking with fear. His eldest son, Charles, escaped to France after many adventures, and for eleven years Cromwell and the Parliament tried to govern England. Cromwell tried to set up a republic, but he could never get a Parliament to suit him, and all the time he was really ruling like an absolute king. There were no more bishops, and the Puritans had things all their own way. Cromwell was a very earnest Protestant. He thought all the time that he was doing God's work. He had many wise plans for the government of England, but many of the people felt that he was really more of a tyrant than Charles I had been. When he died, his son was made Lord Protector, but England was tired of the new ways, and a message was sent to Prince Charles, asking him to come back and govern the country. There was great rejoicing when King Charles II rode into London on the 29th May 1660. The bishops were brought back, and there began a very merry time in the history of England. After the Restoration, as the return of Charles was called, the Puritans had a very hard time. Although Charles the Merry Monarch had promised to give them liberty of conscience, he could not have been kind to them, even if he had wished. For the new parliaments, full of love for the king and angry at the memory of the sorrows of his father, were determined to have their revenge. The bodies of Cromwell and two of his friends were taken from their graves in Westminster Abbey and hanged on the scaffold. They were buried again, but of course not in the Abbey. Charles II was always very careful not to interfere with the rights of Parliament, and so 
England was the one country whose government left some power to the people. Later, when the peoples of other countries rose up and fought for power, they imitated the English government, so that our parliament is often called the mother of parliaments. The Puritans could no longer preach or teach or meet together for prayers or services. Those who did so were thrown into prison. One of the most remarkable men who was put into prison at this time was John Bunyan, the son of a Bedford tinker. He was a very good and religious young man, but he tortured himself over his sins, the worst of which were dancing on the village green or ringing the church bells. To the Puritans, nearly every amusement was a sin, and Bunyan thought himself very wicked because he loved these things. But in the end, he gave them up and became a preacher. He was put in prison after the Restoration, and in Bedford Jail, he wrote the wonderful book called *The Pilgrim's Progress*, which tells the story of how a man named Christian traveled to the Celestial City and all he suffered on the way. But it is really the story of any soul which is struggling to get rid of sin and find peace. John Bunyan was not an educated man. But he wrote simple and beautiful English, and his book is still read by everyone today. John Bunyan was the great Puritan prose writer, but the Puritans had their great poet too. This was the blind poet John Milton, whose greatest work was a wonderful long poem called Paradise Lost. But many Puritans fled overseas to a land where some who believed as they did had already made their homes. It will be interesting to hear something of their story. End of chapter thirty-four. Chapter thirty-five of the story of the world: a simple history for boys and girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer. Please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the World: A Simple History for Boys and Girls, by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter Thirty-Five: The Pilgrim Fathers. When the English Puritans found that they could not worship God peacefully in their own way at home, many of them made up their minds to sail away to America, and make new homes for themselves there. And so be free to worship as they pleased. The colonization of North America by the English had already begun. It had been very difficult indeed. The first man who had tried to set up a colony there was Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who took men and ships to Newfoundland. But everything went wrong, and soon the men begged to be taken home. It was the stormy time of the year. And the smaller of the two ships, which were all that were left, was really not fit to cross the sea at such a time. But Sir Humphrey sailed in this. One night the ship went down in a storm. But the men on the other ship told how they saw Sir Humphrey sitting calmly with his Bible in his hands, comforting his men as the ship went down. The next attempt was made by Sir Humphrey Gilbert's brother-in-law, Sir Walter Raleigh. One of the cleverest and handsomest of the courtiers of Queen Elizabeth, and a great favourite of the Queen, until the last years of her reign, when he fell into disgrace. But while he was still in her favour, he sent out two ships to find a spot on the coast of North America suitable for a colony. The captain sailed like Columbus to the West Indies, and then along the coast to a place a hundred miles north. It was a beautiful spot with forests filled with birds and grapes growing in the open air. When the captains came back and told Raleigh about it, he said that his new colony should be called Virginia, after Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. Raleigh did not go himself to his colony, though he had been on voyages before to America. It is often said that it was Sir Walter Raleigh who brought the potato plant to Ireland. And first smoked tobacco in England, but it was probably Sir John Hawkins who did both these things, though Sir Walter was a great smoker too. But these first colonists in Virginia 
did not want to work hard. They were always dreaming of gold, and gold is not to be found in North America so easily as in the South. So one day, when Sir Francis Drake sailed up with food and men for the colony, the colonists begged to be taken home. Rayleigh did not despair, but sent out more colonists, this time with women to make the homes comfortable. A baby was born in Virginia, and was called Virginia too. But these colonists soon came back also. Rayleigh did not try again. He spent the last years of his life as a prisoner in the Tower of London. It had been said that he had plotted against King James I, when he first came to England, and he was condemned to death, but kept in prison instead. While there, he wrote in very fine English part of the history of the world, but it was never finished. Rayleigh was always dreaming of his old adventures. Men in those days told of a wonderful city full of gold in Guyana in South America. They called it El Dorado. Rayleigh begged King James to give him ships to go to find this city and bring back gold. James allowed him to go but said he must not go near the land of the Spaniards. He must have known that this was ridiculous, but he was pretending to be friendly with Spain. Sir Walter went, but fell ill on the way. When he reached the mouth of the great river Orenico, he sent his young son Walter on with some of the men up the river to find the mine, but the Spaniards attacked them and little Watt, as Sir Walter fondly called his son, was killed. No gold was found, and Rayleigh came back broken-hearted to England. The Spaniards complained to James, and though he would have been only too pleased to forgive him if he had brought home the gold, James, to please the Spaniards, said he should have his head cut off after all, and so he had. He died like the brave man he was, and though he had not been a great favourite with the people in the last years of his life, every one was sorry for him, and felt that the English king had not been just to the man who had loved England so much. Rayleigh had said, I shall yet live to see Virginia an English nation, and before his death new attempts were made to found a real colony that would last in Virginia. During Elizabeth's time, great riches had come to England, and the richer people and the people of the middle class had begun to live much more comfortably. New and bigger houses were built, and windows of glass, which had been very uncommon, now became quite common. Even Erasmus, who was used to the great poverty of many students at the foreign universities, had complained of the dirtiness of the floors in English houses, and the Spaniards at Queen Mary's court had said, the English had their houses built of sticks and dirt, though they ate like kings. In Elizabeth's time chimneys were put into the houses, and there was more air and chance of the people being healthy. Carpets were used instead of the old floor coverings of rushes, which had been very dirty. In the Middle Ages people had slept with logs of wood for their pillows, except the very rich people but in Elizabeth's time even poor people had bolsters or pillows, and the rich used feather beds, though these were fought great treasures. Instead of the old wooden plates, people now began to have silver or pewter and glasses to drink from, but while the rich grew richer, the poor grew poorer, for it had been so ever since the destruction of the monasteries by King Henry VIII, for there were other causes for it, at the end of Elizabeth's reign, the first poor law was passed, which made the people of each town or village pay rates to buy food for the poor people who could not earn their living. It was partly this, perhaps, which made Englishmen leave England and try to earn their living in America. At the beginning of James I's reign, another little band of Englishmen, 140 altogether, sailed in three ships to try once more to make a colony in Virginia. A poet wished them good luck, to get the pearl and gold, and ours to hold, Virginia, Earth's only paradise. But again it was this wish for gold which nearly ruined the new colony. 
they landed at the mouth of the Chesapeake River, and they called the town which they built Jamestown after King James I. Only a few of the men were used to work, and the same thing happened as before. There was not much food, and the men began to die. The Indians, too, attacked them. John Smith, the first great English colonist. At last, a young man named John Smith, a very strong and determined person, made himself the leader or captain. He defended the town against the Indians and led little groups of men in hunting expeditions to bring back food. He was once taken prisoner by the Indians and led away to their king. His head was laid on a stone and the Indians were just going to kill him with great wooden weapons when a little Indian girl called Pocahontas the daughter of the king rushed forward and put her head on his. So the king let him off and he was taken back to his colony. At last, through his great courage and the way he managed his men, the colony began to do well. He made everyone work six hours a day, and he made a rule that any one who swore should have a can of cold water poured down his sleeve. This made the men laugh very much. It was now seen that work was the secret of success. Hundreds more men with their wives and children went out to the colony, and so Virginia was the first successful English colony. It soon set up its own little parliament called the House of Burgesses. It was not a Puritan colony, but kept the religion of the English church and used the prayer book. Soon the land was divided into larger states. Younger sons of English gentlemen went out and became planters. The thing they grew chiefly was tobacco. Many Negroes were brought to work on the plantations. There were some poor white people too, and some were even used as slaves. But there were not many of them, and generally they were allowed to go free. They did not require much to keep them in such a mild country, and lived idly and happily enough. The second great English colony in North America had a very different beginning. It was a Puritan colony. When James I came to England, the Puritans, who had been persecuted under Elizabeth, hoped that they would now be well treated by a king who had been brought up in Scotland. But James was quite tired of the Scottish religion, which did not show enough respect to kings. He was never tired of saying, that no bishop meant no king. Puritans were very disappointed. As soon after the beginning of James's reign, the people of a church at Scrooby in Nottinghamshire made up their minds to go to Holland, where they would be free to worship as they chose. But after twelve years they decided to go to America, and so crossed over to England again. and went on board a ship called the Mayflower, then of a smaller ship, and so sailed off men, women, and little children, with all they possessed, to find a home in a new and strange land for the sake of their religion. They meant to land in Virginia, but after a voyage of sixty-four days, during which they were very crowded together and miserable, they reached land far north of Virginia, and they made their new colony there. The men built a new town called Plymouth, while the women and children stayed on the ships. After a terrible winter, the Mayflower was ready to sail back to England. But not one of the colonists wanted to go back with her. As time went on, new settlers joined the colony, and Plymouth became the chief town of the great colony of Massachusetts, a name which was taken from the Indians. The memory of the Pilgrim Fathers as the first settlers in this great Puritan colony were afterward called, is honoured by all the world today. As time went on, new colonies were formed in New England, as the lands around Massachusetts, where the English were settling, were called. Some were started by people anxious to grow rich, but the greater number of colonists were people who left England in order to be free to worship as they pleased. Before the end of King James I's reign, an English nobleman called Lord Baltimore, who had become a Catholic, 
started a colony for Catholics. His son governed it after him, and it was called Maryland, after King Charles I's Catholic Queen Henrietta Maria. But England was not the only country which had sent out colonists to this part of America. After its great struggle with Spain, the little Republic of Holland had become very rich and important indeed. In fact, it became the most important country of all on the seas. The first half of the 17th century was the great time in the history of the Dutch, just as the 16th century was the great time of Spain, and the later 17th century the great time of France. The Dutch ships had nearly all the trade of the world. Even when merchants of other countries bought things from far-off lands, they got Dutch ships to carry them, so that Holland had what was called the carrying trade of the world. And just as other countries at their great times have had great writers, or poets, or philosophers, or painters, so in the 17th century the Dutch painters were the greatest in Europe, the chief of them were Rubens, Rembrandt, and Van Dyck, the great portrait painter who painted portraits of Charles I and his children, and many of the great English men of his time. But the English, too, were now very great at sea, since their victories over Spain, and they made up their minds to become even greater than Holland. And so a great struggle began under Cromwell, Cromwell had a navigation act, passed, by which things bought from other countries could only come in English ships. Before this, the Dutch ships had done a great trade between England and America or the East, and the new act was very bad for their trade. They were very angry, and soon a war broke out between the two countries. In the battles which followed, sometimes the great Dutch Admiral Tromp and at other times the brave English Admiral Blake were victorious. After Cromwell and Tromp and Blake were all dead, the struggle still went on. The Dutch had an even greater Admiral than Tromp, named Ruiter, and on the English side Prince Rupert fought against him. Once after a victory, Admiral Tromp had tied a broom to his mast and said he would sweep England from the seas. But after all, Holland was only a very little country, and in the end England won the command of the seas and has kept it ever since. Holland, too, had sent out colonists to North America, and their land, called the New Netherlands, lay between the colonies of New England and Virginia. Its chief town was called New Amsterdam, but during the war between the two countries, the English took New Amsterdam, when peace was made, they were allowed to keep it. Its name was changed to New York, after James, Duke of York, the brother of King Charles II, who became King of England afterwards, and was called James II. New York, which is the greatest town in America today, now became the capital of a great English colony. The last of the colonies founded in North America, for the sake of religion, was Pennsylvania, it was founded at the end of the reign of Charles II by William Penn, a Quaker. The Quakers were looked upon as very dangerous people indeed, even worse than the Puritans. They lived very strict lives, always dressing very plainly. They thought it wrong to take an oath or to become soldiers, and many men among them, who would not fight against the Dutch, were put in prison and even whipped. At last... William Penn, a Quaker gentleman, got the king to let him have some land near New York for a colony of Quakers. He wanted to call the new colony Salvania, or the land of the woods. But the people said it must be called after him, and so it was called Pennsylvania. There were thirteen colonies altogether in North America at the end of the 17th century. The northern colonies were different in some ways from the southern. They did not grow tobacco and large plantations, but were divided into farms. There were not many Negro slaves there, because they were not so much needed. 
most of the colonists treated the Indians very badly, except the people of Pennsylvania, and they began to die out. Today there are only a few hundred of the redskins left. It is a pity in some ways, for some of them were very simple and gentle people, though others were fierce and cruel. Although so many colonies were begun by men who wanted freedom of religion, each colony had its own religion, and people who believed in a different religion were not allowed to live there, except in the one little colony of Rhode Island, which tolerated all religions like the little kingdom of Holland did. People at that time thought very little about these colonies, yet from them grew the great country of the United States, where so many millions of English people live today. End of chapter 35「Chapter thirty six of the Story of the World: A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 36 The Age of Louis the Fourteenth. In the year 1643, the year after the great civil war broke out in England, a little French prince, only four years old, became king of France. A story is told that as his father lay dying, the child had said to him, I am Louis the Fourteenth," and the father answered, Not yet. The little Louis the Fourteenth grew up to be a very remarkable king, but he was always thinking about himself, just as he had done when he was only four years old and standing beside his dying father. All the time that Louis was growing up, Cardinal Mazarin was doing his best to go on with the work of Cardinal Richelieu and make France the greatest country in Europe. They did their work so well that by the time King Louis the Fourteenth was old enough to rule France himself, France was very great indeed, so great that at last it seemed that the thing which people were always trying to prevent had happened, and that the balance of power in Europe was upset. In the end, nearly all the countries of Europe were joined together to fight France. Louis the Fourteenth was not really a clever man. He was very vain and self-willed, yet even his great idea of his own importance and his determination to make other people feel it did help to make France great. Under Louis, French trade was made much better, and for the first time France had a good navy, which became, for a short time, as great as either the English or the Dutch navies. Louis looked on himself as the center of France, the sun from which everything drew its brightness and even its life. He took the sun as his emblem, and was often called le roi soleil. Although Louis had not a great mind, he had very fine manners, and everyone felt that he was a great king. He could never have done as much for France as the great Cardinals Richelieu and Mazarin had done. It was they who gave France its great time. There were great writers in France because Richelieu and Mazarin had made France great. And just as in other countries, France's great time in history was also her great time in literature. But it was Louis the Fourteenth who brought all the greatest men in France to his court, and many men from other countries too, so that the French court became the greatest court in Europe. French manners and French art became the fashion of the time. Other people did their best to imitate them, so that when we speak of the age of Louis the Fourteenth, we do not mean a time in the history of France only but a time when the French led the way in everything, and the other countries followed. 
At the court of Louis the Fourteenth, there were the two great playwriters, Molière, who wrote comedies, that is, plays which end happily, and Racine, who wrote great tragedies, that is, plays which end in great sorrow. There was the philosopher Pascal, and there was La Fontaine, who wrote fables, in which animals are made to speak and do things like men and women. All French children still love to read the fables of La Fontaine. Louis the Fourteenth built for himself the wonderful palace of Versailles, eleven miles out of Paris. He made the French people pay him a great deal of money so that he could build it. Visitors to Paris can still see it today, with its great rooms and galleries covered with gilt and with great mirrors all along the walls of some rooms, while others have pictures painted on the walls by the artists of the time. The great park of Versailles was filled with marble statues and wonderful fountains which are now turned on on Sundays so that the people who come out from Paris may see how beautiful they are. For the palace of Versailles is now used as a sort of museum and belongs to the people, for there are no longer kings in France. Louis the Fourteenth was not very friendly with the Pope, he wanted the king to have much more power over the church in France than other Catholic kings in other countries, and he had many quarrels with the Pope through this. Yet Louis was a very strict Catholic, so much so that he could not bear to think of the Huguenots, who, since Henry the Fourth had passed the Edict of Nantes, had been allowed to worship in their own way. There were thousands of Huguenots in the south of France. They were chiefly middle class and working people. Many of them worked at making things, especially silk, in which France had a great trade with other countries. Cardinal Richelieu had thought that the Huguenots had too much freedom, not in religion, but in governing themselves, and he had taken away many of their privileges. The people of La Rochelle, the great Huguenot town, had defied him, and he had besieged their strong city for fourteen months. At first they were able to get food from ships, which brought it into their beautiful harbor. But Richelieu built dikes right across the harbor, and no more food could be got in. The people, men, women, and children, died in thousands in the streets, and there were very few alive when Richelieu and his king, Louis the Thirteenth, rode into the conquered city. Still, the cardinal did not prevent the Huguenots from worshipping in their own way. La Rochelle had grown rich and happy again when Louis the Fourteenth suddenly said that he would no longer tolerate Protestants in France. The edict of Nantes was revoked, and the freedom it had given taken away. The Huguenot churches were knocked down, and children were taken away from parents who would not promise to bring them up as Catholics. Some of the Huguenots were put to death. Others were sent to work as galley slaves in the French warships. They were chained to their oars so that they could not escape. Many of the Huguenots made up their minds to flee away to Protestant countries, but even this was made very hard for them. The shores of France were watched, and so were the chief roads into other countries. Still, many thousands did get away, crossing into Switzerland and Holland and Germany, through forests and over mountains, where the king could not put soldiers to stop them. Often the Huguenots disguised themselves so that no one could tell who they were. One officer and his wife dressed themselves as orange sellers and traveled with a donkey carrying their oranges. Sometimes people hid themselves in empty barrels and were carried on to ships sailing for England. So many got away, though some were caught and taken back. Louis the Fourteenth got his way, and soon there was hardly a Protestant left in France, but it was a very bad thing for the country. 
Many French silk weavers settled down at Spitalfields in London and helped to make English trade better as others did in other countries. Many sailed away to America, finding peace and freedom like the English colonists before them. Others went to settle in the colony which the Dutch had set up at the Cape of Good Hope. All the countries of Europe were full of horror at this persecution of the French Protestants. The Pope himself blamed Louis for it. Only James II, the Catholic brother of Charles II, and now King of England, was pleased. Charles II, England's merry monarch, had always been much loved by the English people, but he had not really been very faithful to them. He had made secret promises to Louis the Fourteenth to try and make England Catholic again, and in return Louis had given him a great deal of money. But Charles the Second was wise enough to see that he could not really do this. It is said that he died a Catholic himself, but he never really had any hope of making the English Catholic. James the Second was quite different. He was a very strict Catholic, and though Catholics were forbidden by the English law to help in the government of the country, James took no notice of this, but gave the best positions to Catholics. This made the English people very angry, and when James's queen had a little baby born, they made up their minds to rebel against James for they knew that the baby would be brought up as a Catholic, and they hated to think that they would have Catholic kings forever. So they rose in revolt against James, who fled to France, where his wife and baby had gone before him. Then the English invited William of Orange, who had married Mary, James the Second's grown-up daughter, to come and rule England with his wife. And so they did. This is called the English Revolution of 1688. William the Third, as he was now called, was a descendant of William the Silent, who had saved the Netherlands from Spain. He was the ruler of Holland, and he was only pleased to become king of England too, because he wanted England to help him to save Holland, this time against the king of France. THE WARS OF LOUIS the Fourteenth. For long before this, Louis had been fighting with Holland, for he had made up his mind to join the Netherlands to France, and make the river Rhine the boundary of his country on the north as it was on the east. Louis had married a Spanish princess, who was half-sister to Charles the Second, the boy who soon afterwards became King of Spain. When King Philip the Fourth of Spain, the father of Louis's wife and of Charles the Second of Spain, died, Louis said that the Spanish Netherlands ought to belong to him because of his wife, and he immediately attacked them. He had a very fine general called Turenne, and in a short time the French had conquered all the chief towns of the Spanish Netherlands near France. The other countries were very anxious about the balance of power when they saw the French winning town after town, and England, Sweden, and Holland joined in what was called the Triple Alliance to prevent Louis conquering the Netherlands. So Louis stopped fighting for a time, but still he kept the towns he had won. He soon broke up the Triple Alliance. He made a secret treaty with Charles the Second, and also persuaded Sweden not to help the Dutch, for he had made up his mind now to fight and conquer Holland. Holland had always been a republic, but it had always elected a prince of the House of Orange as its stadtholder, as the ruler was called. The stadtholder was not a king, but a kind of president. Still, as he was always chosen from the House of Orange, that house had become a kind of royal family. There were some people in Holland who did not like this, and wanted not to give very much power to the young William of Orange, who was then growing up. 
Two brothers called De Witt were looking after the country when Louis the Fourteenth attacked it. The De Witts were brave men and loved their country, but they had not been wise enough to see the great danger Louis the Fourteenth was going to be. The Dutch navy was fighting the French and English navy too, and was not conquered. But the Dutch army was not ready and in order. As in the days of William the Silent, the dikes were cut, the land was flooded, and the French driven off. But the people were very angry with the Duits. One brother was put in prison, and when the other went to visit him, the two were attacked and killed. William of Orange now had things all his own way. He was a brave soldier and very ambitious. His whole life from this time was given to defending his country or keeping down the power of France. Yet he was not really a very noble character. He did not try to save the De Witts, but took no notice, as he did many times afterwards when cruel things were done which he could have prevented. He was a much more silent man than the William who had been called the Silent. This was partly because of the way he had been brought up. Without father or mother or any near relation, the De Witts had brought him up alone and always watched. They thought of him as dangerous to the Republic, which they loved, because the House of Orange had become like a royal family. He had begged them to let him have children of his own age to play with, but they would not, and in the end he learned to hide what he felt. He did not smile at good news or cry for bad, and he kept this quiet way till the end of his life. Yet when he loved, he loved passionately, and he hated just as passionately. Above all other things, he hated France and France's king. For six years there was fighting between France and Holland. The French generally won. Someone asked William, Do you not see that your country is lost? There is one way, he answered, never to see it lost, and that is to die in the last ditch. When, in 1678, Louis was forced by the other countries of Europe to make peace, Holland was still free. For ten years after this there was peace, but Louis was always offending someone and trying to steal land on the borders of France. Then came the English Revolution and William's great chance as King of England to fight Louis once more. Two years afterwards the Dutch and English fleets won a great victory over the French fleet at La Hogue. This was the end of the greatness of France on the seas. Long after the time of Louis the Fourteenth, France became a danger to Europe under the great Napoleon, but she was never able to get together a really great fleet. But on land Louis still won victories, though William of Orange fought so well that Louis never got any real gain from his victories. At last peace was made again in 1697. William of Orange was given some towns in the north of the Spanish Netherlands, with which he could keep Louis from attacking Holland again. He would much rather have gone on fighting Louis, but by this time the English were rather tired of it. They thought that William was making use of English men and English money to save Holland. But Louis the Fourteenth only made peace each time so as to be able to get ready for war again. And now Louis was very anxiously waiting for the death of Charles the Second of Spain, in order to get as much as he could of the land he ruled. Charles the Second had never been strong, and people had been surprised that he had even lived to be a man. Before he died, Louis and the Austrian emperor, who was also related to the king of Spain, had arranged that one of the emperor's sons should become king of Spain, while Louis was to have all the Spanish possessions in Italy. No one asked the Spanish people what they wished, 
but when Charles the Second died, they made up their mind that they would not have any king who had been chosen for them, but that they would choose their own. They chose Philip, the young grandson of Louis the Fourteenth. He was only a boy of seventeen. Unless his elder brother died, he would not become king of France and in any case Louis the Fourteenth had had to promise that he would not join the two countries. Yet, as the young King Philip was going away homesick and crying to his new kingdom, Louis said to him, Remember, there are no longer any Pyrenees. The Pyrenees are the mountains between France and Spain, and Louis meant that after this Spain would always be joined to France and help her in her wars. William of Orange was very anxious indeed, and he wished with all his heart that the English people would once more declare war against France. Then Louis did a foolish thing. Poor King James the Second of England was dying in France, and Louis the Fourteenth promised him that he would do all he could to have his son, the little baby who was born in 1688, made King of England when William of Orange should die. When the English people heard of this, they were very angry, and so at last William got his way, and they gave him men and money to help him to fight Louis once more. But just at this point William died. He had never been very strong, and he had worn himself out. Mary, his queen, was dead already, and so her sister Anne became Queen of England. The son of James the Second never had any chance of becoming King of England, although in the year 1715 he did cross over to Scotland, hoping to win England with the help of the Scottish Highlanders, but failed completely. He lived nearly all his life in Italy, where he married and had children. He was always very sad, and people called him Old Mr. Melancholy. He is generally called the Old Pretender, because his eldest son, Bonnie Prince Charlie, who came to England in the year 1745, just thirty years after his father, to try to win the throne of the Stuarts again, was called the Young Pretender. When William III died, the English soldiers were not left without a great leader. The Duke of Marlborough, who was tutor to Queen Anne's little boy, was placed over the army. He was a wonderful soldier. A great Frenchman said of him that he never besieged a place which he did not take, or fought a battle that he did not win. His soldiers said that the Duke was as calm at the mouth of a cannon as at the door of a drawing-room. His armies loved him, and the sight of his calm, determined face always made his men feel braver. In the year 1704, Marlborough and Prince Eugene of Savoy won a great victory over the French at the Battle of Blenheim near the Danube, for Louis the Fourteenth had marched through Germany to attack Vienna, the chief town of Austria. He had an immense army and would have defeated the army of the Emperor, but Prince Eugene, who was with his army in Italy, marched quickly to meet the French, while Marlborough made a more wonderful march still, across Europe from Holland. The great French army was defeated, and half its men killed in the battle. Yet there was fighting for some years after this. At last peace was made in the year 1713. After thirty years of fighting, Louis had gained nothing. His grandson Philip kept Spain, but neither he nor any of his family, who became king after him, could become king of France. Neither could any French king ever become king of Spain. The Netherlands, for which Louis had fought so hard, were now given up to the House of Austria. Holland remained independent and kept a ring of Netherland towns to keep her safe. 
the possessions of Spain in Italy, were also given to Austria. The town of Gibraltar, on the south coast of Spain, remained to England, and the island of Minorca and the French colony of Nova Scotia, or New Scotland, which the French had made in Canada, the part of North America to the north of New England, were also given up to the English. Nova Scotia was only one of the colonies of the French in North America, for there was a new France as well as a new Holland. There had been quarrels before this about Nova Scotia, for the English said it belonged to them, because it was first discovered by Cabot, who was sent out by the English king Henry the Seventh. There were quarrels, too, about it later, but England kept it in the end, and we shall see later how she won all the other French colonies in Canada as well. Louis the Fourteenth died in 1715. He had lost all he had fought for in his great wars. He spent the last two years of his life very miserably. His eldest son and grandson died, which made the old king very sorrowful. He was still as strict a Catholic as ever, and he now persecuted some people called the Jansenists, who were Catholics, but had some peculiar beliefs which seemed like heresy to the king. The convent of Port Royal near Paris, where some old nuns lived, had been Jansenist for many years. But Louis the Fourteenth asked the nuns to say that they were not Jansenist any longer. They would not do this, and although they were all old ladies, he sent them off to different convents all over the country. But, in spite of all his faults, Louis the Fourteenth had worked hard for France. L'État, c'est moi. I am the state, he would often say. But, although there was so much vanity in his love for France, he did love her. With all his faults, too, he was in some ways the greatest man of the seventeenth century. His death was the end of a great time in the history of France and the history of Europe. End of chapter 36「Chapter 37 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Andy Glover The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill Chapter 37 the East of Europe in the 17th century. In the second half of the 17th century, the Turks began, once more, to trouble Europe. They had been troublesome in the 16th century, and Don John of Austria, the brother of Philip II of Spain, had won a great victory over them in the famous Battle of Lepanto. Then, for almost a hundred years, they had left the European countries alone chiefly because there was much trouble and disorder in their own empire, which now had its capital at Constantinople. In the year 1656, the Turks seized Transylvania. It was the eastern part of the Kingdom of Hungary, but it had become an independent little state. The Emperor Leopold helped the Transylvanians, and the Turks were driven out, but Transylvania still had to pay tribute. But the rule of the Emperor Leopold was much disliked in the part of Hungary still belonging to Austria. And some years later, the Hungarians rebelled. The Turks thought this was a good chance to attack Vienna. The Emperor begged John Sobieski, the brave King of Poland, to come and fight for him. Sobieski had already, some years before, fought against the Turks, who had taken a province from Poland for the Turks had all the Mohammedan love of conquest, and, whenever they were not weakened by disputes among themselves, were a great danger to Eastern Europe. They were always brave, and their great armies fought desperately. But fortunately they were never disciplined like the armies of the West. And when a European army under a good general fought with a Turkish army, 
the Europeans could always win. While the Austrian commander was waiting at Vienna for Sobieski and his army, and the Turkish army was coming nearer, he ordered that all the houses in all the suburbs round the city should be burnt, rather than that the Turks should be able to rob them. The Turks came up and began to besiege the city. The tents of the Turkish commander, made of silk and embroidered in gold and silver with pearls and jewels, could be seen by the Austrians as they climbed the spire of the cathedral to see if Sobieski was coming, for the people were sick and starving. At last he came, and the people in Vienna could see with joy the fireworks which he set off on top of the hill, four miles away. In the morning the Christian army under Sobieski heard mass, and that a great standard of red with a white cross was set up. We have not come to save a city, but the whole of Christendom, said Sobieski. To him it was a new crusade. The Turks prepared for battle by killing thousands of prisoners whom they had already taken. Then they faced the army of Sobieski, as it rushed down the hill upon them. Many were killed, and the rest fled away. By evening, Vienna had been relieved. John Sobieski was as humble as he was brave. And when the emperor thanked him afterwards for his help, he bowed and said, I am glad to have been able to do you this small service. The Turks still fought for some years after this. Whenever the best of the Austrian generals were busy fighting against Louis the Fourteenth, but Prince Eugene, who helped the Duke of Marlborough to win the Battle of Blenheim, fought them several times, and at last, in 1716, they made peace and were quiet once again, for a time. Austria got nearly all Hungary back again, and Poland, too, got its lost province back. Prince Eugene had been helped in his struggle with the Turks by the ruler of Russia, the Tsar, Peter the Great. Peter the Great. It was under Peter the Great that Russia first became important among the countries of Europe. It was a very large country, but it had no sea coast, and the only way its people could reach the west was through Poland. The people of Russia were chiefly Slavs, though many Tartars had become mixed with the people, and the ruling family of Russia was descended from northern Vikings. For more than two hundred years until the end of the fifteenth century, the Russians had been ruled by Mongol or Turkish conquerors, and then had become free again. But Russia was hardly civilized at all before the days of Peter the Great. He was a very wonderful man. He was anxious that Russia should learn all the things which the Western nations knew, and should become important among the countries of Europe. Above all, he wanted to win the lands on the Russian side of the Baltic Sea, which had been won at different times by Sweden. But the sea could only be useful to him if the Russians knew how to build ships. So Peter made up his mind to go himself to Holland and learn how ships were built. He sailed to a place called Zandam in Holland, and there he dressed himself like a Dutch boatman with a short jacket, a red waistcoat, and wide Dutch trousers. He lived in the one-roomed cottage of a Dutch workman, whom he had once known in Russia, but he was very noticeable with his tall figure and handsome face and long curly hair and crowds of people began to press round him as he watched the shipbuilders at work. So he fled away to Amsterdam, and was allowed to work in the dockyards there. He helped in the building of a ship from beginning to end, and then the city of Amsterdam presented him with it. Peter was delighted. He called his new ship the Amsterdam, and sailed back with it to Russia. But he did not yet know all he wanted to about shipbuilding, and later... When William the Third sent him the present of a ship, Peter asked if he might come to see the English dockyards too, and so he did. When he got back again to Russia, he taught the Russians how to build ships too. Peter wanted to live as near as possible to the West, which he admired so much, and so at the mouth of a river running into the Baltic Sea, he built himself a great new city to be his capital instead of Moscow his capital in the east. The new city was called St. Petersburg, and it has ever since been a very important and beautiful town. Peter got together an army too, and took back Scottish soldiers to help him to train it to fight like the armies of Western Europe. 
Peter was quite absolute, and he easily made the people do things as he wished. He was head of both church and state in Russia. He got some of the German states, which did not like Sweden, owning the German part of the Baltic coast, to join him in winning all the coast back from Sweden. But the young king of Sweden was a very brave and wonderful person too. He was called Charles the Twelfth. Charles was only eighteen years old when he left the Swedish capital Stockholm to fight Peter the Great and his German friends. He first went against the king of Denmark and easily conquered him. He then marched against the Russians under Peter the Great, who were besieging Narva, a town on the Baltic. The Russian army was not used yet to war, and Charles easily drove them into disorder and took Narva. Then he marched into Poland and took the throne from the new Polish king. Augustus of Saxony, for Sobieski was now dead, and made the Poles elect a Polish nobleman as their new king. Then Charles made up his mind to attack Moscow, but his men suffered terribly in the severe cold of the Russian winter. Peter the Great did not attack him, but fell on the Swedish armies, which came afterwards, to join their king and destroyed them. He then marched across Russia too, to where Charles was besieging a place called Poltawa. Charles was wounded in one foot, and though he tried not to let anyone know, his men saw blood dripping from his boot. He could not lead his army against Peter, but had himself carried to the battlefield. But Peter won a great battle over the Swedes without their leader. Charles escaped into the land of the Turks and tried to get the Sultan to help him against Russia, but he would not. Then Charles heard that his possessions on the German coast of the Baltic. Had been taken by the German princes. Peter the Great had won the eastern part of the Baltic coast, and for a time there was a chance of his joining with Charles to help him to win the German part back. But Charles had now to go to Norway, which he hoped to join to Sweden, and there he died in 1718. He was only 36. When he was a boy, he loved to hear about wars, and especially about Alexander the Great. He would say that he wished he could be like him. Someone said to him, "Yes, but he only lived thirty-two years." The boy answered, "That does not matter. When one has won an empire, Charles the Twelfth was not much older than Alexander when he died. He had not won an empire, but he had gained very wonderful victories. With his death came the end of Sweden's greatness. Sweden was really like Holland." Only fit to be a second-rate power, the one country was too small and the other too poor to be long among the most important countries of Europe. But for a time, certain peculiar events had made both countries very great. Peter the Great died seven years after his great enemy, but Russia went on becoming more important, and is one of the great powers in Europe today. End of chapter thirty-seven. Chapter Thirty-Eight of the Story of the World: A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Andy Glover. The Story of the World: A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter Thirty-Eight: The Eighteenth Century. At the death of Louis the Fourteenth, a new period seems to begin in the history of the world. The eighteenth century was very different, in many ways, from the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries. People did not even pretend now to go to war about religion. Yet there were two very great wars in the middle of this century, in which nearly all the great countries of Europe joined. The stronger countries of Eastern Europe joined together or fought with each other to take the land of the smaller states and make their own countries stronger. There was no question of right and wrong. The strong countries were fighting to get as much as they could. Kings and queens have never been so selfish before or since. In the wars of the century, England was always against France. The real reason for this was that both countries had colonies in North America and India, and each wanted to push the other out of these continents. 
so that while English and French armies were fighting in Europe, others were fighting in North America and India. And we shall see how, in the end, England won both these continents for herself. The people of the 18th century were very fond of amusement and dress. The richer people went a great deal to watering places to drink the waters and amuse themselves. Many philosophers began not to believe in God at all. And most people, even those who went to church, did not bother themselves much about religion. But there was one good side to this. In England, the worst laws against Roman Catholics and Unitarians were no longer noticed. They were not repealed, but they were no longer put into practice. The Unitarians were people who believed in God, but did not believe that Jesus Christ was God. After the revolution of 1688, the dissenters, as those Protestants who had left the English church were called, were freed from persecution and allowed to worship in their own chapels. The dress of the people everywhere was still very brightly colored, and the richer people had their clothes made of very beautiful stuffs. Men wore wigs often tied with a ribbon at the back, and ladies had their hair puffed out and powdered. But in spite of all their finery, the people of the 18th century were still very rough, and manners were not nearly so refined as they are today. Even gentlemen who were good scholars drank a great deal too much wine, and both men and women had a great passion for playing cards for money. Just as there was no longer any great enthusiasm about religion or even about other things, so there was no really great poetry. The best writers of the time were to be found in England, but poets like Alexander Pope, who wrote poems like the Essay on Man, might almost as well have written in prose. The language was clever, and the verse is perfect in many ways, but it was not poetical. There were some very great writers of prose, such as Addison, Steele, and Swift, and before the end of the century there were the first real English novels by men like Henry Fielding. But before the end of the century, too, there was a great change, which came to a head at the beginning of the next century, when many new poets wrote poems full of passion. In some ways, the people of today are more different from the people of the 18th century than the people of the 16th and 17th centuries were different from those of the Middle Ages. The first great war of the 18th century was called the War of the Austrian Succession. Charles VI, the Emperor of Austria, had died. He had no sons, and he left Austria and all his possessions to his beautiful young daughter, Maria Theresa. Some of these possessions had never had a woman rolling over them before. But Charles VI had written a kind of law which was called the Pragmatic Sanction, saying that his daughter should rule after him in all his possessions. Nearly all the other countries agreed to the Pragmatic Sanction, though France would not. And so when her father died, Maria Theresa became the Empress of Austria, Queen of Hungary and Bohemia, and ruler of the Netherlands. She was only twenty-three years old when she was crowned. She had to go specially to Hungary to be crowned there, with the old iron crown of that kingdom. The crown had to be padded to make it fit so small a head. The people had always loved Maria Theresa. When she was only fourteen, she had begun to be present at her father's council meetings. People often got her to ask for favors or mercy from her father when he was angry with them. And a story is told that he once said to her, You think that a sovereign has nothing to do but grant favors. And the girl answered, I think that is the only thing that can make a crown bearable. Another story says that her father wanted her to marry Frederick the Great, the king of the new German kingdom of Prussia. But she loved her cousin, the Duke of Lorraine, and cried when she thought she was not to be allowed to marry him. And so her father gave in, and she had been married four years when she became Empress of Austria. But before many months had passed, the other countries began to try and steal her lands from her. France, Spain, and Prussia attacked her although both Spain and Prussia had promised her father not to do so. The little kingdom of Prussia had been got together by Frederick's great-grandfather, the elector of the little state of Brandenburg. He was always called the Great Elector. His son had been made king of all the possessions he had left, 
and the new kingdom was called Prussia. The first king of Prussia was called Frederick I. He was the grandfather of Frederick II, who was called the Great. Frederick the Great's father had been called Frederick William, like the Great Elector. His great passion was the army. He searched everywhere for the tallest men he could find, and his soldiers often looked like giants. Frederick the Great. When Frederick the Great was a little boy, his father was dreadfully strict with him. He was afraid that the boy would not grow up to be a good soldier, because he liked playing the flute and dressing himself up, and other things which seemed much more amusing to him than being drilled with the hundred boys whom his father brought to the palace so that Fritz, as Frederick was called in German, could learn how to command them. His father planned out his whole day for him. He was to get up at six, and not even turn over in bed, but get up at once, say his prayers, wash himself, and have his breakfast while his hair was being combed, and all was to be finished by half-past six. Then he was to learn history for two hours, and have religious instruction for another two and then after another wash and changing into a clean shirt and coat, he was to go in and see his father, and so on. But the little Fritz grew very tired of all the strictness, and as he grew up into a young man, his father could hardly bear to look at him. He often beat him, and once Frederick ran away, but he was brought back and put in a kind of prison for a year. But later on, the father and son began to understand each other better, and when he was dying, Frederick William thanked God for having given him such a good son to have the kingdom after him. Frederick soon showed that he was a splendid soldier and a very clever man. Under him, Prussia grew stronger and stronger, and it was all through the king, and that is how he came to be called Frederick the Great. Frederick did not see why soldiers need to be giants, and was not anxious, like his father, to seize all the biggest men and make them join the army. But he looked well after his army, and made it one of the best in Europe. He was also a good ruler. Although he was absolute like all the kings of the time, except the English, he used his power well. He tolerated all religions, and tried to do justice to everybody. Frederick became king in 1640, the same year that Maria Theresa became Empress of Austria. There belonged to Austria a province called Silesia, which the electors of Brandenburg had said for years should belong to them. Frederick thought that this was his chance to win Silesia for Prussia. He invaded it and defeated an Austrian army in a great battle. He had first offered to help Maria Theresa against her other enemies if she would give him the province, but she proudly refused. Then the elector of Bavaria, who thought that he should be emperor of Austria, and had never agreed to the pragmatic sanction, invaded Austria, and the Duke of Saxony helped him by taking an army into Bohemia. But Maria Theresa begged the nobles of Hungary to help her. They were full of love and admiration for their beautiful young queen, and declared that they would give their lives for her. She, in her turn, gave the Hungarians many privileges which the emperors had always refused them. The King of England at this time was George II, who was also elector of the little German state of Hanover. Queen Anne had no children alive when she died in 1714, and the throne of England had been settled on the descendants of the electress Sophia of Hanover, the granddaughter of James I, and daughter of the elector who had been driven out of the Palatinate at the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. Her son George, the Elector of Hanover, became King of England when Queen Anne died, and after him, his son George II. Both these men were quite German, and could not even speak English. They did not even attend the meeting of the cabinet, or chief men in Parliament who ruled the country, and this helped the English Parliament to become more and more powerful. King George II went over himself to fight for Maria Theresa. The Elector of Bavaria had been crowned Emperor, but he died in the middle of the war, and Maria Theresa's husband was crowned Emperor and called Francis I. France had conquered nearly all the Netherlands and attacked Holland, but when peace was made in 1748, all conquered lands had to be given back, except Silesia, which Frederick kept. Maria Theresa hated giving it up, 
but she knew there was nothing else to do at the time, and she was always very sensible. But she made up her mind to take revenge on Frederick when the time came, and in the year 1756 war broke out again. It was called the Seven Years' War. This time England was on the side of Prussia and France on the side of Austria, but the greatest help to Maria Theresa came from the Tsarina Elizabeth of Russia, the daughter of Peter the Great. The Tsarina was a very beautiful and charming woman, though almost a savage in some ways like her father, for Russia was very far from being civilized even yet. Elizabeth thought that Prussia was getting far too powerful, and besides, she hated Frederick the Great, who could say very witty and cruel things, and had said things about Elizabeth, which had been repeated to her. Her private life was far from good, but this did not make her any more pleased when people talked about it. France and England fought during the war, chiefly in America and India, and we must tell the story of their struggle later. England, which was growing richer as her trade improved, paid great sums of money to help Frederick to fight. Sometimes the English grumbled, but William Pitt, the great commoner, as he was called, who was the chief man in England at the time, told them that it was necessary, saying, America must be conquered in Germany, by which he meant that by weakening France in Europe, he could better win her colonies from her abroad. He won many battles, but lost many too. France, Austria, and Russia were all powerful enemies, but it was the cleverness of Elizabeth which kept them together. In the year 1762, Frederick was talking about saving the remains of his possessions for his nephew, and he probably meant to get himself killed in battle. But just then, the Tsarina died. The new Tsar, another Peter, was a great admirer of Frederick, and immediately made peace with him. In the next year, a general peace was made. In Europe, there was no real change after all the fighting, but Frederick kept Silesia, and from this time... Prussia became an equal power with France and Austria among the countries of Europe. When next we hear of the great powers of Europe doing anything important, we find Prussia, Austria, and Russia joined together ten years afterwards to steal land from the country of Poland, which lay between their boundaries. None of these countries had any right to Poland, but part of the Polish possessions called West Prussia lay on the Baltic between Brandenburg and Prussia, and Frederick longed to get this for himself, and so join the two parts of his kingdom together. He knew that he would not be able to take it unless Russia and Austria got some part of Poland, too. The Partition of Poland Poland was a very weak country, because of its peculiar government. The king had very little power, but there were an immense number of nobles. Nothing could be done in the government of the country unless every single noble agreed to it. And this did not often happen, and so things were not done. But the Poles were a proud and noble people, and the three great powers who now attacked them were doing a very cruel and selfish thing. There was a great deal of trouble going on in Poland when the three countries attacked it. Prussia got West Prussia, Russia a slice of the east of Poland, and Austria a province in the south. Maria Theresa did not much like the idea of the partition of Poland, as it was called, but she thought that it was her duty to Austria to take part, if Prussia and Russia did so, and she said if she took any she must have a good share. The Polish nobles were treated very cruelly when they refused to agree to the partition and had to give in. The ruler of Russia at this time was the great Tsarina Catherine II, she was the wife of the Peter who admired Frederick the Great so much. This Peter was really a very mean and miserable little man. He was more German than Russian, and often hurt the feelings of the people whom he pretended to govern. He was very rough and cruel to his wife. Catherine was not a good woman, but she was a splendid empress. Although she was a German Protestant princess, she soon learned the Russian language and took the religion of the Greek church, which the Russians followed, as her own. After a time, she got some of the chief Russians to seize Peter and put him in prison, where he died. Most people think that Catherine had him murdered. But the Russians were proud of their Tsarina, 
and she did all she could to make the country greater. For twenty years after the first partition of Poland, that part of the country which was left was very much under the power of Catherine. At last, while she was fighting the Turks, some of the Poles tried to make a new government which would make their country freer. But Catherine soon stopped this. In 1793 there was a second partition of Poland between Prussia and Russia. Frederick the Great and Maria Theresa were both dead by this time. But the later rulers of those countries were just as cruel to Poland. After this there was only a tiny kingdom of Poland left. A brave noble called Kosciuszko tried to get help for his country from France and other countries, but could not. And then he and a few brave friends died fighting against their enemies. Then a third partition was made of all that was left of Poland. Since then, there has never really been a kingdom of Poland, but Polish exiles may be found in every country of Europe. The best of them are always hoping for the time when Poland shall be a nation once more. The story of the partitions of Poland show, almost better than anything else, the selfishness of the kings and queens of Europe in the 18th century. End of chapter 38Chapter 39 of the Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Victor Sheremet The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls By Elizabeth O'Neill Chapter 39. The Story of India During the Seven Years' War in Europe, England won all India for her own. India is a great peninsula in the south of Asia and almost a continent in itself as far as size goes. It is separated from Asia by a chain of mountains in which are some of the highest peaks in the world all through the days of Greece and Rome and the Middle Ages. People did not know much about India. It had a separate life of its own. We have seen how about the time when the Jews were wandering west from Mesopotamia to find a home in the land of Canaan, a branch of the Aryan people to which the Persians and Greeks and Romans and the English all belonged was pouring into India. There were already people in India of another race, darker still than the brown-skinned branch of the Aryan people which now came in and conquered them. The Dravidians, as these people were called, were easily conquered by the Aryans, and soon there were far more Aryans in the north. But in the high table land in the south of India called the Deccan, there were always more Dravidians than Aryans. And still today the people of that part of India and of the island of Ceylon to the south of India belong chiefly to these people, who are rather like the Negroes of Africa. The Dravidians were quite savage people and not very intelligent. They believed in wicked spirits and the demons and prayed to them. The Aryans made slaves of the Dravidians. They themselves were divided into three classes or castes. They were the priests or Brahmans who really governed the others, the soldiers and the ordinary people. The people of one caste could not marry with those of another. Not even the working class would marry with the conquered Dravidians. There were divisions again in each caste, and often the people of one division could not marry or even eat with the people of another. This caste system, as it is called, still goes on in India today. Alexander the Great, as we know, led an army into India and won some battles but he never made any real conquest. After this, no outside people troubled India for many years. Sometimes 
in the 7th and 8th centuries, when the followers of Mohammed were conquering West India, North Africa and Spain, a few Arabs would cross the Himalayas, but there was never any real conquest until in the year 1004 Anno Domini, a Mohammedan leader from a place called Guzni in the country which is now called Afghanistan to the northwest of India took a great army and conquered the Punjab as the land round the great river Indus and its tributaries is called. After this, there were many Mohammedan invasions and conquests, lasting for over 500 years, right through the Middle Ages. In this way, a new people and a Mohammedan religion found their way into India. This is why today, among all the different people of India, so many Mohammedans are to be found. Even more than there are Hindus, who keep to their old religion of the Brahmans. In the early part of the 16th century, a new people swarmed into India, a great band of Mongolians from the center of Asia, and their leader made himself a ruler of all India. He was called the Great Mogul, and had his capital at Delhi. The grandson of this first Mongolian conqueror who ruled when his time came was called Akbar. He was a very fine soldier and a splendid ruler. The country was happy and peaceful under him. He died two years after Queen Elizabeth. And it is strange to think that while in the countries of Europe, Protestants and Catholics were being so dreadfully persecuted for their religion, this great eastern ruler had given toleration to Hindus and Mohammedans equally. The rulers who came after him seemed almost more splendid, but they were very different. They were cruel like so many eastern kings and emperors, and thought very little of murdering anyone who offended them. The greatest of all for the magnificence of his court was the great Mogul Aurangzeb. He had stolen the throne from his father, whom he put into prison. To make himself safer, he then murdered his own three brothers. The palace of the great Mogul at Delhi was one of the wonders of the world. Before its gates stood two great elephants carved out of stone, with immense statues of soldiers on their backs. The great hall of the palace, where the Durbar or council met, had a roof of pure white marble, held up by thirty columns also of marble. The great Mogul had seven magnificent thrones covered with different precious stones, one with pearls, another with rubies, another with diamonds, and so on. But all this splendor could not make Aurangzeb happy. In his last years he was full of fear lest someone should murder him, as he had murdered so many. Soon after his death, his great empire broke up into many little states. Most of the rulers pretended to obey the great Mogul at so many races and so many divisions it would be easy for a strong power to come and conquer, and that is what happened. We saw how the Portuguese, who were the first Europeans to sail to India, set up a place at Goa, where they could exchange the things they brought from Europe for the spices which they carried back from India. The Portuguese said that they alone of all the people of Europe had the right to trade with India, but it was not long before the Dutch ships began to trade with the towns on the east coast of India. In time, France and England both set up trading stations in India too. The chief English stations were Calcutta and Madras on the east coast and Bombay on the west. The chief French trading station was Pondicherry, south of Madras. 
The English and French each paid some money every year to one of the native princes for permission to trade. The Frenchman Dupley, who was in charge of Pondicherry, was the first to have the idea of how easy it would be for a strong European people to win this great country for themselves. He thought that if only the English could be driven from India, France could win this wonderful prize. The two countries were on opposite sides in the war of the Austrian succession, and Dupley made this an excuse for attacking the English in Madras. An English fleet was quite near, but was met by a small French fleet under another Frenchman called La Bourdonnais. The fleets fought and uh, thought neither won. The English sailed away, and so Dupley, with the help of the La Bourdonnais, was able to take Madras, where there were very few men. Most of the English were carried off to Pondicherry, but some escaped to another little station, which the English held a few miles south of Madras. Dupley attacked this station, which was called Fort St. David, but the little band of Englishmen held it bravely, and it was still unconquered when peace was made between France and England at the end of the war of the Austrian succession. Dupley was ordered to give Madras back to the English, and did so very unwillingly. The Englishmen at the trading stations in India were working for the East India Company, which had been given the rights of world trade with India by Queen Elizabeth. Among the clerks in the company's service at Madras was a young man called Robert Clive. He had been the naughty boy of the family among his brothers and sisters in his English home. He was very passionate and very mischievous when he was a little boy. Once he climbed to the top of a very high steeple and everyone who saw him was terrified, but he got down safely after all. He went to many schools but never learned very much. When he was 18, he was sent out to India. He hated being a clerk and felt very lonely and sad. Twice he tried to shoot himself but didn't shoot straight, and then he made up his mind that he must be meant for something great. He was one of the men who escaped to Fort St. David from Madras. At last he had found something that he really liked to do, and when he went back to Madras he got the company to have him as a soldier instead of a clerk. There was not peace for very long between the English and French in India. They now hated each other bitterly. Their countries were at peace, until the Seven Years' War broke out in 1756. But long before this, there was fighting again in India. The way in which the French and English found excuses for fighting was to take part in quarrels between the native princes of the states in the deacon which broke out at this time. There were struggles about the crowns of the deacon and of the Carnatic, a province in the Deccan. The French took one side and the English the other. The princes from the French were helping were successful at first, and great honor was done to Dupley. He was dressed in beautiful Mohammedan robes, and a monument was put up with the story of his greatness in four languages. The natives who had before despised the white men, had begun to see how powerful they really were. In a fight which had broken out between the French and the native prince Dupley, with a few French soldiers, had defeated a large army of natives. The Hindus had no idea of training their soldiers, but both French and English had found out by this time that the native soldiers were almost as good as white soldiers. The natives who were trained in this way were called sepoys. When the English in Madras saw how Dupley and his friends 
were succeeding, they sent soldiers to help the town of Trichinopoli, where the native prince called Muhammad Ali, whose side they were taking against the French, was being besieged. Among the soldiers sent to Trichinopoli was Clive, but he saw that not much good could be done there. So he went back to Madras and asked the governor to give him soldiers to attack Arcot, the capital of the Carnatic. Natives were watching Clive with his 200 English soldiers and his 300 sepoys as he marched along the 65 miles to Arcot. A great storm came on, but Clive took no notice of the thunder and lightning and marched steadily on. This seemed wonderful to the natives, and they sent messenger on to Arcot to tell the natives there what a brave enemy was coming against them. The people of Arcot were so frightened that they fled away, and Clive took the empty town without any fighting at all. But soon soldiers were sent from Trichinopoli to attack them. Clive and his men fought them for weeks. The sepoys as well as the white soldiers loved and admired them. The sepoys did a very fine thing. There was not much to eat except a little rice, and they said that the white soldiers might have all the rice, while they could manage quite well with the water in which it was boiled. At last, one day, the enemy made one last great attack. In the front of the army were great elephants with iron weapons on their heads to batter down the gates of the town. But when the English fired on them, the elephants turned and fled, trading down and crushing the men of their own army. In an hour, the enemy had fled and the great siege of Argot was over. Clive won many victories after this, and soon the English were as powerful in the Carnatic as the French had been. Dupleix was a great statesman, but not a great soldier. He had had no help from France, and in a year or two he was called home in disgrace. He died broken-hearted at the thought of the empire he had tried to win for France, and which had been taken instead by the English. Meanwhile, Clive had gone back to England for a rest, and had been praised and honored by everyone. On the day he landed again in India, a very dreadful thing had happened, though Clive didn't hear of it at once. The Black Hole of Calcutta In Calcutta, so far, all had been peaceful. The English were quite friendly with the ruler or Nawab of Bengal, but in 1756 he died, and a young man called Sirajud Daula became Nawab. He was really half mad and dreadfully cruel, very much like the Emperor Nero in character. He had an idea that there were great treasures shut up in the fort of Calcutta and made up his mind to get them. He quarreled with the English and then attacked the fort, the women and children were put safely on ships in the river, all but one lady, who would not leave her husband, but the fort was taken and two hundred men in it. The Nawab ordered that one hundred and forty-six of them should be shut up in a small room with only two tiny windows. It was called the Black Hole of Calcutta. The night was terribly hot and soon the poor prisoners were crying for air and water. But the native soldiers at first only laughed and held torches to the windows so that they could see the people struggling inside, for they were half mad by this time. At last they brought some skin bottles of water, but they were too big to pass between the bars. Some was poured in and a few drops caught but the fighting and shrieking grew worse than ever, until the sound died down to a moan. In the morning, twenty-three people crawled out when the door was opened. The lady, who would not leave her husband, was among them, but he was dead inside. When the story of this terrible night reached the other English in India, Clive set out at once with an army of Englishmen and sepoys as before, and sailed to Calcutta. He easily conquered the Nawab and got Calcutta back. 
Siraj ud Daula made many promises, and Clive didn't punish him further. But soon he found out that Nawab was trying to get help from a French fort near against the English. So Clive besieged the fort and took it, so ended French power in the north of India. Then Clive went against the Nawab, who had an enormous army at Plassey, 96 miles to the north of Calcutta. Here he won the famous Battle of Plassey, with 3,000 men against nearly 60,000. Clive made Mir Jaffa, Siraj ud Daula's general, ruler of Bengal, but he had to pay a great deal of money to the English. It was not long before he murdered his old master and so revenged the English for the terrible tragedy of the Black Hole of Calcutta. The Battle of Plassey was won in 1757, and William Pitt, who was choosing the men and arranging for the struggle with France and Europe and America, said that Clive was a heaven-born general. Three years later, another English commander, Ayer Kut, defeated the French in the south of India at the Battle of Wandewash. After this, France had no further chance in India. But even the best Englishmen were inclined to think of India as a place from which to get money to send home to England. The Englishmen in the service of the East India Company were very badly paid, and so, although they were forbidden to trade for themselves, they did so. They were very unjust to the natives, and soon there was a great deal of misery in India. There was another massacre at Patna, as bad as that of the Black Hole. This was while Clive was away in England. He went back and tried to put things in order and give more justice to the natives. But even Clive had done some things which seemed very unjust to the English at home when they heard of them, for they didn't know how difficult things were in India and how hard it was to be sure that the natives' princes would keep their promises. So when Clive got back to England again, he had to defend himself in Parliament against people who said he had behaved wickedly in India. In the end, Parliament declared that Robert, Lord Clive, did render great and meritorious services to his country, but Clive had been dreadfully upset. His old sadness came on him again, and one day he was found dead. He had killed himself. Still, things were very bad in India. The native princes had no longer any power. The Englishmen paid large sums of money to them, and they had to be content with that. All the taxes collected from the people were now paid to the East India Company, but the Englishmen didn't really understand what was going on, and the native collectors took much more from the people than they should have done, and kept a great deal of the money for themselves. The people grew poorer and poorer. Then there was a great famine. The people were starving and became as thin as skeletons. Thousands died, and their bodies lay unburied, and then plague broke out. At last, Warren Hastings, who was in the service of the East India Company and had fought in the Battle of Plassey, was sent out as governor. He was like Dupleyi, a statesman, more than a soldier, and he did all he could to make things better. But even then, things were still very bad. Much trouble came through the English not understanding the customs of the Hindus. Once a man who had cheated the English very badly was put to death. In those days, stealing or cheating was still punished by death even in England. But this man was a Brahman and to the natives it seemed a terrible thing that one of the priestly caste should be killed. At last, people in England began to think that the East India Company should not have the government of India, and the president was sent out to rule India for the government at home. In the year 1788, an attack was made on Warren Hastings, and he was tried before Parliament for misrule in India. Edmund Bourke, a famous Irish member of Parliament and a splendid speaker, began with a speech in which he described the terrible sufferings of the natives and the awful behavior of Hastings. 
people wept while Bark spoke. And there was a terrible feeling against Hastings. But as time went on, people began to understand the truth of the case. And at the end of seven years, Hastings were declared not guilty. He lived a happy, cheerful life in his English country home until he died when he was 87 years old. As time went on, England got power over all the native princes of India. Many of them made treaties with the English by which their soldiers were put under British officers and were paid by the English. At the same time, they generally gave up some of their land altogether to the English. The Indian Mutiny In the year 1857, there was a terrible rebellion of the native soldiers all over the north of India. It was partly a religious movement. Some new guns were being used and the cartridges fired from them were greased with fat. The end of the cartridge had to be beaten off by the soldiers. Now the Hindus and the Mohammedans were forbidden by their religions to touch the fat of cows or pigs. It was now said that the cartridges were greased with the fat of these animals. The soldiers were told that this was not true, but they would not believe the English. At last they were told that the greased cartridges would not be used anymore. But then they began to think that the shiny paper in which other cartridges were wrapped was also polished by the same grease and the rebellion broke out. All over the north of India the native soldiers attacked the English, men, women and children. There was a terrible massacre at Kanpur, and Lucknow was only saved after a terrible siege. The English had been taken completely by surprise, but the rebellion was soon put down. There were not many English soldiers, but many of the natives remained faithful, and when they took the sepoys prisoners, it would not have been easy to carry them with them. The English were dreadfully angry, too, at the thought of their women and children, and were not sorry to kill their prisoners. After the mutiny, it was thought better that India should be taken altogether from the East India Company, and so that company came to an end at last. Since then, India has been ruled by a viceroy or representative of the king or queen of England. England now owns two-thirds of all the land of India, and the other third is ruled by native princes under her. The king is called Emperor of India. In India, the English people have done very wonderful things, which the natives could never have done for themselves. Railways, roads and bridges have been built, and it is now easy to get from one part of India to another. In all the days, when a time of dry weather came, the land was burned up and there was famine, but the English have made canals in which water, which has been stored up, can be carried to the fields in dry weather. The population of India grows very quickly, almost too quickly for it sometimes seems that the land would never give food for all. But now the English have set up factories, and many of the people leave the country parts and work in the towns. Bombay is famous for its manufacture of color stuffs and muslin. Some people are even afraid that the cotton goods made in India will take the place of those made in Manchester and the great towns of Lancashire and that the cotton trade of that county will be ruined. These cotton goods and Indian tea and wheat are bought by the countries of Europe. Many of the higher class of natives come now to be educated in England, and some of these young students think that India should be governed by its own people. The English are allowing some of the educated people to help in the government of their country, but though it may seem strange that a little country like England should govern a continent like India with its millions and millions of people, it must be remembered that these people of India are of many different races, that they don't seem able to join together in any way, and that if England or some other European country hadn't interfered there, might have been fighting and misery for centuries yet. On the whole, the people of India and the native princes honor and respect Great Britain, and when King George and 
Queen Mary paid a visit to India in the year 1912, there was a great gathering of princes at the Durbar to do them honor. End of chapter 39「Chapter 40 of The Story of the World – A Simple History for Boys and Girls – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros The Story of the World – A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill Chapter 40 the story of Canada. To many men from the earliest times there has come a strange longing which they cannot put aside. It is a longing to go out and travel to the unknown parts of the world, to see what they are like, what people live there, what these people do, and what things grow there. It was this longing which drove Columbus across the ocean to discover America. But Columbus was not really the first to find America. The Northmen, whose land is Norway and Sweden, had ever loved adventure, as they do still. In the last few years men from Norway have sailed right out many times to the frozen north, and to the center of the snowy south, which we call the South Pole. It was when Ethelred the Unready was ruling in England in the eleventh century that Leif Erikson sailed off towards the west, just when some of the other Northmen were swooping down upon England. After many days he and his fellow sailors came to a land which was probably that which we now call Canada, the northern part of North America. But the Northmen sailed back to their own country, and it was nearly five hundred years before anyone from Europe visited Canada again. This time it was an Englishman, John Cabot, who set sail from Bristol and came to Canada. Again it was only a visit, and the Englishman did not try to settle there. But fishermen learned soon that good fishing was to be had near the new country and they commenced to sail and fish round the island of Newfoundland and the coasts of North America. Just thirty-seven years after Cabot's voyage in 1534, a French sailor was sent by King Francis I to see what he could find. Jacques Cartier, as he was called, was even more venturesome than Cabot. He sailed up the Gulf of St. Lawrence to the place where Montreal now stands, and it is to him that we owe the name Canada, for it is said that when he met with some red Indians who lived in the land in those days, they pointed to their huts, saying Canada, meaning to point out their village to him. In their language the word Canada means village, but Cartier thought they were telling him the name of the land, and so Canada, or Canada, he called it. The First Colonist in Canada No one from Europe so far had attempted to stay in Canada, for Cartier sailed back again like Cabot, and it was almost seventy years before the next visitors came to the country and began to build themselves houses. Samuel de Champlain, who was the leader this time, is the first great name in the story of Canada. He will always be remembered through the beautiful Lake Champlain, which he discovered, and which was called after him. Champlain was a very wise and brave man, and when he arrived in Canada in the year 1603, he at once made friends with the Indians. He had made his plans, and intended to stay in Canada, for he had been sent out by a man to whom the French king had given the right to be the only one allowed to trade with Canada, and sell the furs which were got from the wild animals there. The first thing to do was to find a place where he could live, 
and so Champlain sailed up the river St. Lawrence and round the coast until he made up his mind to settle at Port Royal, now called Annapolis, in Nova Scotia. Champlain had soon to go back to France, but he went back again to Canada, and this time founded the city of Quebec in 1608. He had made friends with the Huron Indians, but had to fight with the fierce tribe called the Iroquois. Champlain was a Catholic and a very religious man. He did not mind much about the fur trader or founding towns and settlements. What he did care for was ever to find new places and to bring his religion to the people whom he met. He commenced a settlement at Montreal, and thinking to find a new way to China, sailed up the Ottawa River. But the settlements he made were not well protected, and about the time he founded Montreal, the English from Virginia took Port Royal, and in 1629 an English fleet took Quebec. Champlain was taken prisoner to England, but four years later Canada was given back to the French, and he returned to Quebec, where he died in 1635. Struggles with the Indians Champlain's work was not carried out without much fighting with the savage and treacherous Red Indians, and the warfare went on for many years longer. It was not a life to persuade many people to leave their homes in France, but many people did go. There were the missionaries, black robes, as the Indians called these priests, who were the bravest colonists of all. They thought it was their duty to go out and tell the Indians about God. Yet, thirty years after Champlain's death, there were only about two thousand Frenchmen in Canada. Some of these pushed their way through the thick forests without paths, against wild beasts and savage men, to the great Lake Superior, and south to where the great river Mississippi enters the ocean, and founded a colony which they called Louisiana, after their King Louis. Some of the priests in Canada thought that the Indians were being made wilder and fiercer through the white man, giving them brandy and other spirits to drink, and they tried to prevent it, but did not succeed very well. One night, in the August of the year, 1689, the Iroquois took a terrible revenge on the French it was a dark and stormy night, and the people in a small village near Montreal had gone to bed, when suddenly there burst in upon them a large number of Indians. Two hundred of the colonists were killed at once by one thousand five hundred Iroquois, and they were indeed happier than those who were left, for a hundred of these were carried off and tortured in the most horrible ways before they were killed. At this time, a brave Frenchman called Louis de Baud had been sent back to France, but when he returned, he fought against the Iroquois so fiercely that in a few years he had so thoroughly conquered them that no Frenchman ever needed to fear them again. The French king, Louis the Fourteenth, had been thinking what a glorious chance he had of making a great empire in America and Louis de Baud tried to bring this about. So he attacked the English colonists in New England to win their land for France. But the fighting went very badly for the French, and when peace was made in the year 1713 by the Treaty of Utrecht, they had to give up the land where they had first settled Nova Scotia, as well as Newfoundland, and the land round Hudson Bay. Still, they held the land round the St. Lawrence, and they tried to make up for what they had to give to England by pushing farther west and founding new towns. One very brave man, after terrible hardship, even traveled right across Canada to the Rocky Mountains. This is still a very long journey by the fastest trains. But La Verandrie, as this man was called, had no train to go by. 
He simply struggled on, sometimes fighting with wild beasts, sometimes with Indians. Often he had very little to eat for days together. GEORGE WASHINGTON Other Frenchmen traveled south to the colony of Louisiana and founded the large town which is called New Orleans. It was through these Frenchmen, who were trying to get as much land as they could to the south of Canada, that a young man, who afterwards became very famous, first came to learn how to fight. George Washington had not much chance of education in the things most boys and girls of his age are expected to know now. Most of what he knew he had taught himself. He could spell and write good English, which very few colonists could do. He also liked mathematics. But he learned other things which were much more valuable for him. He had finished his schooling when he was fifteen. He had on the whole been happy, though his father died when he was young. He could shoot, hunt, fish, and look after the big plantations which had belonged to his father, and now belonged partly to his half-brother and partly to himself. He had learned other and harder lessons. The Washingtons lived on the borders of Virginia, and life was not very safe there. They might be attacked at any time by Indians or by the Frenchmen from the north. George learned to ride about amongst these dangers without any fear, and also to be cool and calm if he was attacked by man or beast. When he was only sixteen, he was sent to look after large plantations. Even then he knew exactly what he wanted, and was so wise and sensible that grown men respected him. When he was nineteen, he had an attack of the dreadful disease of smallpox, which left marks on his face till he died. He was only just a man when the governor of Virginia chose him for a difficult task. The French, as we have seen, were pushing their settlements south, and the English colonists thought that they were taking some of the land which they looked on as their own. So George Washington was sent to tell them to go back. It was winter, and traveling was not easy, even if there had been no enemy near. But he made the journey. The French officers were very polite to him, but they told him to tell the governor that they meant to stay where they were. So Washington went back. He did not seem to have done much, but he had looked carefully at the country and had made up his mind where a fort should be built to keep the enemy back. Next year he was made a lieutenant colonel and sent to fight the French and the Indians near the Ohio, where they had made their camp. He defeated them, but a month later had to give in and go back. The next year he went back again under General Braddock to try to take Fort Duquesne, which stood where the large American town Pittsburgh, with its huge smoky factories and iron foundries, now stands. General Braddock was a brave man and a good fighter, but he did not know how to fight against the French and Indians, and in the battle he was defeated and nearly all his men were killed. It was here that Washington first showed how brave a fighter he was. All over the battlefield he could be seen on horseback, cheering the men to fight harder. Many an Indian shot at him, and they could shoot well and straight, but somehow he escaped with some of his soldiers unharmed from the terrible battle. A few months after his return, he was made head of all the soldiers in Virginia. He was only twenty-three years old, but he defended the borders of Virginia against the enemy, and was one of the leaders when, three years later, Fort Duquesne was taken. The rest of his life belongs to the story of America, which is told in the next chapter. One of the most terrible things in this warfare between the French and English was done by the governor of Nova Scotia. 
This, as we have seen, was the first French settlement made in Canada, but it had been taken by the English. A great number of the people who still lived there, however, were simple French Catholics, who were quiet, peaceful farmers and traders. They were still Frenchmen at heart, loving the French king better than the king of England. In the year that General Braddock was defeated at Fort Duquesne, the governor of Nova Scotia suddenly seized six thousand of the French settlers and drove them from their homes and right out of Nova Scotia. In an instant their peaceful life was broken up. The country they loved, and in which they had lived so long, and their fathers before them, was to be theirs no longer. Many did not know where to go in their great sorrow. Some got as far south as Louisiana, others settled near Nova Scotia, and many years afterwards a few found their way back to the land of their birth again, after terrible suffering but most of them had seen it for the last time. General Wolfe But if there were Englishmen who acted with great cruelty, there were others who were so noble that their names will never be forgotten. The struggle for Canada was now at its fiercest, and although the English had won some victories, it was seen by statesmen in England that the only way to take Canada was to take Quebec. Both French and English seemed to feel that this town was the key of Canada. It was built on a high rock which stood at the head of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. From the river it seems to be built on a precipice. On the west it is defended by steep cliffs called the Heights of Abraham, and although on the opposite side the land slopes more gently, this was naturally watched more carefully. The French general Montcalm was a brave man and a clever fighter, and when he thought that Quebec was to be attacked, he called together all the soldiers he could get and brought them, with many French settlers and Indians, into the city to defend it. The leader of the English was General Wolfe, who had already fought in North America before. Before he started out from England again, he met a young lady with whom he fell in love. They were to be married when the war was over, and Wolfe was back again. Wolfe was a pale, slim man, rather delicate, but few men have ever been braver or cleverer. He had not nearly so many soldiers as Montcalm, and they were not soldiers who had had much training. But he had made up his mind to take Quebec. It was a dangerous thing to remain in the St. Lawrence, for in the winter the water freezes hard and the ships might be crushed to pieces. But Wolfe, although the autumn was coming on, made his camp on a little island in the river facing Quebec, and waited his chance to take the city. He set his guns to fire on the city, but they did not do much harm to it, and Wolfe saw that he must try to take Quebec in some other way. So he sailed down the St. Lawrence and tried to take Montcalm's camp below the city but he was badly beaten, and many of his men were killed. He was now ill and depressed. He could hardly drag his weak body about. But he did not mean to give in, and when he felt a little stronger, he made a bold plan. Montcalm thought he was quite safe on the steep west side of the town, for he thought no army could climb the heights of Abraham and he did not believe that even the foot of them could be reached from the river. But Wolfe had found that from a tiny inlet from the St. Lawrence there was a footpath up the cliffs which led to the heights of Abraham. In the dead of night he sailed down the river with his men. Cloths had been wrapped round the oars so that no noise could be heard. No light was shown, and there was no moon. Somehow the soldiers climbed up the narrow footpath, surprised the soldiers at the top, 
and when daylight came montcalm was astounded to see nearly four thousand english soldiers on the heights of abraham ready to attack quebec but even yet the city was not won montcalm brought up his soldiers for battle and at first the english were driven back but wolfe made his men wait until the french came nearer and then all fire at once men fell along the french line and before they could form up again the english rushed upon them but wolfe was wounded as he lay dying and full of pain he heard his soldiers cry they run see how they run who run the dying leader asked and was told the enemy he was quite satisfied and saying now god be praised i will die in peace he closed his eyes and died montcalm was also wounded and died the next day five days afterwards on the eleventh september seventeen fifty nine quebec was given up to the english and when the peace of paris was made in seventeen sixty three the whole of new france was given up to the english this is how canada became english instead of french but the country was not allowed many years of peace to settle down and grow though the english government which was treating the american colonists so unreasonably acted very wisely towards the canadians the country was to be governed from quebec and the catholics were to be treated as well as they had ever been under the french only the english punishments for breaking the law were brought in and in other things the french laws were allowed the result of this wise treatment was soon seen for when an army of american soldiers invaded canada at the beginning of the american war of independence hoping to get the french to join them against england they were disappointed the americans took montreal but were not able to take quebec but the war of american independence was very important for canada the united states and canada became two separate countries and many of the american colonists who would not give up the king of england left their lands and went to find new homes in canada the americans would not give them any money for the farms and lands they left behind them and these new men of canada did not soon forget it the new canadians were equal to more than half all the frenchmen in canada and many of them settled in the land which is now called ontario here and in the other places where they made their homes they were given large pieces of land to live on and grow corn upon and they were also given spades and ploughs in place of those they had left behind but it is easy to understand why the new canadians did not at first get on very well with the older colonists they were english and protestants while the older colonists were french and catholics it was not long before it was thought that it would be wise to let the people of ontario govern themselves while the people in quebec made laws only for those people who lived in that part of canada yet however badly the english and french in canada might disagree they did not intend to join the americans and so when in the year eighteen twelve the united states were at war with great britain and tried to take canada their soldiers were driven back there were some, however, though not very many, of the French Canadians who did not like being ruled by an English governor, and rebellions took place. The leader in one of these, Louis Papineau, wished to make the people of the Quebec part of Canada join the United States, but there were very few rebels, and the rebellion was easily put down. One thing which happened just after this was the joining of Quebec to Ontario. The two provinces did not agree very well at first, but thirty years later, in 1867, other settlements in Canada joined with them. The colonies called Nova Scotia, 
New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island were thinking of joining together, and Ontario and Quebec suggested that they should all join. This was agreed to, and the British Parliament passed the law which made them one on 1st July, which has ever since been kept as the birthday of the Dominion of Canada. But this was but a very small part of Canada as it is today. Other huge tracts of land lay to the north and west. Much of this belonged to the Hudson Bay Company, which was founded in 1670 to trade in furs and skins. The company had made settlements round the lower part of Hudson Bay and over the country west of Ontario. The Dominion of Canada wanted this large and fertile country to join with the rest of Canada, and the Hudson Bay Company agreed at the end of 1869 to give up their land to the Queen for a sum of money. But this did not please many of the people who lived in the colonies the company had founded. One of these colonies was called the Red River Settlement, and it lay round the town which is now called Winnipeg, but was then called Fort Garry. Many of the men who lived in the Red River Settlement were half-breeds, that is, half French and half Indian, or partly English and partly Indian, and they feared that when the settlement became part of Canada there would be changes that they would not like. Louis Riel, one of these half-breeds, persuaded the men to rebel. They made him their leader and shot an Englishman who refused to join them. This made the people of the Dominion very angry, and Colonel Garnett Wolseley, who was afterwards called Lord Wolseley, was sent to punish them. He marched as far as he could, sailed over the Lake Superior, and took Fort Garry. Three years after this, all the settlements in Canada had joined the Dominion, but Louis Riel, who had escaped in 1870, lived to persuade some people to rebel again. This second time, in 1885, there was much fighting, and Riel was caught and hanged. In the same year, the great Canadian Pacific Railway, joining the east to the far west of Canada, was opened. There has been no fighting since. Canada has gone on, growing richer and more fertile every day. New towns spring up almost like magic. New states have been formed. There are miles of wheat fields, huge canals, and railways ever growing. The Canadians are very loyal to Great Britain, and their soldiers were sent to help the British in the South African War. A royal prince, the king's uncle, represents King George in Canada. The Canadians are building great ships of war to help the British Navy, and thousands of men and women leave the shores of Britain every year to become Canadians and live healthy, open-air lives under the fair skies of the Dominion. End of chapter 40、Chapter、Forty One of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 41. American Independence. England had won Canada from the French, but she was soon to lose her own great colonies to the south of Canada. Ever since she had had colonies at all, England had said that all their trade should be hers. They were not allowed to trade with any other country but the mother country. The colonies had never complained, but there had been a great deal of smuggling and trade with other countries of which England had taken no notice. Now England, after all her fighting and her many victories, was in need of money, and Grenville, the chief man in the English Parliament at the time, 
passed his famous Stamp Act. This act said that for all documents written or printed in the American colonies, and for all newspapers, paper should be used which had been first stamped by the English government. The people who bought the paper had to pay for the stamp. This was a new way of taxing the colonies, and they were very angry. They said that they would not use the paper, and in the next year it was given up. But the English Parliament passed a law saying that England had the right to make any laws she pleased for her colonies. This made the colonies still more angry. William Pitt, who had now been made Earl of Chatham, said that England had not any right to tax the colonies without their consent. Although Pitt had done so much to win India and Canada for England, he felt that the mother country ought to leave her colonies free. He told Parliament that he rejoiced that America had resisted. It was not long before new duties or taxes were put upon certain things going to the colonies from England. The colonists must pay the tax, and the English have the money. The people of America had offered to give money to the English government to help it, but they were very angry at this new attempt to tax them. The colonists began to hate every Englishman they saw, and when a quarrel broke out in Boston between some of the people in the street and some English soldiers, in which three of the Americans were killed, the colonists called it the Boston Massacre. At last all the new taxes were taken off, except one on tea. The East India Company brought a great deal of tea from India, and generally they had to pay a tax when it came into England. But the company was very poor at this time, and so the government let it off from paying the tax. This made the company able to sell the tea much cheaper, and now a great quantity of tea was sent over the sea in ships to America. But the colonists were told that they must pay just this one tax of threepence on every pound of tea they bought. Even then they would have got the tea at a very low price, but they were very indignant. They thought that the English were playing a trick and trying to tempt them to buy the cheap tea and pay a tax at the same time. So no one would buy the tea, and ship after ship sailed back to England without unloading. One ship lay at anchor in Boston Harbor. It had been there nineteen days, and yet looked as though it meant to stay there. There was a law that any ship must unload its cargo before twenty days had passed from its arrival. So the men of Boston made up their minds to attack this ship which had broken the law. Some of them painted their faces and stuck feathers in their heads and pretended to be Indians. They rushed on to the ship, waving pistols and tomahawks. While the English captain and sailors were staring in surprise, they cut open the boxes in which the tea was and emptied it into the sea. They emptied more than three hundred boxes altogether. Next morning, tea lay drifting along all the shore of Massachusetts. It was now England's turn to be angry. Everyone felt that the men of Boston had begun a real revolution. No one would tell who the men were who had disguised themselves as Indians and done this thing. And so an order came from England that Boston was to be punished. No ship was to go in or out of its harbor, and its trade was to be taken to the town of Salem. For the future, anyone giving trouble by attacking the English was to be brought over to England to be tried before English judges and juries. Everyone felt that this was unjust, but by this time the colonists had made up their minds to fight for their liberties. Men from all the colonies met at Philadelphia, and it was agreed that they should join together and resist the English. There was a struggle at a place called Lexington, which made the two sides bitterer than ever against each other. Some English soldiers had been sent from Boston to destroy some gunpowder and other things which the American side had collected at Concord, eighteen miles away. They had to pass by Lexington, and there they found sixty or seventy men ready to try to stop them. The English fired twice on these men, and then the Americans went away. But eight of them had been killed. The English did their work at Concord, and then set out again for Boston. On their way back, 
Americans were continually shooting at them from behind buildings and trees and rocks to take revenge for the Americans they had killed on their way to Concord. Many English were killed, until at Lexington one thousand men from Boston came to their help. There was a fight in which more than seventy English and about fifty Americans were killed. The English really won, and most of them got safely back to Boston, but they had lost more men than the Americans, who grew more hopeful when they saw that their volunteers, who were not used to war, could fight quite well against the English soldiers. THE BATTLE OF BUNKER'S HILL The first real fight was called the Battle of Bunker's Hill. A few hundred volunteers, men with ordinary clothes and any guns they could get, were placed on the hills outside Boston to defend that city. Although the battle is called after Bunker's Hill, it was really fought on Breed's Hill. About four thousand soldiers attacked them. Three times the volunteers drove them down the hill, but at last the soldiers won their way up, and more than one hundred of the volunteers lay dead. Then another Congress met at Philadelphia, and named Colonel George Washington General of the American Army. And so the man who had fought so well for England at Fort Duquesne was now to fight against her. He soon won Boston back and drove the English soldiers to Halifax. On the 4th of July, 1776, the Congress drew up the famous Declaration of Independence of the United States of America, by which an end was put to any connection of the colonies with the mother country. But there was still fighting to be done, and Washington had a very hard task before him. His soldiers were badly clothed and fed. Neither side had very big armies, but the English had the soldiers who knew already something about fighting. Then some of the colonists, who were called the Loyalists, were against the Declaration, and did not want to break away from England. These were a hindrance. There were many others who hated fighting, and most of the volunteers only joined the army for a certain fixed time, and would then go home, often just when they might have been useful. But the English on their side did very foolish things. They seemed to think that it would be an easy thing to conquer the Americans, or to believe that they were not really in earnest. Pitt, who had known so well how to choose the best men as officers, was no longer in power, and most of the officers on the English side were very poor commanders. Sir William Howe, the brother of Lord Howe, who had been sent by Wolfe to fight in Canada and had died there, and of Admiral Lord Howe, was a very different man from his brother's. He made up his mind to take Philadelphia, and took it, but his armies were all far apart instead of keeping close and helping each other. One of them, under General Burgoyne, surrendered to the Americans at Saratoga in 1777. Next year, the French, who were still full of anger at the great victories England had won over them in India and Canada, agreed to the independence of the American colonies and France and England were once more at war. Pitt, now old and ill, begged Parliament to try to win the good will of the Americans again. You cannot conquer America, he told Parliament, and beg them to show a spirit of friendship and mercy to the colonists. But the king, George the Third, did not like Pitt, and would not give him any power in the country. George the Third who had boasted that he was born and bred a Briton, and was not at all German like his father and grandfather, could not bear the idea of giving in. George had a great deal of power over Parliament, and chose men who governed the country. It was greatly his fault that England had been so foolish in her treatment of America. Pitt made one last great speech in the House of Lords in the April of 1778. He fell back in a fit when his speech was over, for the excitement had been too much for him, and he died a few weeks after. After this, there was never any chance of America being won back. England had to fight hard against France and Spain at sea. The French ships helped the Americans to take Yorktown in Virginia, where Lord Cornwallis and a large army had to give in to them. 
Lord Cornwallis was the cleverest of the English officers who fought in the war. This was really the end of the war, though New York, which had refused to join in the Declaration of Independence, was still held by the English. Peace was made in 1783 with both France and America. Admiral Rodney had shown by his victories over the French and Spanish fleets that England was still the greatest sea power. But she now openly agreed to American independence, and all the thirteen colonies were now joined as a federal republic. That is, each state governed itself in its own affairs and sent representatives to the Congress, which settled the affairs in which they all had a part. The new republic was called, and is still, the United States of America. Its capital was New York. Its first president was the hero, George Washington, old and gray before his time through his labors and suffering for his country. So England lost her first great group of colonies. A clever Frenchman once said that a colony will always break away from the mother country when it is old enough and strong enough to look after itself. But we have no proof of this. Indeed, England has many colonies today which are proud of belonging to her. But she has learned her lesson, and gives them every liberty she can. Meanwhile, the United States, which at first were the thirteen colonies on the east coast of America, have now spread right across the continent. New states were formed in the West. People from the older states and from Europe went out into these wild parts round the Ohio, where the new states called Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee grew up. Although these states were called the West, they are, of course, in the eastern part of the continent. They are west from the older states, but beyond them lies more than half the continent. Before the middle of the nineteenth century, all this was won by the United States. The great province of Louisiana, which Napoleon took from Spain, was sold to the United States for three million pounds. Further west still, some of the land belonged to the Hudson's Bay Company, and some to Mexico, but the United States got it all in the end, until the Republic stretched from coast to coast. At first these settlers in the Wild West led a very hard life indeed. There was plenty of rich land which gave them food, but the only way of getting things made in other countries was to have them carried in ships along the rivers. This was a very slow way where the distances were so great, and it was not until railways were invented that the western states were able to send great quantities of the things they grew to the eastern states and to Europe, and so get back the things manufactured there, and so lead more comfortable and less rough lives. The End of Slavery In the new states, just as in the old southern states, there was a great deal of cotton grown, and slaves were used on the plantations. But everywhere in the nineteenth century, as we shall see, there was a new love of freedom growing up, and people began to think it a shameful thing that men should own their fellow men as though they were cattle. About the time that the war between the American colonies and England broke out, a great English judge had declared that any slaves setting foot on English soil became free at that moment. In a few years, Parliament did away with all the slave trade in English ships and paid twenty million pounds to slave owners in her colonies in the West Indies and South Africa to set their slaves free. It was not long before other European countries followed her example. It was in the southern states of America that the greatest number of slaves were. The owners of the big plantations had dozens of them, doing the work of the house as well as the plantations. The men would work on the plantations, and the women would be cooks and nurses in the house. Their little children grew up on the plantation and belonged to the master, too. Many slaves were happy, for they had good masters, but they were never safe. Cruel masters might beat them, or, worse still, sell their wives and children to other people. A family might be broken up and never see each other again. This was very dreadful. At last the men of the northern states said that all the slaves should be set free. A lady wrote a story called Uncle Tom's Cabin, which told all about the sufferings of the slaves 
and at last the men of the north could not bear the idea that there should any longer be slaves in their country. They wanted a law passed to free all the slaves. They said that the government could give money to the slave owners to make up to them for losing their slaves. But the men of the south were very angry. They said they would never agree to this. In the north, slavery was abolished, and the men of the north were very angry against the south. John Brown, a northerner, went to Virginia, and calling all the slaves he could find to follow him, he told them to fight for their freedom. But he was taken prisoner and hanged. He had certainly been acting against the law, but the northerners were very indignant. At last the southern states said they would have a republic of their own, and elected a president. But the northerners said they had no right to do this, and Abraham Lincoln, the president, felt that America would never be safe and strong if it were broken up like this. Abraham Lincoln was one of the greatest presidents America ever had. He had been a poor boy living in a log cabin in the wild western state of Indiana, but he had read every book he could get and had grown to be a very wise man. He was determined to keep the states together even if slavery had to go on in the South, but the Southerners would not listen to him now. A great civil war broke out. There were heroes on both sides and great victories and defeats. The men of the North marched to a battle singing in chorus, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. For they could never forgive the Southerners for killing John Brown. The greatest leader the South had was Jackson, who was called by his men Stonewall Jackson, because they said when men were falling wounded and dead around him, he stood as steady as ever, like a stone wall. In the middle of the war, Lincoln declared that all men were free in North and South alike. Soon afterwards, Stonewall Jackson was killed, shot by mistake by his own men. At last, after two more years of fighting, the Southern Army had to surrender. Almost every family in North and South alike had lost a father or brother or son in the war. But through much suffering, two great things had been done. The states remained united and the slaves were free. But Abraham Lincoln, who had done so much for his country, and had suffered terribly when he thought of all the unnecessary waste of men's lives, was himself to die a martyr at last. He was in the theater at Washington one evening, shortly after peace was made, when a man from the South shot at him and killed him, shouting, The South is avenged! Lincoln was taken back to be buried near his old home in the Wild West. Today, the United States, whose history we have been able to tell only in this short way, is one of the most wonderful countries in the world. It is covered with great cities filled with people who are among the cleverest in the world. The American love of freedom has become a proverb. Even more than England, perhaps, people feel there that Every one should have equal chances, that it does not matter how poor a man may be or how lowly his birth, if he has brains and character. Nearly all the greatest inventions now come from America. New York, with its great, wide, straight streets and its mansions of white marble, where its rich men and millionaires live, is one of the most beautiful cities in the world, and every year millions of people pour from Europe into the United States. Russians, who find that their own government does not give them enough of freedom. Italians, who seek riches which their own land cannot give them. Norwegians, Swedes, Germans. Many of the most energetic people from all the countries of Europe are going to seek their fortune in the States. It is interesting to see how these all settle down and mix together to form the American people, all speaking the English language, which the Pilgrim Fathers took to the land three hundred years ago. One drawback to the good feeling in America is that many of the white people cannot yet believe that the colored people, the Negro descendants of the slaves whom Lincoln freed, are their equals. There is still a great deal of ill feeling, which we can only hope will pass away in time, and the Negroes get their full share of the life of the great republic. End of chapter 41 
Chapter 42 of the Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Victor Sheremet The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls By Elizabeth O'Neill Chapter 42 Section Australasia One strange result of the American War of Independence was the founding of colonies in the great continent at the opposite side of the world from Great Britain, Australia. Before that time, men who had committed crimes in England had been practically sold to the American colonists who made them work on their plantations. After the war, this could not be done any longer, and so when the discoveries of Captain Cook were making people think of Australia, it was thought a good thing to send the convicts out there as colonists. In this way it happened that, in March 1787, nine ships set out for Australia, carrying a large number of men who had broken the laws of England. It was a continent that for hundreds of years had been called the Southern Land or Australia, for men who came to know in one way or another that such a land existed, thought it stretched to the South Pole. The Chinese knew of it in the 13th century, and several men are supposed to have discovered it three centuries later. But the first discoverers, about whom we can be sure were Dutchmen, who in the 17th century sailed along the west coast, the Torres, a Spaniard, sailed through the sea which separates Australia on the north from New Guinea, and he may have seen the country, and the water is now called Torres Strait after him. The Dutchmen sailed from an island not far from Australia, called Java, and it was Abel Tasman who, sailing from there, discovered the island of Tasmania in 1642. The first Englishman to visit Australia was William Dampier, who reached it in 1688. He went there again in 1699, and thought it a very poor country, with little growing on the land and only one kind of animal. This, from his description, is now known to have been the kangaroo. The man who found out most about Australia was Captain Cook, who sailed out to make discoveries about the star which is called Venus. In October 1769 he saw the land which is now called New Zealand, and he called the water in which the ship stopped Poverty Bay because the people who lived there would not help him in any way, and were very quick to attack him. He sailed on and came to the east coast of Australia in April 1770. He made the ship stop in a little bay, which lies very near where the large town Sydney now stands. He called the bay Botany Bay, because there were so many strange plants and flowers there, but what struck him most was the strangeness of the natives. When the ship sailed into the bay, a number of them were cooking their food at a fire, but they took no notice of the ship. They didn't seem to look even when the ship let down the anchor with a great noise, but when the captain tried to set foot on the shore, some of them stood up and threatened him with their spears, even when one of the natives was shot in the leg for throwing a stone, they seemed not to be afraid, and it was with great difficulty that Captain Cook and his men could land. But they did so several times, and before sailing away, they hoisted the Union Jack to show that the land in future belonged to Great Britain. Captain Cook sailed slowly along the coast towards the north, and he called it New South Wales, as he thought it looked like the coast of Wales. He sailed to Cape York, 
the point of Australia, which is farthest north. And again he hoisted the Union Jack before sailing away to England. He was later sent out to Australia again, and this time he visited Tasmania, as well as New Zealand, and he was making discoveries in another part of the ocean when the savage natives of a small island killed him. Brave and clever as Captain Cook was, he never forgot to be kind and thoughtful about his sailors. It was other Englishmen who told the world all about the coasts of Australia, but the land within was not known for many years. Captain Flinders sailed around Australia in 1806, and in 1831 a ship named the Beagle left England with a man on board whose name will never be forgotten. Charles Darwin was sent out on this voyage to find out all he could about the rocks, plants and animals of the countries they visited. And it was this voyage that began the work which has helped people to understand more about how the first man came to be born on earth, and has led them to think that man is only the highest of an immense number of animals which little by little, in one way or another, have grown more powerful and cleverer until the highest was born. But it is more important for the present to point out that Darwin in the Beagle went around Australia, New Zealand and Tasmania, examined the coasts very carefully and wrote down what was found out. The first colonists in Australia. But before this many things had happened in Australia. The first colonists consisted of 564 men and 192 women convicts, and about 200 soldiers. They landed in Botany Bay, but Captain Philip, who was the head of colony, didn't find it a good place to live in, so he moved the settlement to Port Jackson, near Sydney. They had brought with them cows, horses, sheep, pigs, goats, and fowls, as well as plenty of seed to sow, and farming tools. But at first they found it very hard to make things grow, and many more convicts came, and many years passed before they found out how to till the land and settle down in comfort. In 1793, People who were not convicts began to go to New South Wales, and they were given land and food. Soon the town of Sydney began to grow, and by the beginning of the 19th century it had already schools, churches, a newspaper, and a theater. A few miles inland from Sydney is a range of mountains, and for a long time this prevented men from trying to find out what lay farther inland. But under Captain Macquarie, who became governor in 1809, a track was opened over the mountains, and this led to the discovery of fertile pasture land beyond. An army officer soon showed that sheep could be reared there, and settlers flocked to the new lands. Other parts of Australia were now being turned into convict settlements. Queensland to the north, Victoria to the south, and Western Australia were all colonized by convicts, and all had in consequence at some time to fight against one great peril. The way in which the first convict settlements were governed was unlike an ordinary colony. The men during the day would work in the open air, building houses, tiling the fields, and watching the sheep. Then at night they would be brought back before dark to lie in a sort of barracks, guarded by soldiers through the long hot nights, until the cool morning came. Sometimes convicts who had behaved well for a time were lent to a farmer or shepherd, 
and then they would have more freedom. They would work very much like any farm laborer. Although sometimes they were very ill-treated by the farmers who were set over them. In any case, life was very dreary and hopeless, and while it was difficult to escape from the prisons in the towns, it was almost easy to run away from a farm, especially by stealing a horse. So in time many of these men escaped. Some of them had been treated very cruelly, and they meant to have revenge. All of them were breaking the law by running away, and knowing that they would be punished if they were taken again, for there were brutal things done to convicts in those days, and especially in places far from England. They didn't care how cruel they were themselves. Sometimes they would band together and then march to a lonely farmhouse where they would steal everything valuable and shoot anyone who resisted. Very often they shot people just for amusement. At times they would wait till a number of travelers were on their way to a large town. Suddenly, when the coach had reached a lonely spot, they would appear, and while some of them stood outside holding loaded revolvers, others would take from the travelers everything they had. Naturally, the free settlers and those convicts who had finished their imprisonment and wished to start afresh tried to catch those robbers, who were called bush rangers, because they lived among the bushes and trees which grew not far from the settlements, and which had to be removed when men wanted to till the land, but it was not easy. Often the bush rangers paid men in the towns to let them know when they were to be attacked, and there were many good hiding places in the interior of the country, which it was difficult to find, and out of which it was very difficult indeed to get even one or two men if they had guns. It was much worse after 1851, when gold was first found in Australia. Men flocked out from England, and great quantities of gold were taken from the mines. When this was found near small settlements, it was kept until there was a very large quantity, and then it was sent to the nearest large town. Men would go with it to protect it, but this didn't prevent the bush rangers waiting until the gold train had reached some suitable place, when they would suddenly shoot a number of the men and force the rest to let them take the gold. Sometimes they were daring enough to march into a town and attack the bank. One very famous bush ranger was called Ned Kelly. His brother Daniel had stolen a horse in Victoria, and when the policemen came to take him, Ned shot at one and wounded him. Then he had to run away. He was joined by other bad men, and though eight thousand pounds was offered to anyone who would take the men, they were not taken for two years. They were at length traced to a wooden hut in June 1880, and the police surrounded it. All but Kelly were shot, and he was taken and hanged. This was the last of the bush rangers, but it is strange to think that they could still exist when Australia had grown so active and so rich, and when people who are still young were alive. Long before the death of Ned Kelly, Australia had begun to settle down into the condition in which it is known today. At first, New South Wales included not only the whole of Australia, but also New Zealand and the islands near but before 1840, South Australia, West Australia, Tasmania and New Zealand were cut off, and before 1860, New South Wales had become almost exactly what it is today. Queensland was the last to be treated 
as a colony. West Australia was the colony to which the last convicts were sent. And it was not until 1868 that transportation was stopped. Even Tasmania had for many years secured the right to be treated as a colony and not as a convict settlement. By the year 1856, New South Wales, the oldest colony, had become a large and rich settlement. In 1850, a university was opened in Sydney, and four years later, the first railway was finished and in use. The settlers now wished to choose a parliament from among themselves and to rule themselves. And in 1856, this was agreed to by the Parliament of Great Britain. Each of the other colonies had grown in the same way. First a small settlement was formed, then by the industry of the settlers, most of them convicts, the settlement began to grow. Soon towns were made in other parts of the colony, and then the colony was treated as separate from the parent, New South Wales. The colony grew still larger and richer, more free settlers came, and at length it was thought great enough to rule itself. But Australia has not grown without its troubles. The discovery of gold increased the number of free settlers to an enormous extent, and the new colonists were bold and independent men who had respect for themselves and for little else. This made the colonies democratic, and it caused the bitter struggles between the early colonists, who now owned a great part of the land, and the more democratic, who thought that the land should be owned by as many as possible. It also did a good deal to bring nearer the struggle between those who work and those who employ, which has resulted in the victory of the workers. When the colonies were all large and rich, many men began to feel that they ought to join together like the provinces of Canada, each colony making laws for things which concerned itself, but the colonies together making laws for other things. For some years men talked about the new idea, but some people felt so strongly against it that it could not be brought to pass. At length, in 1900, it was agreed to and on 1st January 1901, the Commonwealth of Australia commenced to exist. It has passed some wise laws, one of them being that every man is bound to be trained as a soldier, so that if necessary he will be able to fight for his country. The Commonwealth of Australia is very loyal. Its soldiers fought side by side with the British at Khartoum and in South Africa, and it has recently helped in providing ships for the fleet. New Zealand. On his last voyage, Captain Cook hoisted the Union Jack in New Zealand, but Great Britain didn't take the country, and explorers belonging to other nations visited the islands. Then in 1814 came Samuel Marsden and a number of English missionaries, and although they taught Christianity to the natives, and in this way persuaded the different tribes to remain at peace with each other, still Great Britain would not look on New Zealand as an English colony. It was not until January 1840 when the British government came to know that France intended to colonize the islands, that an officer of the British Navy was told to go to New Zealand and take possession of them. The French settlers arrived a few months later. But as the land now belonged to Great Britain, they became British subjects. The Maoris, as the natives are called, are not like the natives of Australia. Tall and strongly built, they have a brown complexion and tattoo their bodies in strange patterns. 
but they are very intelligent. And in the early years of the first colonists there were many struggles with them. Their courage was extraordinary, and as they had good guns, it took years of fighting to make them understand that the white men had come to the islands to stay, and that they meant to be the rulers. Most of the fighting went on in the North Island. The Maori's favorite way of fighting was to build a stockade, a sort of very strong fence behind which they dug pits for the men to shoot from. Sometimes great numbers of white men would be killed before the Maoris could be driven from the stockade. Some of them hated Christianity as well as hating the foreigners, and so they fought with great fairness. But others, some of them brave chiefs, fought for the English. Although the first settlers had arrived in New Zealand in 1814, it was not until 1870 that the Maoris were finally conquered. But meanwhile, many changes had taken place. Nine separate colonies had been founded in New Zealand, and each had its own way of government, and they had little to do with one another. The colony was allowed to govern itself in 1852, but for years there were struggles between the New Zealand government and the councils which ruled the nine separate states. At length, in 1876, the states were abolished, and New Zealand has since been a single colony. It has grown steadily. The land is very good for rearing sheep, and so much of it has been divided up into strips for sheep farming. Gold was discovered in 1853, and this brought to the colony great numbers of men who wanted to get rich quickly. Railways and telegraphs soon began to appear. Good roads were made, and men were encouraged to leave England and settle in New Zealand. Like the Australians, the men who live in New Zealand are very loyal to Great Britain, and men they were very eager to go out to South Africa to help the British army in the war. Like the Australians too, they have added to the ships of the navy. The people of New Zealand like the Maoris now, and they get on very well together. The population has grown steadily, and New Zealand is now a rich, prosperous country, well governed and in peace. End of chapter 42、Chapter、43 of the Story of the World, a Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 43, The French Revolution. A few years after the French had helped the United States of America to win their independence, the French nation itself began a great struggle for freedom. This struggle is the most important thing which has happened in modern times. It is called the French Revolution. All through the 18th century, France was becoming more and more in need of money. The wars of Louis XIV had cost the nation a great deal, Still, Louis had left his country great. But his great-grandson, Louis XV, who ruled after him, was very different. He lived a very bad life, and under him the French wars resulted only in losses. As we have seen, France lost India and Canada. The nation grew more and more dissatisfied. The people had not complained of having an absolute king when he had led them to victory, but now things were different. In some parts of France, the peasants were very poor, though there were very few who were not free. It is often said that it was the terrible poverty of the peasants which brought about the French Revolution, but this is not true. 
the peasants in many of the German states in Poland and in Russia were in a far worse state, for in those countries they were still serfs, like the peasants in England in the early Middle Ages. They could not leave their villages or marry unless their lords allowed them to, and they still had to work several days each week on their lords' lands, as in the early days of feudalism. Still, though the French peasants were free, they were poor. The French people had to pay great taxes at this time, and it made many of them very angry that the nobles had not to pay any at all. There was a large middle class in France, men who were educated. It was from among these that the leaders of the revolution came. Louis XV died in 1774, and his grandson, Louis XVI, who was only twenty, became king of France. He had been married four years before to Marie Antoinette, a beautiful young princess and the youngest of sixteen children of Maria Theresa. The queen was a year younger than Louis. Louis XVI was quite different from his grandfather. He was a good and very religious man, but he was not a great king. He did not understand the troubles of France and was not strong enough in character to face the difficulties of his position. Marie Antoinette was at first very merry. She seemed to the French people who saw her driving through the streets of Paris heartless and vain. But she was only a girl. The French never liked her, and she herself never forgot that she was an Austrian. But she, too, showed herself very brave, and she was always a good woman. The American Revolution, with its declaration of the rights of man, seemed a very splendid thing to many of the French. Many French soldiers and officers went over and helped the Americans against the English. Among them was a young French nobleman, the Marquis of Lafayette, who was one of the leaders in the French Revolution afterwards. Men like these thought that France, too, might become happy and free and rich again if her people were allowed power in the government. The old French Parliament, which was called the States General, had not met for 175 years when Louis XVI was persuaded to let it meet again on the 1st of May, 1789. All France was full of joy. The people thought that a new time would commence when France had its parliament like England or America. They forgot that, even when nearly 200 years before the States General had been called by French kings, it had had very little real power. All over France, the people were busy electing their representatives. There were three divisions of the States General, the nobles, the clergy or priests, and the tiers etat, or third estate, representing the people. They were to meet at the Palace of Versailles, and on the day they assembled, the 600 members of the tiers etat walked in procession, dressed in black. Behind them walked the nobles, dressed in bright-colored silks and velvets, and behind them again the king and queen and the people of their court. The people cheered the third estate and were silent as the nobles passed, for it was from the third estate, the representatives of the people, that they hoped all good things would come. They cheered the king too, but grew quiet and sullen again as the queen passed. But she made no sign, only looking up to the balcony where her eldest boy, the little eight-year-old Dauphine, who was dying, was propped up to see the procession. Before a month was over, the little boy was dead, and his younger brother was now the Dauphine. Marie Antoinette shut herself up for a day, and then came bravely out again, for there were signs of trouble in this wonderful new French parliament. The king, in his speech at the first meeting, had told the states general that they must decide among themselves whether the three orders of nobles, clergy, and the tiers etat should sit together as one house or meet and vote separately. Everyone knew that the nobles and the higher clergy would not be as willing to make great changes in the government as the tiers etat would be 
it would mean that the two votes of nobles and clergy would make the vote of the tier etat useless. So the tier etat declared that the three orders must vote together. Some of the clergy joined them, but the nobles would not. Then the tier etat, with the clergy who had joined them, declared that they were the representatives of the nation and gave themselves the new name of the National Assembly. They said that the nobles could join them if they liked, and the king could give his consent if he liked, but that it really didn't matter. The queen advised the king to resist, and an order was given that the hall in which the assembly had been meeting should be closed, and that there should be no more meetings until a day when the king was to be present. When the assembly found the door of the hall closed, they refused to break up, but held their meeting in a tennis court nearby. Here they took the famous oath that they would never separate until they had given France a constitution, by which they meant a government in which the people had some part. Louis tried to insist that the orders should vote separately, but it was no use. At Versailles and at Paris the people were growing angry, and the king had to give way. In Paris, bread was dear, and there were many strangers in the city. The feeling of disorder spread, and the common people in the streets became very rough and violent. There were many men of the middle class in Paris, like the lawyer Danton, who were anxious to get rid of the king and make changes which the assembly had not yet thought of. Three hundred men had been chosen to select the representatives of the people of Paris in the States General. These three hundred now made themselves the rulers of Paris. They began to collect soldiers to guard the city. Many of the roughest people joined this guard, which really became an army ready to fight the king. It was called the National Guard. The Hôtel des Invalides, the home of the old soldiers, was attacked and guns and powder carried off. Then the old prison of the Bastille was attacked. Here was a great quantity of powder and only the governor and a few men to defend it. In a few hours they gave up the prison, but were killed as they marched out. The news of the taking of the Bastille spread over Europe, and people understood that this was a real revolution. Marie Antoinette begged the king to flee away from France with her and her children until this dreadful time should be over, but other people advised him to stay. But many French nobles fled from France to safety, the first of many émigrés who were to follow them in the next few years. The excitement spread all over France. In many of the country districts, the peasants rose, murdered the seigneurs or lords of the land, or drove them away from their castles. They took the land for themselves, and much of the beautiful furniture in the castles was destroyed. Louis made up his mind to go to Paris, and did so. Lafayette rode before him on a white horse, and all along the road the people shouted, Long live the nation! It was only when the king, pale and anxious, stuck the new colors of the revolution, red, white, and blue, in his hat that they shouted, Long live the king! Then Louis went back to Versailles, where the queen was weeping and praying for his safety. But it was not long before the king was back in Paris again. A terrible mob of people poured out from the city to Versailles. Lafayette followed them with some soldiers of the National Guard. The mob broke into the palace and even into the queen's room, but she had fled to her husband's. Lafayette drove the mob from the palace, but still they shrieked and howled to see the king, and Louis stepped out on a balcony for all to see. Then louder cries came for the queen, and she stepped out with her children, the only two left to her, her daughter and the six-year-old Dauphine. But the crowd cried angrily that they did not want any children, and the queen signed to them to go back from the balcony. She stood there looking bravely down at the crowd. One man pointed a gun towards her, but did not fire. Lafayette stepped out on the balcony and kissed her hand. 
He was very sad now, for the revolution, from which he had hoped so much, was becoming a very different thing from what he had expected. The angry mob still shrieked that their king should go to Paris, and the royal family was led by the crowd to the palace of the Tuileries, where they lived for the next two years, the queen always with her children, frightened to go beyond the gardens of the palace, the king listening to information about the doings of the assembly, giving his consent to what he could, refusing when his conscience told him a thing was wrong. The assembly upset all the old arrangements in France. They did away with the old provinces and divided the country up into districts. Committees were sent out to rule these, but all were under the assembly. But there was so much disorder that the taxes could not be collected. The assembly was in great need of money. There were many men in it who did not believe in any religion at all, and they thought it would be an excellent plan to take the property of the church for themselves. They did so, and the clergy were then paid wages by the state. At the same time, they said that the French church should no longer be under the Pope. To these things, Louis could not agree. At last, in despair, he agreed with the queen that the best thing to do would be to try to escape. Count Fersen, who was a great friend of the queen's, brought them clothes to disguise themselves. The king was to be dressed plainly like a manservant, and the queen as a governess, traveling with the two children. The Dauphine was put into girls' clothes, and his sister, who was the only one of the family who lived through the revolution, said that he looked beautiful. They stole quietly out at ten o'clock one night to where a coach was waiting for them. Count Fersen was the coachman. Outside Paris, another coach waited for them with a German coachman, but things went wrong. The horses fell down, and it took an hour to mend the harness. They missed a third carriage which was to meet them, and then a man named Druet recognized the king. The coach rolled on, but Druet and an innkeeper took horses and raced it to her ends. There the royal family was stopped, just as they were practically saved. The next day they were taken back to the Tuileries again. The king was suspended for a time. That is, the assembly said that he should not have the position of king, but in a short time he was recognized as king once more. He gave his consent to the constitution, which left him very little power, and then the national assembly, having done its work, broke up. But things in France were now in hopeless disorder. A new parliament was to meet, to which none of the members of the assembly were to belong. New men, with no experience, were to rule the country. The king and queen were always hoping that the emperor of Austria and the other kings of Europe would come to help them. They only agreed to the laws which were passed, thinking that in a short time foreign armies would come and free them, and all would be as it had been before in France. At last, the armies did march towards France, the armies of Austria and Prussia. Leopold, the emperor, was the brother of Marie Antoinette. Maria Theresa was now dead, but Leopold died just at this time, and his son was not so well able to help his aunt. Still, after long delays, his army came. The king of Prussia sent an army, for he felt that these new things which the French were preaching everywhere were dangerous for every king in Europe. The French knew that the king and queen were riding to the other countries of Europe to help them, and the leaders of the revolution grew more and more angry, as did the Paris mob. It was the French themselves who declared war at last. All the soldiers who could be gathered together were sent off to the borders of France and the Netherlands, and the roughest men in Paris were allowed to join the National Guard. Before this, the Paris mob had broken into the Tuileries. They had stood joking roughly in the very presence of the king and queen, and stuck a red cap of liberty on the head of the little Dauphine. In the end, they had gone away without doing any harm, 
Many people all over France were now sorry for the king and queen, and kind messages poured in upon them. But once the war commenced, the most violent of the people and the leaders had things all their own way. Again the mob attacked the Tuileries, and the king and queen, with their children and the king's sister, fled for safety to the hall where the assembly had its meetings. Day after day they had to be crowded together in a small room used by newspaper reporters, and there they could hear the Parliament discussing what should be done with them. At last they were carried off to a prison in the building called the Temple in Paris. They lived here in small rooms very different from those to which they had been used. At first a few friends were allowed to stay with them, but later these were all sent away. Madame de Lamballe, a great friend of the Queen, was driven from the temple into another prison. By this time nearly all the nobles and friends of the king who had not escaped from France had been shut up in prison. In the convention, as the new parliament was called, the most violent of the revolutionaries under Marat, a madman whose one idea was a republic in which all the people should have equal power, ordered that the friends of the king in prison should be killed. A band of two hundred men went from prison to prison and murdered them. There was only one woman killed in these dreadful September massacres, as they were called. It was Marie Antoinette's friend, the Princess de Lamballe. As Louis the Sixteenth stood staring out of the window of his prison, suddenly the head of his wife's friend was held up on a spear before his eyes. The king's first thought was to prevent the queen from seeing it, but she had seen it and fainted away. The Execution of the King A week or two later the convention declared that France was a republic. For the future, they spoke of Louis the Sixteenth as Louis Capet. He was a citizen like any other. Then, three months later, Louis was brought to trial as a public enemy. He was found guilty. Three hundred and sixty-one members voted for his death, and three hundred and sixty against it. He was condemned to die. Already he had been separated from the queen and his children, but they were allowed to see him the night before he died. He was very brave and quite gentle. He made the little Dauphin promise never to take revenge for his death, and then he sent them away and gave his last hours to preparation for death. The next morning he was beheaded in a public square in Paris, assuring the great crowds who were gathered round that he died innocent. Meanwhile, the Prussians and Austrians, who had thought that they had nothing to do but march on Paris, had not been very successful. They had started too late in the season. The weather was bad, and their men fell sick. When the two armies at last fought at Valmay, they found that the French soldiers could not be driven back, and in a few days they marched out of France again. Then the French leaders at Paris were full of joy, they made up their minds to help all the peoples of Europe to set up republics, too. Their armies overran Belgium and joined it to France. Another army did the same in Savoy, on the borders of France and Italy, and another conquered the German states on the Rhine. They then declared that they would attack England and help the English republicans to set up a republic. In this they were quite mistaken, for no one in England wanted a republic. Then came the execution of the king. Soon France was standing alone against Europe. England, Holland, Spain, Austria, and Prussia were at war with her. The people in the south and west of France rose in rebellion. In La Vendée, a district in the west of France and running along the coast south of the river Loire, the peasants rose to defend their seigneurs and their religion. They nearly drove the republicans out of the district, but now the Jacobins, the worst revolutionaries of all, got power, and what is known as the Reign of Terror began. 
Everyone who was suspected of being against the revolution was brought up before judges appointed for that purpose. There was no real trial. Practically, everyone suspected was put to death. Some were nobles, but others were mere peasants. Even girls and little children and old people were put to death. In La Vendée, the revolt was put down, and people were killed in hundreds for being faithful to their lords and their church. It took too long even to behead them all with the guillotine, the great new knife machine which had been invented during the revolution, and so hundreds were thrown into the river to drown. Men who were violent, but not violent enough, were seized and condemned to death in their turn. Madame Roland, the wife of one of the leaders, had exclaimed when she was led out to die, O oh, liberty, what crimes are committed in thy name? For in the end she too was guillotined. But the queen's turn had come before this. Her children had been taken from her in prison, and she too was tried and condemned to death. She was old and white before her time, and blind in one eye through the cold and damp of her last prison. For her last days were spent not even in the temple, but in the common prison. From there she was drawn, sitting on a cart, with her hands tied to be guillotined before the Paris mob. Her little boy died in prison after being treated with the greatest cruelty, but her daughter was at last sent to her mother's relations in Austria. A girl from Normandy, called Charlotte Corday, traveled up from the country to Paris and stabbed Marat to the heart for his cruelty. She was killed in her turn. Danton and Robespierre, great leaders of the revolution, were killed too. At last the reign of terror came to an end. France was winning victories on all her boundaries. Now that Robespierre was gone, the people all over France asked for a complete change of government. They turned against the Jacobins, who were left, and many of these were massacred in their turn. After a time in which religion had been attacked so cruelly, the people were now again crowding to the churches. Many of the emigres came back to France. It was thought, even, that the little Dauphin, who was still alive in prison, might be made king, but this was not to be. At last, a new constitution was set up. It consisted of two houses of parliament, and at the head, five men called the directors. But in the lower house of the new parliament, many of the Jacobins were to sit again. There was a great deal of disorder at the elections, and a young officer called Napoleon Bonaparte was called in by Barras, the head of the government, to put down an insurrection. In this way, this young officer became important. We shall see what a great part he played in the history of France and the world in the next twenty years. End of chapter 43 Chapter 44 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 44 The Story of Napoleon Napoleon Bonaparte was born of a good family in the island of Corsica in the year 1769, the year after Maria Antoinette was married to Louis XVI of France. Corsica had for many years been fighting for its independence against Genoa, but had at last been sold by that state to France. So Napoleon Bonaparte, though he was Italian by birth, was a subject of the French king. When he was a boy, he was fond of playing with a drum and sword, and his father made up his mind that he should be a soldier. 
When he was ten years old, he was sent to France to be trained at schools for boys intending to join the army, and he became a lieutenant in an artillery regiment when he was sixteen. When the revolution broke out, Napoleon, although he had never been very fond of France because of its conquest of Corsica, was filled with enthusiasm for it. Corsica sent representatives to the Tierra Ta, and all the reforms which were made in France were carried out in Corsica too. In the first years after the beginning of the revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte lived quietly at lodgings at Auxon where his regiment was stationed, and did all he could to educate his young brother Louis, who lived with him. Their father was by this time dead, and Napoleon was looked upon as the head of his family, although he was only the second son. The other officers in his regiment were royalists, and Napoleon was very lonely, for he could not mix freely with them. He had always been fond of history, and he read now all he could find, being especially fond of Julius Caesar's own account of his wars in Gaul. He had to take his sister home to Corsica when the convent at which she was a pupil was broken up by the revolutionaries, as so many convents and monasteries were. But it was not long before all the Bonapartes had to leave Corsica, for Paoli, the chief man in the island, turned against France after the death of the king, and joined himself with England to fight against France. The Bonapartes went to France. Napoleon had a better chance of rising quickly as an officer, because the army was in great need of good officers, through the loss of so many royalists. He first won great praise for himself by the way in which he helped in the attack on the royalists at Toulon in 1793. They had let British and Spanish soldiers into the town, and the Republicans were afraid that more and more might come, and that a great attack might be made on France from this port. The first officers sent against Toulon did very little good. One of them was an artist who knew nothing about fighting. It was Napoleon who pointed out the weak side of the town where the attack could be made. The town was conquered, and an English invasion of France by way of Toulon was now impossible. After this, Napoleon helped a great deal in fortifying places along the coast of France. He still spent all his spare time in studying the science of war. The help which he gave the Directory in putting down the insurrection in Paris in 1795 made him great. He had fallen in love with Josephine du Beauharnais, the widow of a French noble who had been executed during the Revolution. Josephine was very lively and beautiful and one of the greatest women in France at the time. She was a friend of Barras, the chief man in the directory, and he persuaded her to marry Napoleon. She was six years older than Napoleon and did not care much for the thin, pale-faced officer, but she at last agreed to marry him, though she would not go with him two days after the marriage to Italy, where he had got the command of the French army. The attack on Italy was part of the war against Austria, to whom most of the north of Italy belonged. Two other armies were to march through Germany and attack Vienna. Napoleon was only one of the generals of the Republic, but he knew that he was the best soldier of his time, and he had already made up his mind to imitate Julius Caesar and to make himself dictator of France, and of as much of Europe as he could win. It was a wonderful plan for this young Corsican officer even to think of, and more wonderful still is the fact that he nearly carried it out and that for years he kept all Europe struggling to overthrow his power. The Emperor of Austria had the King of Sardinia to help him in the north of Italy, but Napoleon always tried to keep his enemy split up, and prevented the army of Piedmont, which was under the rule of the King of Sardinia, from joining the Austrian army. And soon the King of Sardinia made his peace with Napoleon, giving Piedmont up to France. Napoleon then easily conquered the Austrians and took the north of Italy. 
he made the people pay him money, and he chose some of the most beautiful of the art treasures of Italy to send back to France. Before this, Prussia and Spain had been frightened into making peace with France, and Spain and Holland were even helping that country at this time. But England was still the greatest power on the sea, and victories were won over both the Spanish and Dutch fleets. Now, in 1797, Austria made peace and agreed to give up the north of Italy to France. The Great Lord Nelson England was now left alone to fight the French. When Napoleon got back to Paris, it was quite plain that he could do just what he liked. But he did not have himself made dictator yet. He pretended that he was going to invade England, but he really intended to sail to Egypt, conquer it, and Syria, and from there perhaps win both India and Europe. When Napoleon sailed off to the east, part of the British fleet under Sir Horatio Nelson followed it. Nelson was soon to show himself the greatest of English seamen. He was a small, delicate-looking man, but he was a splendid sailor and soldier, and had been at sea since he was twelve years old. A story is told of him that, when he was still a young midshipman, he was on a ship which sailed into the ice-bound seas near the North Pole. He and another boy stole away one night to see if they could find and shoot a bear. A fog came on, and the captain was very anxious when he knew that the boys were missing. But when the fog melted away, he saw them far off, ready to attack a bear. The captain called to them to come back to the ship, and the other boy did so. But Nelson cried out, begging the captain to let him have just one blow at the bear. But the captain had a shot fired which frightened the bear away. When Nelson got back to the ship, the captain scolded him, but he said sorrowfully, I wanted to kill the bear and take its skin home to my father. Horatio Nelson never knew what it was to be afraid. When the fleet under Nelson came up with the French fleet, they were anchored in the Bay of Abakir, close to the shore of Egypt. Napoleon was already fighting on the land and winning Egypt from the Mameluk. Nelson ordered five of his ships to sail in between the French ships and the shore, for, he said, where the French ships had room to swing, the English had room to anchor. In this way, the French ships were caught between two fires. The battle began at sunset and went on all night. By morning, eleven of the thirteen French ships had been destroyed or taken. The French admiral's flagship had blown up, and the admiral himself had been killed. It was on this ship that the ten-year-old boy, Casa Bianca, died standing at his post on the burning ship until his father should give him leave to go. His father was already dead, though Casa Bianca did not know it, and the brave boy died too. Nelson was wounded in the forehead, but he had won the great battle of the Nile. After this, no other fleet had any chance against the English in the Mediterranean. Meanwhile, Napoleon went on from Egypt to Syria, which he meant to win from Turkey. But he could not take Acre, which the English officer, Sir Sidney Smith, helped to defend. Then, suddenly, Napoleon slipped back to France in a fast-sailing ship. He was much needed there, for trouble was threatening the directors from all sides. Napoleon was greeted with joy as the conqueror of Egypt. He was wise enough not to say much about Syria. When Napoleon left France, England was the only country at war with the Republic, but he came back to find that a new coalition had now been formed against her. England, of course, was in it, for it was England from the first who was most determined to resist the attacks of France on the lands of Europe. Russia and Austria were the other chief members of the coalition. While Napoleon was away, the Directory had been in great need of money, and they had actually sent an army to attack Rome, where there were a few Republicans. The old Pope, Pius VI, was a very good and gentle man, and Rome had been quite happy under him, 
far happier than it was now when the French turned it into a republic and then took as much money and as many of its art treasures as they could get. The people of Europe were horrified to hear that the Pope had even been roughly treated, his staff dragged from his hand and his ring from his finger. He was carried off to Siena and then to Valence in France, where he stayed till he died. The French soon made themselves hated in Rome. For the same reason they set up a united republic in Switzerland, calling it the Helvetian Republic. The cantons, as a division of Switzerland were called, were each used to governing themselves and did not want this new form of government. The Kingdom of Naples, whose queen, Marie Caroline, was a sister of Marie Antoinette, was also turned into a republic, though here very few of the people wished for this change. When the coalition began to fight, the French were defeated in North Italy by the great Russian general Suvorov. Suvorov was a very wonderful general. He never dreamed of failure, and when he had fought and won a battle, he always still had strength to pursue the enemy as they fled. His men took the same courage from him. His commands before a battle were almost amusing from the confident way they would begin with such words as, The hostile army will be taken prisoners. The king and queen of Naples were given back their kingdom, and Nelson's fleet stood by to defend them. In Switzerland, an Austrian officer led an Austrian and Russian army against the French, but could not drive them out. Still, things were going very badly with the French when Napoleon got back from Egypt. The people were quite tired of the directory. The Abseyes, a priest, who had been making constitutions ever since the revolution began, had another one ready now. The worst of paper constitutions, that is, constitutions which are drawn up out of a man's head without any experience of how they work, is that they very seldom will work at all. This new constitution of the year eight, as it was called, for now in France the years were counted from the year one, the first year of the destruction of the monarchy and the setting up of the republic was carefully drawn up so that power was divided between many people and nobody had any real power at all. Napoleon thought it would be a very good constitution indeed, with one change. At the head of all the other parts of the constitution, there should be a first consul, and he should be Napoleon himself. Napoleon had his great army behind him, ready to fight for him to a man and the French people had no chance to say no, even if they had wished. But they were tired of disorder, and were only too glad to have a strong man to govern them. For the first consul was just as absolute as any king of France had ever been. Four years afterwards he was given the name of emperor, but he was the all-powerful ruler of France from the moment he became first consul at the end of the year 1799. The few serfs who were still remaining in France at the Revolution became free. The property which had been taken from the church and given to other people was not given back, but the churches which had not been given away were. Peace was made with the Pope, and the Catholic religion was made the religion of the state again, but the priests were to be servants of the state and paid by the government as they are still in France today. So many changes which the revolution had made remained, but there was no real democracy or self-government, which was what the Republicans had fought so hard for. Each district in France was governed by men chosen by Napoleon, so that he had the whole government of the country in his hands, just as much as Louis the Fourteenth had had. The people were not more free under Napoleon in many ways than they had been before. The freedom of the press, which the revolutionaries had given, by which any man could publish any book he liked, was now stopped. Every book had to have the consent of people appointed by the emperor. 
Then, too, Napoleon could imprison or send anyone out of the country just as he liked. He had his spies everywhere to watch the people and inform him if anyone was dangerous to the government. As time went on, too, Napoleon became more and more anxious to have a magnificent court. The old nobles who were willing to come back were gladly received, for Napoleon liked to have men with high-sounding names around him. The revolutionaries had said there should be no new titles, but Napoleon loved to make men dukes for their services to him, and a new nobility grew up around him. His coronation with Josephine in 1804 was a very gorgeous affair. Napoleon had persuaded the new pope, Pius VII, to go to Paris for the coronation, but when the moment came, he preferred to put the crown on his head himself. Napoleon was dressed for the ceremony in a red velvet coat and over it a purple robe of velvet trimmed with ermine while Josephine knelt beside him in white satin and diamonds. Russia had by this time made peace with Napoleon for the Tsar Paul admired him very much and had only really been led to declare war against France because Napoleon had attacked the Turks and Russia thought that the western countries of Europe should leave the east alone and that if anyone won land from Turkey, it should be Russia herself. So now Napoleon had England and Austria to fight. He knew that a large Austrian army was at the foot of the Italian side of the Alps, near the Mount St. Bernard, a very difficult place. But he led his men across. It was a very difficult march with cannons and baggage, but Napoleon's soldiers could do almost anything. They fought the Austrians and won the great battle of Marengo. In Germany, another of Napoleon's generals won the Battle of Hohenlinden, and now Austria, too, made peace, leaving Napoleon with all his conquests. And so once more England was left to fight France alone. Russia had persuaded Sweden, Prussia, and Denmark, all the countries with ships on the Baltic, to complain of the way in which England treated their ships. England had forbidden ships of countries which were not at war to carry things between countries which were at war and other things which were quite right. For if England had not forbidden these things, a country like Sweden could have helped France very much against her without declaring war. But now these countries complained and England had to fight them. A fleet was sent to Denmark under Nelson, but over him was Sir Hyde Parker, who was not nearly so fine a fighter or officer as Nelson. He sent messages to the Danes, hoping to be able to make an agreement without fighting. This made Nelson very impatient, but the Danes were obstinate, and so a great battle was fought outside the harbor of the city of Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark. It was a hard fight, and in the middle of it, Sir Hyde Parker, fearing that the English could be defeated, put up a signal, cease action. Nelson did not see it at first, and when someone told him of it, he put a telescope to his blind eye, for he had lost one eye and an arm, too, in battle some years before, and said, I do not see the signal, and so went on fighting. He was right, for the English won a great victory. The Danes promised to give up their fleet, and now Napoleon had no more hope of destroying England's power on the seas. Soon after, the Tsar Paul died, and his son Alexander became king. Though Alexander admired Napoleon too, he was much under the influence of his mother and her friends, and he was persuaded to give up the friendship with France. So England had her way, after all, about the ships of the countries which were not at war. Just at this point, the younger Pitt, the son of the great Earl of Chatham, gave up his position as head of government in England. 
It was he who had been so determined to fight the French, and Napoleon took advantage of his absence to arrange a peace with England. A peace was signed, but it did not last long. Napoleon never meant it to. He hated England with a bitter hatred. So far he had been able to conquer the old-fashioned armies of the European countries, but everywhere the English had won by sea. These victories of the English were partly owing to the fact that the English were a real nation, while the feeling of nationality was not awake yet in Europe, except perhaps in France itself. The armies of Austria made war on Napoleon because their emperor told them to, but they had no great interest in the battle. Later on, when the peoples of Europe began to hate Napoleon, things were different. The younger Pitt came back to power in 1804 and immediately began to plan another coalition, but even before this, Napoleon was building a great fleet of flat-bottomed boats in which he hoped to carry soldiers across to England and conquer it. He knew that England had no great army to meet his, but already Englishmen everywhere were offering themselves as volunteers and drilling hard so as to be able to fight the French when they came. Napoleon ordered Spain, whose weak king Charles IV was entirely in his power, to build a fleet too. The French and Spanish fleets were to sail to the West Indies, and Napoleon hoped that the greater part of the British fleet would follow them. Then the remaining French fleet would easily destroy the English fleet in the Channel and land the Army of England in England. But things went wrong. The English fleet watched the others too well, and the whole plan failed. Meanwhile, Pitt had got his coalition, when Russia and Austria joined him once more in war against Napoleon. One thing which made the other countries very angry was the way that Napoleon behaved when, in 1804, he found out a plot to kill him and put the uncle of Louis XVI on the French throne. This uncle, who was called Louis XVIII by the royalists, was in England, and Napoleon could not get at him, but he ordered French soldiers to arrest the Duc d'Enguillon, a young prince of the French royal family who was living in one of the German states. Napoleon had no right to arrest a prisoner in any other country. This was an insult in itself, but people were still more horrified to hear that the young prince had been shot by order of Napoleon, although he had not had anything to do with the plot. The Death of Nelson in October 1805, Napoleon, seeing that he could not land his army in England, sent it across Europe to fight the Austrians in Bavaria. It won a great victory at Ulm, but two days after, Nelson won another victory at sea, the victory of Trafalgar. The Battle of Trafalgar was fought off the Spanish coast near the Cape of Trafalgar. The English, under Nelson, fought the united fleets of France and Spain. The ships fought close together in a terrible struggle, and the English almost completely destroyed the enemy's fleets. At the beginning of the fight, Nelson ordered the famous signal to be made to all his ships, England expects every man to do his duty. But Nelson, at the head of his line of ships, on his own ship, the Victory, was wounded in the breast. His coat was covered with medals, which he had refused to take off when someone suggested that the enemy would recognize him through them and shoot specially at him. But as he was carried down below deck to die, he covered them and his face with a handkerchief, lest his men should see that he was dying and be discouraged. Before he died, he knew that the victory had been won. Almost his last words were, Thank God I have done my duty, and then he asked his friend Captain Hardy to kiss him. We may still see Nelson's ship, the Victory, at anchor outside Portsmouth Harbor. Very quaint it seems to us today when we compare our own ironclad man-of-war with this battleship of a hundred years ago. 
In spite of Trafalgar, Napoleon seemed all-powerful, for after Ulm, he won a very brilliant victory at Austerlitz, and once more Austria and Russia made peace with him. At the beginning of the French Revolutionary Wars, the leader of the revolution had tried to set up republics all around France, but now Napoleon did away with the republics and turned them into kingdoms, as he had really made France again. But they were not to be independent kingdoms. Most of them were ruled by Napoleon's brothers or his generals, and all, of course, had to do exactly what the emperor told them. All Napoleon really cared for now was victory and power. He drove the king and queen from Naples and put his brother Joseph there as king of the two Sicilies. Holland, or the Bactrian Republic, now became a kingdom again under his brother Louis. The electorate of Hanover, which belonged to the English king, was taken, and for a time given to Prussia, but later, with some other states joined to it, became the kingdom of Westphalia, and over this another brother, Jerome Bonaparte, reigned as king. Napoleon had himself crowned king of North Italy. The smaller German states he joined together under his protection and called them the Confederation of the Rhine. As though to make all these changes in Europe the more remarkable still, the Emperor of Austria gave up his title of Holy Roman Emperor, which had been so carefully treasured and handed down through the Middle Ages, and called himself for the future of the hereditary Emperor of Austria. Napoleon would dearly have loved the title of Roman Emperor for himself. All this Russia and Austria had to agree to when the coalition broke up in 1806. Soon after this, William Pitt died. Charles James Fox, one of the greatest statesmen of the day, who had at first been enthusiastic about the French Revolution because of its cry for freedom, now tried to make peace with Napoleon, too, but failed. Now, at last, the King of Prussia, Frederick William III, declared war, too, against Napoleon, but his army was completely defeated in the Battle of Jena, and Napoleon marched to Berlin, the Prussian capital. Then Russia joined the army of Prussia, but both were defeated, and Napoleon and Alexander of Russia met and made the Peace of Tilsit. They met in a raft on the middle of the river at Tilsit. Napoleon cleverly did all he could to make the young Tsar admire him. When he had done this, he flattered him by suggesting that they too should divide Europe and Asia between them. Napoleon's idea was that he himself should be emperor of the West, by which he meant all Europe except Russia and Sweden, while Alexander should be emperor of the East and be allowed to win power over Sweden and Turkey. The idea pleased Alexander very much. For five years, Napoleon and Alexander were friends. Napoleon's first idea after the Peace of Tilsit was to try once more to ruin England. He forbade every country in Europe to trade with Britain. As every country in Europe depended very much on the things brought to them in English ships, this would have been very difficult. The countries of Europe still bought things brought in English ships and had to pay more for them because of the extra difficulties. Even Napoleon had to buy cloth for his soldiers' clothes from England. The two most faithful friends which England had were Sweden and the little kingdom of Portugal. Alexander of Russia was left to deal with Sweden. Alexander attacked Sweden, whose brave king, Gustavus IV was made to abdicate because he would not give up his friendship with England. His uncle was made king of Sweden, but had to agree that one of Napoleon's generals should be king after him. He had to give up Finland, too, which was now taken by Russia. While Napoleon made up his mind to punish Portugal, he thought it would be easy enough. 
he made up his mind to send a French army into Spain, and he asked the chief officer of the Spanish king to join a Spanish army with it. These two armies poured into Portugal, and the royal family and all the greatest men of Portugal took refuge in the fleet. Some English ships came to protect them, and they sailed off to Brazil. Meanwhile, there was much quarreling between the King Charles IV of Spain, who was almost an imbecile, and his son Ferdinand, who was not much better. Napoleon asked them both to meet him at Bayonne, and there he threatened Ferdinand, who called himself already King of Spain, because his father had abdicated, that if he also did not give up his claim to the throne in a few hours, he should be treated as a rebel. So Ferdinand gave up his rights to his father again, but Charles IV had already sold his kingdom to Napoleon for a palace in France and a pension. Then Napoleon offered the crown of Spain to Louis, his brother, remarking that the climate of Holland did not suit him. But Louis refused, and it was then given to Joseph Bonaparte, who gave up his kingdom of the two Sicilies to one of Napoleon's generals. Spain's Struggle with Napoleon But while Napoleon had been busy making all these arrangements, he had forgotten all about the Spanish people. It was a dreadful mistake. They were very angry indeed when they heard that their country was being bought and sold in this way. National feeling in Spain rose against Napoleon. The people were determined to fight this conqueror and tyrant. Every peasant took up arms, and though the armies of Spain were made up of men who had not fought before, they soon showed themselves able to fight the French armies on equal terms. The siege of Saragossa, the capital of Aragon, is among the famous sieges of history. There were only a few hundred Spanish soldiers to hold its low brick wall against a large French army, but women and children and monks and nuns, as well as the ordinary men of the city, did their part to help. The children carried the cartridges which the nuns made. When the hospital where the wounded soldiers lay was set on fire, the women carried the men from their beds through the flames. At another place, an army of 18,000 French had to surrender their arms to an army of young Spanish soldiers quite new to war. The tale of these things spread through Europe. The English sent armies, too, to help the Spaniards, and so began the Peninsular War. In this war there fought on the English side Sir Arthur Wellesley, who afterwards became famous as the Duke of Wellington. He had already won great victories for England over the natives of India, who had risen against the English when Napoleon had sent them word that he was coming to help them drive the English out of India. Wellesley landed in Portugal in August 1808 and drove the French armies right out of that country. This was a great gain, for now England had a country from which she could attack Napoleon over land. Sir Arthur Wellesley was called back to England, but Sir John Moore in the same winter prevented Napoleon, who had now come unexpectedly, from conquering the South. Sir John Moore had to lead his men over the ridges of the hills of Galicia to Coruna, where he expected English ships to take his worn-out soldiers back to England. It was one of the greatest retreats of history. The hills were covered with snow. Every now and then the English had to turn and fight the foremost of those following them. Napoleon did not follow long, for he had to go back to Germany, but one of his generals took his place. At last, when they reached the coast, the English army turned and fought one more great battle. They won, but the noble Sir John Moore was killed. Every child knows the poem which tells about his burial. Then Sir Arthur Wellesley came back to Spain. For five years he fought against the French generals there. The Spanish armies were not much used to him, but the ordinary peasants and working people helped him very much. He had to fight the great battles himself, but wherever a few French soldiers were met by peasants, 
they were attacked and killed, for the Spaniards were now full of hate for the French, who had tried to buy and sell their nation. During five years, Napoleon had to leave 250,000 soldiers to fight in Spain, while he himself was fighting in other places. He always thought that his officers there were fighting badly. It was a long time before he understood what a great soldier Wellesley was, though at last he said, so the story tells us, this Wellesley seems to be a man indeed. He did not then know that this same Wellesley, as Duke of Wellington, was to overthrow his power at last. The example of Spain filled the peoples of Europe with enthusiasm. Up to now, there had not been any real national feeling in any country of Europe except England. In the east of Europe, as we have seen, districts were bought and sold and handed about from one country to another. But now, things were different. The peoples in Europe began to hate Napoleon, just as the people of Spain did. The French Revolution itself, though it now seemed a failure, had spread new ideas of freedom among the peoples of Europe. Napoleon himself, though he would have no government by the people, which was what the leaders of the revolution had wanted, made many reforms in the countries he conquered. Better laws and justice were given. In France, much better schools were set up, and Napoleon tried to have even the poor boys in the countries he conquered educated, though he thought that education did not matter at all for girls. They were best at home with their mothers, he thought. He was very old-fashioned indeed on this subject, but perhaps the greatest reform of all was the setting free of many serfs in the east of Europe. With this freedom, the peasants began to feel a hope and pride in the countries to which they belonged. The defeat of the Prussians at Jena made that people very angry, and a great Prussian statesman named Stein now arose and made many reforms in Prussia. The serfs were free, and every young man was trained in the army. Many of these things were what Napoleon himself had advised in other countries, but when he found people doing these things for themselves, he was afraid, for he knew that the love of freedom would grow and that the nations would rise against him. So he made the king of Prussia send Stein away. But he could not destroy the work he had begun. A new love of freedom spread through all Germany, a sort of excitement like that which had moved the men of the Renaissance. New German poets, like the great Goethe, began to write, and the young men of Germany joined themselves in secret clubs and societies, determined to drive the hated foreigners out of their land. The little district of Tyrol had belonged to Austria for 400 years, but now it had been given to the king of Bavaria. It rose in revolt. Tyrol is a country of mountains where simple peasants lived, but it was the peasants who were now showing themselves so brave everywhere. They were led by Andrew Hoffer, a village innkeeper, a tall man, strong as a giant. The peasants rose under him and won their country back for a time, but they were defeated later, and Hoffer was shot. Meanwhile, Napoleon had defeated the Austrians once more at the Battle of Wagram. The Emperor of Austria was forced to make peace, and he was forced to allow an Austrian princess, the Archduchess Marie Louise, to marry Napoleon. The Empress Josephine had not had any children since her marriage with Napoleon, and he longed above all things to have a son to hold his empire after him. So now he divorced Josephine in spite of her begging him not to do so. She lived quietly by herself after this, and the Emperor sometimes visited her. He was full of joy when Marie Louise had a son, who is generally called the young Napoleon. He did not know that, while his son was still a little child, he would lose the empire he had meant to hand on to him. The Fall of Napoleon Napoleon seemed now more powerful than ever. 
the English armies which were sent to help in Europe were not sent to the right places, for the second Lord Chatham, the son of the elder Pitt, and the brother of the younger, was not a clever man, and it was he who had the arrangement of the war. But now, at last, the friendship between Alexander of Russia and Napoleon came to an end. Alexander would not help Napoleon to try to ruin the English trade, and so Napoleon made up his mind to attack Russia itself. He led what he called his grand army of half a million of his best soldiers, trained now in many years of war. Half of these were French, the rest soldiers from the countries he had conquered. When he reached Dresden with his army, Marie Louise and the little king of Rome, as the baby was called, were with him. The emperor of Austria, the king of Prussia, and other kings were present to do him honor. It was for the last time. And now Napoleon led his great army into Russia. He was sure of victory, but he did not know Russia. On he marched across the vast country, but the heat was terrible, for in Russia the summers are very hot and the winters terribly cold. Many horses died and many soldiers deserted, and the Russian generals, instead of fighting, led Napoleon on across the vast country. Winter was coming on, and Napoleon thought of staying where he was till the spring, but he was impatient. He must conquer Russia and take Moscow at once, and so he pushed on. One battle there was in which he conquered the Russians, but lost 30,000 men himself. A week later, the Grand Army, or what was left of it, reached Moscow. Food had run short, but now all hoped to get as much as they wanted. Napoleon expected that the Tsar would come to meet him and surrender himself and the keys of the capital. But what was his surprise when he reached the city to find the streets empty? There were no people, and worse still, there was no food. Indeed, the city was breaking into flames, for the Russians had preferred to burn their town rather than give it up to Napoleon. And now there was nothing to do but turn back and march across that dreary land through the terrible frost and snow west again. A Russian army blocked the way, and in another battle thousands more men were lost. There was nothing to eat but horse flesh, and the soldiers' clothes froze on them. Napoleon, in the gray overcoat which he always wore, was pale and haggard with anxiety. All the way the Russians attacked the outer parts of the army without giving battle. At the river Beresina, the bridge had been cut down, and the Russians were waiting at the other side. The French built a bridge and struggled across the icy water, but the Russians attacked them, and thousands were driven back into the river and drowned. Napoleon never showed any sign of weakness, but led the remnant of his army on, until at the town of Vilna he heard bad news, and at last left his army and pushed on as fast as he could to Paris. After this, the army fell into disorder, and only a few thousands of the half-million men whom Napoleon had led so proudly into Russia crossed the river Neman and left it again. At Paris, Napoleon said that things had gone well, but that the cold of the winter had caused losses in the army but he could not deceive Europe. The Prussian people now rose and forced the government to declare war once more on Napoleon. Russia joined them, and then Austria. The armies against Napoleon were more dangerous than ever before, but he did not give up hope. He was still able to get together an enormous army, and he won one more victory at Dresden, but at the great Battle of the Nations at Leipzig, he was defeated and driven across the Rhine. Even now, the countries of Europe would have been glad to leave him France for himself, but he would not agree, and so the armies followed him into France. Even now, he won brilliant victories, but he could no longer keep his enemies divided and fight them one by one, as he had so often and so cleverly done before. 
His generals told him it was madness to resist, and at last the great emperor, who had defied Europe so long, had to confess that he was beaten. At first he offered to abdicate in favor of his son, but none would agree to this. He had to abdicate altogether. But even now the people of Europe hardly dared to suggest that he should become as other men. He was still to be called emperor, but he was to be kept quite safe on the little island of Elba, which was to be the only land left to him. There Napoleon went, and the brother of Louis the Sixteenth came to be the king of France, and was called Louis the Eighteenth. A congress of representatives of the five great countries of Europe, Russia, Prussia, Austria, France, and Great Britain met at Vienna. There were many things to settle after the terrible confusion of the last twenty-five years, and the representatives soon began to quarrel. Meanwhile, Napoleon was lonely in Elba, alone with thoughts which drove him nearly mad. Of all he had lost, and all he had nearly won. Marie Louise had gone home to Austria and taken her baby with her. She had refused to follow her husband to the lonely island of Elba. Napoleon had joked as he looked down one day from the top of the highest hill in Elba, saying with a smile, It must be confessed that my island is very small. But at last he could bear it no longer. He made up his mind to have one last try for power. He had heard that the new king of France, Louis the Eighteenth was not a man whom the French would love or admire. He knew, too, that his own soldiers had loved him and remembered how the men of his imperial guard had wept when he bade them goodbye. He would go to France and try to win it back again. Soon news came to Vienna that Napoleon had landed in France and was marching to Paris, and that the French soldiers were trooping to his standard, and Louis the Eighteenth had fled. The Congress broke up. Nothing could be done until he was conquered again. Wellington, who had driven the French right out of Spain in 1813, was the man to save Europe. For a hundred days, Napoleon ruled at Paris, getting together once more an enormous army, while Prussia and England and Austria and Russia did the same. But Napoleon was the quickest, and he made up his mind to attack the Prussians under their general, Blücher, in Belgium, then the English under Wellington, before the two armies could join together, and before the Russians and Austrians, who were marching across Europe, should come up to them. He attacked the Prussians at Ligny and defeated them. Blücher then drew his army back towards Wavre, but Napoleon thought he had gone to Namur. Napoleon sent some regiments toward Namur to prevent Blücher joining the English. He then turned to attack Wellington at a place called Quatre Bras, or the Four Roads. Wellington had already fought with one of Napoleon's officers, but neither side won, and now Wellington drew off towards Waterloo, a plain near Brussels. Here Napoleon followed and attacked, and on the 18th of June the great battle of Waterloo was fought. It was the first time that Napoleon and Wellington had met to fight each other. The English army was posted on a ridge of hills. On the road below he left men to guard the farmhouse of La Haye Saint, and still further to the right more men to guard the farm and castle at Hougoumont. The French were drawn up on a ridge at the other side of the valley. Both generals were sure of victory. At half-past eleven in the morning, the battle began. Napoleon's plan of battle was to stagger the enemy's front with artillery, and then, before they had recovered, to send in bodies of cavalry to break them up or ride them down. But he could hardly do this with the two farms in the way. The French, therefore, made many determined attacks on La Haye Saint and Hougoumont, but could not take them. 
It was a tremendous struggle and very equal, but at half past four in the afternoon, Blucher, with his Prussians, tired after a long march but fresh enough to fight, came up and attacked the right of the French army. Soon after, Wellington cried, Up, guards, and at them! And the fifteen hundred English guards, whom he had kept in reserve till then, dashed on to the French ranks. The line broke, and the French turned and fled. Only the imperial guards stood close round the emperor. The British begged them to surrender, for they hated to cut down such brave men. The guard dies but does not surrender, was the answer. At last, Napoleon rode sadly from the field. He had lost everything. True, 25,000 English and Prussians lay dead on the field, and Wellington wept as the list was read to him. But it was the end of the great struggle, and Napoleon knew it. He tried to get away in a ship to America, but the shores of France were too closely watched. At last he gave himself up to the officers on the battleship the Bellerophon, which sailed to Plymouth. Meanwhile it had been decided that he should be sent to the island of St. Helena, halfway between the coasts of Africa and South America. There he would be safe. He lived there for six years, with sentinels posted round his house, and an English officer visiting him every day to make sure that he was still there. English battleships lay at anchor round the island to make doubly sure. For the most part, he was calm and spent much of his time writing down his memoirs, the story of his life as it seemed to him. There is much that is true and much that is false in his story. Near him were always the portraits of Josephine, who died soon after Waterloo, and Marie-Louise and his son, the young Napoleon, who was never to be emperor after all. Napoleon was buried at St. Helena, but years afterward the French people, remembering his greatness, for he was, after all, one of the greatest men who had ever lived, had his body carried to Paris and buried there in a gorgeous tomb with a circle of great marble figures looking down on the spot where the body of the emperor lies. End of chapter 44 Chapter 45 of The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls, by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 45, The Remaking of Europe. The Congress at Vienna had now to begin again the work of putting order into the Europe with which Napoleon had been playing chess for so many years. France was reduced to the size it had been in 1789, before the Revolutionary Wars began. Many of the provinces she had conquered on the Rhine were more French than German, but most of the German states were formed into a loose confederation, and these were included in it. The part of Poland which had been taken from Prussia was given to Alexander of Russia. Holland and Belgium were joined together as one kingdom, and given to the royal house of Orange, the former rulers of Holland. Holland and Belgium were two quite different nations in race and in religion, but no notice was taken of nationality, although it was really the spirit of nationalism which had overthrown Napoleon at last. The north of Italy was given back to Austria, and Savoy to the king of Sardinia, the king and queen of Naples went back to their kingdom. Spain had already been given back to Ferdinand Seventh. The great kings of Europe looked on the French Revolution as a thing which was over. It was to them a kind of bad dream. Some of its ideas had already become part of the laws of the countries, but the Holy Alliance, in which the Emperor of Austria, the Tsar of Russia, and the King of Prussia joined, made it quite clear that they believed in absolute government. They would try to do good things for the people, but the people must not do anything for themselves. So the nineteenth century began. But the ideas of the French Revolution were not dead, and all the nations have been slowly winning the liberty and equality which the Revolution had tried to teach. 
Louis the Eighteenth was restored to the throne of France once more, but it was understood that he was to give the nation a constitution. France was to have a parliament of two houses, like England. Louis the Eighteenth was a sensible and rather clever man. He had spent his days in exile since the revolution in Russia, until he was driven away twice by the changing plans of both Tsars, and afterwards in England. He was prepared to be very tolerant and moderate, but the lower house of its first parliament was very violent. The elections had been made while emigres were pouring back to France, and many of the people, especially in the South, were full of relief that the old ways, as they thought, had come back. Many of the people who were known to have been in favor of the revolution were massacred by the peasants, who were full of revenge for all they and their church had suffered. These massacres were afterwards spoken of as the White Terror. The lower house insisted on the trial of some of Napoleon's greatest friends, and the brave Marshal Ney was tried and shot. Many others were driven from the country. But at last Louis dissolved this parliament, and the next was much more moderate. The other countries of Europe had left a large army in France, and France had to pay a great sum of money to help to make up to these countries for the expenses of the wars against Napoleon. But now the army was withdrawn, and things were quiet in France for some years. Perhaps the thing which the French people felt most in the conditions of the peace of 1815 was that most of the beautiful works of art which Napoleon had stolen from all over Europe and brought to Paris had to be sent back. Louis the Eighteenth reigned in France until he died in 1824, and his brother became king, and was called Charles X. Charles X was not such a wise man as Louis the Eighteenth. He was not content to rule as a constitutional king. I would rather Hugh would, he said, than be a king like the King of England. It was under Charles that France won Algiers in the north of Africa, the most prosperous of the French possessions today, but nothing could make Charles popular. He stopped the freedom of the press, and Paris rose in revolt. Once more the tricolor, the flag of the revolution, was seen in the streets. The soldiers and the citizens fought, but the soldiers had never really had much enthusiasm for fighting against the tricolor. The citizens won, for many of the soldiers went over to them. The palace of the Tuileries was again attacked, but the king was not there. When he sent word that he was ready to grant freedom to the press again, he was told that it was too late. He fled to England, where William the Fourth was now king. Many of the Parisians had hoped for a republic once more, but this was not yet to be, and the French crown was offered to the Duke of Orleans, a member of the royal family, who had fought as a young man when the armies of the revolution were attacked by the invaders at Valmy. But Louis-Philippe, though he reigned until 1848, never really suited the French. They wanted more reforms than he could grant. Once more in 1848, an attack was made on the Palace of the Tuileries, and Louis-Philippe had to abdicate in his turn. He was seventy-five when he fled away with his queen into exile. France now became a republic again, with Louis-Napoleon, the nephew of the Emperor Napoleon, as its president. He was the son of Louis Bonaparte, the former King of Holland, Napoleon's own son. The King of Rome had died at an age of twenty. He had always been a delicate boy, and he died worn out with longing to be able to do something to win his father's empire back. It was not long before Prince Louis Napoleon was able to have himself proclaimed emperor. He was called Napoleon the Third, as though he had a right to succeed to the son of Napoleon, who was therefore spoken of as Napoleon the Second. So France was ruled by an emperor once more, though not for long. Meanwhile, Changes in Europe had followed both the Revolution of 1830 and this of 1848. Belgium had rebelled against being joined with Holland, and had become a separate kingdom under a German prince, the uncle of Princess Victoria, who became Queen of England in 1837. Hanover could not be held by women, and so no longer belonged to the English sovereign. It was soon joined to Prussia. Poland, filled with the spirit of nationality and wish for freedom, rose against Russia, but the rebellion was put down. With the death of Ferdinand VII in 1833, Spain also got a constitution for a time. Before this, the nations of Europe had been roused to enthusiasm by the struggle of the Greek people for independence against the Turks. The Sultan at Constantinople left the government of the conquered states in the hands of rulers who governed them very much as they liked. These rulers, who were, of course, Mohammedans, were often very cruel to the Christian people like the Greeks, who had borne their rule for centuries but the new spirit of nationalism was now felt by the Greeks, and they rose in rebellion against the Turks. Terrible fighting took place, 
for the Greeks were as cruel as the Turks once they had risen, just as slaves are vicious when they have once risen against their masters. At first, the countries of Europe did not interfere, although Russia, and England especially, were in favor of the Greeks. But volunteers from these countries went to help the Greeks. Among them was the poet Lord Byron, who was full of memories of the great days of Greece and enthusiasm for its writers. The modern Greek could hardly be looked upon as the descendants of the old Greeks, for so many Romans and other people had since mingled with the people. Still, in Greece itself, there was a new enthusiasm for the study of the old Greek literature and language. The population of Greece was now largely made up of herdsmen and of soldiers, many of whom were brigands constantly worrying the Turkish rulers. Lord Byron hoped that the glories of old Greece might be restored, and was full of this dream when he landed in Greece to help them to fight in 1824. He went on to Mesolonghi, one of the strongest places on the west coast of Greece, but he got fever in the low swampy land and died. Still, he had given the Greeks hope and courage. Mesolonghi was besieged by sea and land. The siege lasted a year, and then all the food and powder were gone, but the Greeks would not surrender. They preferred to die, and when they could hold out no longer, men, women, and children dashed out on the Turks and died fighting outside the town they had defended so long. At last, England, France, and Russia sent help to the Greeks, and a great battle was fought in the Bay of Navarino. The Turks were defeated, but there were some years of fighting yet. England did not want to make Turkey too weak, because this would make Russia too strong. But at last, in 1833, it was arranged that Greece should be a free kingdom under Otto of Bavaria, a prince only seventeen years old, as its first king. This new kingdom was to have a constitution, too, so the work of the French Revolution was being slowly but surely done. Hungary, the beautiful country which had so long been under the rule of Austria, although it belonged to quite a different race from the people of that country, now fought for freedom too. For many years the Hungarians had chosen the emperor to rule them, but now it had become a matter of course, and they had no share in their own government, and there was no freedom of the press. In the year 1837, a young Hungarian, Louis Kossuth, set up a newspaper in which the new ideas of liberty found a voice. This did not please the Austrian government, and Kossuth was put in prison for two years. At last he was set free and started his newspaper again. The people looked on him as a leader. When the revolution of 1848 took place in France, the Hungarians hoped more and more for liberty, and Louis Kossuth was sent with some other chosen men to ask for reform in Hungary. The emperor promised, for he was frightened at the moment, but he broke his promises, and then Hungary rose with Louis Kossuth as its leader in a war against Austria. The peasants flocked, armed with knives and hatchets, to fight for their country. They defeated the Austrians many times, but Austria got help from Russia, and thousands of soldiers marched into Hungary. The Hungarians had to give in. Many of the leaders of the rebellion were shot, but Louis Kossuth escaped from the country. The United States sent a ship to carry him over to their land, but afterwards he went to live in Italy, where he died in 1894. But thirty years before this, Hungary had won her freedom after all. Although she remains under the Austrian emperor, her government is quite independent of the government of Austria, and the countries ruled over by the emperor are now called together Austria-Hungary. Soon after Napoleon III became emperor of France, the French people joined the English in a war with Russia. Russia had won Finland, and so became the chief country on the shores of the Baltic. She longed to capture Constantinople and launch her ships on the Bosphorus. Turkey was in a very weak state. The Tsar Nicholas told the English that Turkey was a sick man, a very sick man. He felt that it would be easy to steal all he wanted from the sick man. He was willing that England should take Egypt and the island of Crete, and would have liked to take the Turkish provinces in Europe for himself. But England did not want Russia to become too strong, and refused. One reason why England did not care for the Russians to grow too strong was that Russia is the nearest country in Europe to India, which he might try to attack through the passes of the Himalayas. Russia made the Turkish treatment of the Christians in her provinces an excuse for attacking the Turkish fleet in the Black Sea in the year 1854. The Turkish fleet was destroyed and 4,000 Turks killed. So England and France made ready to attack Russia in the peninsula of the Crimea, and so began the famous Crimean War. The English commander was Lord Raglan, who had lost his arm at Waterloo. The English and French knew nothing about the Crimea, but they landed in September 1854 at a place near the mouth of the River Alma. The Russians were drawn up on a ridge of hills on the other side of the river. They fired on the English and French all the time they were crossing the river, 
but they went bravely on up the hill and broke the Russian line, and so won the first battle of the war. Then they marched on to Balaclava, where again they defeated the Russians. But the Battle of Balaclava is best remembered because of the famous charge of the Light Brigade. Through some mistake, the Brigade, a company of cavalry, was ordered to cross a mile and a half of the battlefield, where it would be fired on all the time and charge the Russian guns. It was a terrible order, for horse soldiers could not attack artillery in such a way, but though they knew it was a mistake, the Brigade knew too that a soldier's first duty is obedience. They made the charge, and few came back to tell the tale. Everybody knows Tennyson's poem on the charge of the Light Brigade. Their courage will never be forgotten. The French general looking on said, It is magnificent, but it is not war. As winter came on, the English and French were besieging Sebastopol. The cold was terrible, and the soldiers were short of clothes. Some ships carrying clothes and blankets were wrecked in Bacalaba Bay, and the things were all lost. When some things did arrive, it was seen that terrible mistakes had been made. Once a great case of boots was unpacked. They were all for the right foot. The men fell ill, and thousands died. Florence Nightingale It was now that Miss Florence Nightingale, an English lady, took nurses out to care for the sick and wounded soldiers at Scutari, where the Turkish barracks had been made into a hospital. But at last, after a siege of 349 days, Sebastopol was taken. So ended the Crimean War. The Black Sea was open to ships of all countries, and Russia was allowed to keep only six warships on it. Ever since the Crimean War, the Christian nations under the Turks in Europe have been longing for their freedom. In 1877, Russia joined the Christians in their struggle, and Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro won their independence. Other provinces were put under the protection of Austria, and afterwards became part of Austria-Hungary. Bulgaria got its own government, but had to pay tribute. It is now quite free. Even today the people of Albania and the districts to the north of Greece are struggling for their freedom from the Turks. They are being helped by the Serbians and Bulgarians and other peoples who have already won their freedom. There are many who feel that things will not be right until the sick man of Europe is driven out of Europe altogether. The Turks are a brave if fierce people, but Christian peoples have never been happy under their rule. Immediately after the revolution of 1848 in France, which once more filled the minds of men all over Europe with the longing of freedom, Nearly every one of the German states demanded a constitution from their princes. There was a feeling, too, that after all, the Germans of all these little states belonged to one race, and that they would be much stronger if they could join together and become one nation. A great meeting was held at Frankfurt to discuss this thing, but there were too many quarrels. Some people wanted to include Austria. Others felt that the Austrians were not really Germans, and wanted all the other states to join with Prussia at their head. This is what happened afterwards, but for the time the idea was given up. But as the years went on, the Germans were more and more inclined to unite. The King of Prussia, William I, had for his chief statesman a great man called Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck was one of the greatest statesmen of modern times. He was stern and strong, and when he made up his mind to do a thing, he did it. The German problem, he said, cannot be solved by parliamentary decrees, but by blood and iron. He knew that before Prussia could make itself the head of a new German empire, there must be a war with Austria. In 1863, Christian IX, the father of the Princess Alexandra, who married the Prince of Wales, afterwards King Edward VII of England, became King of Denmark. For many years the little states of Schleswig and Holstein, which were really German, had belonged to Denmark. But now Prussia and Austria fought Denmark for them. The Danes fought as they have always done, splendidly, but Denmark is too small a country to fight against two great powers, and in the end they had to give up Schleswig and Holstein to the enemy. Then Austria and Prussia fought for the states themselves in the Seven Weeks' War. The powerful army which Bismarck had made for Prussia won the victory, and Austria gave up all her power in Germany. The new Prussian province of Schleswig-Holstein gave Germany more power on the Baltic coast. Right across the province there is now a canal which saves the German ships from sailing round the stormy coast of Denmark. It is in the harbor of Kiel that Germany is now building her dreadnoughts, the great warships which many Englishmen fear are being prepared to attack England's supremacy on the seas. When France, under its Emperor Napoleon III, saw the growing power of Germany, it grew alarmed. Bismarck was glad of the chance of war, and in 1870 a war between France and Prussia broke out. 
the French people were still full of the memory of Napoleon and the great victories which his armies had won. They did not realize how strong the army of Prussia had grown, and how weak their own now was. They went into the war with a light heart. The German states joined readily with Prussia, and sent their armies to help the strong Prussian army against France. In all the battles which the Germans won, the conquering army was larger than the French army it defeated. But the Germans were really better prepared for war in every way. The French won the first battle, in which the young Prince Imperial, the son of Napoleon III, fought nobly, but it was their only victory. At the Great Battle of Sedan, the French were surrounded, and though they fought madly, the better trained soldiers of Prussia conquered them. Napoleon III went wherever the shots were thickest. He was hoping to be killed, but at last he made up his mind to surrender, and sent the message to old King William, not having been able to die in the midst of my troops. There is nothing left for me but to give up my sword into the hands of your majesty. An emperor who could not win battles would never be tolerated by the French. This Napoleon III knew, and he left France forever with the Empress Eugenie. He died three years afterwards in England, broken-hearted. The Empress Eugenie lived for many years in England, loved and admired by all who knew her. But the young Prince Imperial was killed in the Zulu War, fighting nobly for the English people who had given his father and mother a home in their exile. But though the emperor had surrendered, Paris determined to resist. For four months the siege went on. The starving Parisians ate horses and paid large sums of money for dogs and cats and rats. But at last they had to give in, and when peace was made they had to give up Alsace and Lorraine, two more of those Rhine provinces which were much more French than German. The French have never forgiven the Germans for their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War, and to get back Alsace and Lorraine is the dream of many Frenchmen today. Provinces themselves are still loyal to the French, and it is said that if a visitor asks a peasant girl there today to what country she belongs, she will look cautiously round to see that no one is listening, and then whisper eagerly, France! But one great result of the Franco-Prussian War was that now at last France became a republic, and has been one ever since. After nearly a hundred years, the freedom which the first leaders of the revolution of 1789 had longed for, and which had caused so much suffering to France and to Europe, was won. At the same time, the war made Germany a nation. While the Prussian king was at the palace of Versailles, where he stayed during the siege of Paris, news came that the people of the German states had made up their minds to unite in one empire, and King William I of Prussia became the first emperor of Germany. Each state still governs itself, and has its own prince and its own court, but in all things connected with war and peace and trade, the government of the emperor decides for all. So after many centuries, the German states, which had remained separate since the Middle Ages, became at last a nation. The Making of Italy Meanwhile, Italy, that other country which had been for so long broken up and in the power of other peoples, was becoming a nation too, Early in the 19th century, the same longing for freedom which had begun to spread through the other countries of Europe was felt in Italy, too. Young men like Joseph Mazzini, the first great hero of Italian independence, longed to see their country freed from the foreigner and united as one nation. His one thought was the sorrows of Italy. He always wore black clothes to show how he mourned for her. A society was formed of Italians who would work for their country's freedom. It was called Young Italy, and its watchword was God and the people. After the revolution of 1830, some of the Italians rose, but only a few, and they were easily put down. Before this, Mazzini had gone into exile after being in prison for some months, for young Italy was a secret society, and it had been found out that he belonged to it. He went, like so many exiles, to England, where he stayed until a new movement began in Italy, after the revolution in France in 1848. All North Italy rose against Austria, and Mazzini went to Rome and set up a republic. The Pope, Pius IX, had at first been very much in sympathy with the idea of the liberty of the people, but had afterwards become frightened at the violence of some of its leaders. He now fled from Rome. But in the north, Austria brought a great army and defeated the Italians, and Prince Louis Napoleon brought an army of Frenchmen and won back Rome for the Pope, in spite of the splendid fighting of Garibaldi, another leader of the Young Italy movement. He, too, had been exiled soon after Mazzini, and had spent many years in war in South America, until he also came back to Italy, when he heard that the people were ready to fight for their freedom. When, after weeks of fighting, he was at last driven from Rome, he fled with his wife Anita, whom he dearly loved, trying to reach Venice, 
but could not do so, and he was hunted from place to place, over mountains and through forests, until his wife died worn out. At last he got away to America, where he stayed until ten years later Italy made a last and successful attempt to win its freedom. Many of the leaders of the Young Italy movement would have liked to have made an Italian republic, but they hoped to get help from the other countries of Europe, and they knew they would only get it if they tried to set up a kingdom and not a republic. If they had won in their rising in 1849, Charles Albert of Sardinia was to have been ruler of the lands conquered from Austria. But Austria forced Charles Albert to abdicate, and his son Victor Emmanuel became king of Sardinia. Charles Albert went into exile, and died without knowing that success was to come, and that his son was to be king of all Italy. Victor Emmanuel had for his chief statesman Cavour, the third great leader in winning the freedom of Italy. He saw that Italy could only conquer Austria if she were helped by other countries. In 1859, a French army under Napoleon III marched into Italy to help Cavour against Austria. Nearly all Lombardy was won by them, and then Napoleon, who thought he had done enough, made peace with the Austrians. This would have left Venice and other parts of North Italy to them, but Cavour was terribly angry at Napoleon's behavior, and the people of North Italy all wanted Victor Emmanuel for their king. Garibaldi helped in the struggle, a dark fierce man in the famous red shirt which he always wore. At last, all of North Italy, except Venice, belonged to Victor Emmanuel. There were still the Papal States, Naples and Sicily, to win. Garibaldi begged the North Italians for money to get men and weapons to fight against the King of Naples, who was, of course, a foreigner belonging to the French royal family. Garibaldi took his men to Sicily and called on the peasants to rise. The islanders rose and drove the Neapolitan officers away. Sicily was won for Victor Emmanuel. Then the leader crossed to Naples. The royal family fled, and the people followed Garibaldi. But at the royal palace there were still royal troops. They might at any moment have fired, but Garibaldi stood up in his carriage looking steadily at them. Then they, too, gave way to the enthusiasm of the people for Young Italy. Great cries of Viva Garibaldi, long live Garibaldi, were heard on every side and Naples was won also for Victor Emmanuel. The greater part of the Papal States had been taken too. All Italy except Rome was now joined under one ruler for the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire. In 1870, when France, being at war, could no longer send an army to defend the Pope, Rome was taken too, and became the capital of the new kingdom. An offer was made to the Pope to pay him yearly a large sum of money. He was to have his court like a king and his soldiers, but he was not to rule over any part of the land. But the Pope would not agree to this. He still lives in his palace of the Vatican, but has never given his consent to the loss of the Papal States. This question of the temporal power, as the Pope's rule over the Papal States was called, is still discussed among Catholics today. There are many who think that the Pope can rule better and more spiritually over the Church now that he is no longer a temporal prince, but others think that he has been robbed of his rights. Especially in Roman society does the quarrel go on. The people are divided between the whites, who are all for the Pope, and the blacks, who are in favor of the king. Meanwhile, the royal and papal courts go on side by side. Certainly it would have been impossible for the great dream of Italian unity to come true if the temporal power had been kept. And so now at last all Europe was divided into nations, and all had constitutions more or less free, except the one country of Russia. Nowhere any longer were there serfs, except indeed in Russia until 1861, where there, too, the Tsar set them free. But in Russia alone there is very little freedom of government yet. The Tsar is as absolute as any king before the French Revolution, or more so. There is no freedom of the press in Russia, and no freedom of thought. For years all men or women who have dared to speak against the government have been sent as prisoners to Siberia, that great tract of land stretching across the north of Asia which Russia won in the 16th century. There the exiles used to be driven in crowds, marching in chains for thousands of miles to the prisons they were never more to leave. Prisoners are still sent to Siberia, but they go by the wonderful Trans-Siberian Railway, which stretches from Europe to the Pacific Ocean. Many Russian exiles are to be found in all the countries of Europe, waiting and hoping till their country too shall be free. There are some who have grown desperate, and would destroy all governments if they could. Everywhere else the peoples of Europe are free, and so too in America and Africa and Australia. At the beginning of the 19th century, all South America, except two little districts in the north which belonged to England, were under Spain and Portugal. The people were partly Spanish and Portuguese, 
but there were many more natives, and many too half-breeds or creoles, people descended from Spaniards who had married natives. When the United States won their freedom from England, and the news of the French Revolution reached South America, ideas of revolution began to spread through South America too. Then, when the Spanish and Portuguese kings were deposed by Napoleon, the South Americans hardly knew who were supposed to be their rulers. This encouraged the ideas of independence which were already spreading. The Portuguese royal family fled to Brazil, but soon after they had returned to Portugal, Brazil became a separate state with a Portuguese prince as its constitutional emperor. At last, in 1889, Brazil became a republic. But things were not done so peacefully in the greater part of South America, which belonged to Spain. In these provinces, there were many royalists as well as republicans, and there were many bitter struggles before the republicans won. One of the great heroes of the struggle was a man named San Martin. For four years he fought against the royalists in the rich country round the Plata, the great Silver River, but in 1816 he was able to set up the Republic of Argentina. Then Chile arose, but the royalists of Peru defeated the republicans there. There were many strange people in South America, and the leader of the Chileans was an Irishman named O'Higgins. But San Martin marched to his help across the great mountain range of the Andes, and Chile too won its independence. After many bitter struggles, Venezuela also won its freedom, though it was twice won back again, and then Bolivar, the hero of Venezuela, joined with San Martin to win Peru. At last, Spanish North America was divided into nine republics. At first, they were often governed by dictators, soldiers who would help to win their freedom for them. But in the end, they all became really free republics, and South America rapidly became rich and strong. So here, too, the work of the French Revolution spread. And now even the peoples of Asia are waking up to the idea of freedom, and we may hope that before long all the peoples of the earth will have their liberty. End of chapter 45 Recording by Todd Chapter 46 The Story of the World A Simple History for Boys and Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by D. L. Martin. The Story of the World. A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 46. Africa, the Land of Mystery. Meanwhile, another vast land was becoming of greater importance in the world's history. Africa, as we know it today, can only look back on a history of about 40 years. Within that time, the nations of Europe have agreed to cut it up into pieces, in each of which some European nation rules. Of all that vast continent, only two states are ruled by natives, the Republic of Liberia and Abyssinia. Liberia is the place where slaves who had been set free were allowed to settle down and begin their lives over again in freedom. From 1821 up to about 50 years ago, ships sailed across the ocean from America, bringing hundreds of old Negro men and women and children to their new home in that Africa from which their forefathers had been stolen so many years before. The other native state, Abyssinia, is much older, and one of their old stories says that the Queen of Sheba, who visited King Solomon, was a queen of Abyssinia. Since the struggle with Italy, which ended in the terrible defeat of the Italians in 1896, no one has tried to rob the Abyssinians of their independence. In the rest of Africa, Germany and Portugal each have two pieces south of the equator, one on the east and one on the west side. Between them are the South African Union and other states under Great Britain. At Lake Tanganyika, where this country ends, is the Congo Free State, which belongs to Belgium. North of the equator, Great Britain has British East Africa and Uganda, stretching up to Egypt to the west of which is the huge desert land reaching to the west coast and belonging to France. Morocco, Algeria, and Tunis are also under France. 
Tripoli and the westerly part of Africa under Italy, while there are other strips of land on the west coast belonging to France, Great Britain, and Germany. We must now see how all these lands came to be ruled by the nations of Europe. Although the continent of Africa is about three times as large as Europe, and nearly two hundred times the size of England and Wales, and has a huge number of people living in it, it is a land of mystery. Part of it, indeed, is called the Dark Continent, but in many ways the whole is dark. There is so little known of it, so much that can never be known. The people who first lived in Africa were probably a small black race, and many of this sort of people still live in the part of Africa farthest from the sea. The parts we know best are the parts near the sea. Besides Egypt, the northern sea states, Morocco, Tunis, and Tripoli, which were called Barbary from the Barber people who live there, were the only places which people knew much about before the 16th century. We have seen how the Arabs conquered Egypt in the 7th century and then pushed their way along the North African coastlands and on into Spain. But after the Moorish power was ended in Spain, Barbary, except Morocco, was taken by the Spaniards at the beginning of the 16th century. But it never really became Spanish, and almost immediately afterwards, Algeria, Tunis, and Tripoli were taken by the Turks, who had also now conquered Egypt. Morocco alone remained independent, and some of the Moors from that state journeyed south as far as Timbuktu. The Barbary Pirates But the Turks have always seemed to stop the growth of the lands they have conquered. And the only thing that shows that these states were alive until the 19th century was the bands of pirates who sailed out in their swift low boats and attacked any ship which was not well protected with guns. The pirates were quite fearless, and even when the French and English joined against them, they could not conquer them at first. They were not always only people from Barbary. Men from European countries joined them, too, now and then. They not only attacked ships, sometimes they would swoop down on a town, kill whoever tried to resist them, and carry other people off and sell them as slaves, or make their friends buy them back for immense ransoms. They often attacked Spain and Sicily and parts of Italy, but even got as far as Ireland sometimes. Of course, if the nations of Europe had really joined to conquer them, they could have done so, but they did not. Tunis was really a pirate state, and pirates ruled the chief coast towns of all these states. Twice in the 19th century, a British fleet attacked Algiers, which was one of their chief strongholds, but they were not really put down until France conquered first Algeria and then Tunis. France now really rules both of these states, though there is a native ruler in Tunisia who governs under the French. The French power has in the last few years been recognized as the chief in Morocco, though Spain is allowed to govern certain parts. For many years in the last century, several European nations wanted to be the chief power in Morocco and Germany was the last to agree to the French ruling there. In 1912, the Italians invaded Tripoli and took it from the Turkish rulers after some fierce fighting. Egypt Egypt has had quite a different past from the Barbary states. When the Arabs took Egypt, it was at first ruled by governors sent by the caliphs, but in time, the governors passed on their power to their sons, and became the real rulers of the country independent of the caliphs. Saladin, against whom Richard I fought in the Crusades, was one of these rulers of Egypt. Many other rulers came after Saladin, but they were often weak men, and in 1517 the Turks conquered Egypt, and they kept it till Napoleon's famous attack on Egypt in 1798. Some years before this, however, a Scotsman named James Bruce, who had had a life filled with strange adventures, had traveled through Egypt. 
He had spent two years at the court of the pirate rulers of Algiers, and he then traveled through Tunis to Tripoli. He took ships to the island of Crete, but was wrecked and had to swim back to the African shore. He had made up his mind to see where the Nile, the great river of Egypt, began. It was not an easy thing he had set himself to do, but he had many things in his favor. He was used to danger. He was taller and bigger than most men, very strong, and very good at sports. He knew several languages well, and also had a little knowledge of how to cure diseases. He arrived in Alexandria in 1768, and was able to make friends with the ruler of Egypt. The country was filled with wild men, but Bruce went among them without fear. He saw the old Egyptian city of Thebes, and went across the desert to Arabia dressed as a Turkish soldier. Then he returned and went to Abyssinia, where everyone was kind to him. He stayed there two years. The king of Abyssinia did not want him to go away, but at last allowed him to, and then Bruce traveled to the place where, not the Nile, but the Blue Nile, begins. He had done a great deal, but he had not done what he thought. The White Nile is really the Nile of the ancient peoples and although he did not find its source, he traveled still further across the desert and found the place where the Blue Nile joins the White Nile, a place which British people will always remember, for there stands Khartoum, where General Gordon died. Poor Bruce, after all his hardships, found that people would not believe his story when he got back to London. Even when he wrote all his adventures down in a book, many people still refused to believe him. He went back very sad to his home in Scotland, but now we know that all he said was true. The End of Egypt's Independence Napoleon's soldiers did not stay long in Egypt. They were driven out by the English and the Turks, and then Mehemet Ali made himself ruler. He was terribly cruel, and when a British army fought against him, he cut off the heads of the soldiers and stuck them on pieces of wood in Alexandria. The strange thing is that after beginning his rule with so much cruelty, he really became a good ruler, and when he died in 1848, all the land along the Nile and the roads by which people traveled were quite safe, even for Christians. It was through the grandson of Mehemet Ali, Ismail, that Egypt lost its independence. He had been to school in France, and had there learned many new ways of obtaining and spending money. Eastern people are generally extravagant, but Ismail had become worse through his life in Paris. He found that it was easy for a country to borrow money, and so he got as much as he could. He borrowed so much and so often that at last the great countries of Europe saw that they must interfere if Egypt was ever to pay its debts. But before this, Ismail had done many good things for Egypt. He got Englishmen to teach the Egyptians new ways, and letters were sent by post for the first time in the history of Egypt. He built railways, lighthouses, and telegraphs and the great canal at Suez, through which ships sail on their way to India and Australia, was opened in 1869, six years after he began to rule. In 1875, Egypt was in a very bad state. Ismail had no money, and no one would lend him any more. So he sold his part of the profits in the Suez Canal to Great Britain. This made England take an interest in Egyptian money matters, and when the men who were sent to find out how Ismail was spending his money told how great his debts were, an Englishman was put to sea to the collection of all the taxes, and a Frenchman to see that the money was spent wisely. After three years, Ismail tried secretly to stir up rebellions in Cairo, and then the English and French asked the Sultan of Turkey, who was supposed to be Ismail's king, to appoint another ruler for Egypt. This the sultan did at once, 
and England and France helped the new ruler to govern Egypt until the Arab soldiers rose in rebellion. The British fleet then attacked Alexandria in 1882, and the English, seeing that they could not conquer the rebellious Arabs in this way alone, made up their minds to send soldiers to Egypt. France refused to send any, and so did Italy, and British soldiers had to do the work alone. England in this way came to be the only nation to help the Khedive, as the ruler of Egypt is called, to govern in peace. Sir Evelyn Baring, who is now Lord Cromer, was the Englishman sent out to represent Great Britain in 1884, and until a few years ago he remained in Egypt. He was so wise that law and order are everywhere now in Egypt, and the country is rich and prosperous. General Gordon But many Englishmen have lost their lives in making Egypt a greater and better state. The most famous of these was General Gordon. He had fought in the Crimean War and in China before he was sent to Egypt in 1874 to act as governor for the Khedive in the land to the south. He went at once to the country he was to rule and worked hard for six years putting down the slave trade, drawing maps of the unknown country, and learning to know the strange peoples of the desert. He succeeded in this so well that he could make these people do things which no one else could persuade them to do. He was always in great danger. Once a rebellion broke out at a place called Darfur, and Gordon went as fast as he could to put it down. He had only a few soldiers. And when he came near to the rebels, he left his soldiers behind and went with only one man to speak to the rebels. This man he took because he did not know the language of these people. After he had spoken to them for a little time, the rebels went quietly away. He tried to make peace in a war between Egypt and Abyssinia, but was taken prisoner. During each of the last three years of his rule, he had to ride about 3,000 miles on camels or mules, and he was quite tired out when he gave up his command in 1880. He spent a short time in South Africa, paid a visit to Palestine, and then, at the beginning of 1884, was asked by the British government to go out to Egypt once more. When Gordon left Egypt, a man whom he had once had to send away for ruling badly under him had been made governor of the Sudan, as the country south of Egypt is called. Soon his unjust rule made people very angry, and an Egyptian who had been ill-treated now rose and got the people to rebel. He said that he himself was the Mahdi, the successor of Mahomed. A large army was sent to fight against him, but it was defeated and hundreds and hundreds of soldiers were killed. Soon the Mahdi became master of nearly the whole of the Sudan except Khartoum, and Great Britain advised the Khedive to give up the Sudan altogether. Gordon was sent to see how the soldiers in the forts scattered over the Sudan could be got away to Egypt without being killed by the Mahdi. He arrived at Khartoum on the 18th of February, and all the natives welcomed him thinking that he had come to deliver them from the Mahdi. Soon the soldiers of the Mahdi surrounded Khartoum, but not before Gordon had got the women and children safely away. There had been an army not far off at Swakin, but it was taken away, and the forts north of Khartoum were taken, so Gordon was cut off from all help. He had only one other white man with him. The rest were natives. There was not much food in Khartoum, and the fort was not built to stand against a strong attack. Yet the months dragged on, and still he would not surrender. There alone, in the midst of the desert, among men of a different race and religion, he held out, doing, as he said, the best for the honor of his country, waiting and hoping that help would come. On the 5th of January, 1885, the last morsel of food was eaten, and the starving men grew weaker day by day, but would not give in. 
But the waters of the Nile had risen and broken one of the walls, and when the Mahdi and his followers rushed in on 26th January, the men were too weak to resist. Gordon and many others were killed. I am quite happy, thank God, he had written in a letter which he left behind for his sister. I have tried to do my duty. Two days after his death, the help he had hoped for arrived, but it was too late and many long years were to pass before the Egyptian army, trained and drilled by British officers and helped by British soldiers, was to avenge the death of Gordon. Little by little this army was built up. Step by step it marched forward into the Sudan until Sir Herbert, now Lord Kitchener, felt that it was strong enough to attack the Mahdi's stronghold at Omdurman, two miles north of Khartoum. The followers of the Mahdi fought so bravely that 10,000 were killed before they gave in, but at last the black flag, which used to fly at Omdurman, was captured and sent home to Queen Victoria. The Mahdi's power was destroyed forever. This was in 1898. On Sunday, 4th September, two days after the victory, General Kitchener, with a man from each regiment, crossed the Nile to Khartoum hoisted the flags of Great Britain and Egypt, and held a service in memory of General Gordon on the spot where he died. Since then, Egypt has grown still more prosperous under the direction of Great Britain. A university was founded at Khartoum a few years ago, and the place which was the scene of so terrible a tragedy is now a peaceful and prosperous town. Lord Cromer resigned his position as representative of Great Britain in 1907, and now Lord Kitchener, who did so much to give Egypt peace and safety, has taken his place. The Explorers So far, only a fringe of Africa has been mentioned. The story of the rest of this huge continent is chiefly the story of the brave men who spent their lives in trying to learn something of its mystery. It is strange to think that the explorers who have discovered what is known about Africa, nearly all, and certainly all the greatest, lived within the last hundred years. It is true that in the 15th century, the brave Portuguese sailor Bartholomew Diaz sailed round the Cape of Good Hope and stopped at many places on the coast, and Portuguese missionaries made their way into Abyssinia. And it is also true that the Dutch, two centuries later, settled in Cape Town. But behind these coastlands lay the dark continent, about which the people of Europe knew nothing until the 19th century. Mungo Park One of the first explorers to go to Africa was a young Scottish doctor named Mungo Park. It was only a year after the death of Bruce, who discovered the source of the Blue Nile that Mungo Park started out to follow the course of the Niger, a river of West Africa. He reached the Gambia River, and having anchored his ship as far up as he could sail, he set out on horseback with a Negro servant and a slave boy. The natives warned him not to travel into the desert, but he went on. He had to make friends with the native chiefs whom he met. Once he had to give up his best coat because a chief liked the yellow buttons so much. He traveled through part of the country where war was going on, and the Negro servant ran away. Mungo Park was taken prisoner and badly treated, but at last got away. But he had no food or drink. When he thought he must surely die, he came at last to the long-sought majestic Niger glittering in the morning sun. He traveled still further, but he was nearly dead from hunger and from the suffering caused by the bites of mosquitoes, and so he sadly turned back. He had followed the great river three hundred miles, and after a few years in England he went out again. Once more he had to go through terrible sufferings. He started with a good many men this time, but many died, and with only seven left he went on, determined to discover the termination of the Niger, or perish, in the attempt. His end was very sad. The little party was sailing down a river when they saw the whole bank covered with natives who shot arrows and threw spears at them, 
and all but one man, seeing no way of escape, jumped overboard and were drowned. David Livingston It was thirty-six years before the next great explorer went to Africa. This was David Livingston, who was also a Scotsman like Mungo Park. He had had a hard time as a boy. He left school when he was only ten years old and worked for many years in a cotton mill before he was able to go to college, to study, to become a missionary. He wished to go to China, but when he had studied for a long time and had become a doctor, he was sent out to Africa. This was in 1841. He was 28 years old then and a strange man to look at. He looked rough, but he was really very gentle and he was always bubbling over with fun. He traveled great distances on his first journey, his winning manner helping him to make friends with the natives, and he soon made up his mind that he could do most good by traveling as far as possible and handing over the knowledge he had won for others to follow. He had not been in Africa very long before he was attacked by a lion, which crushed his arm so that it never really got well. He got married in Africa and still continued his journeys. Sometimes he stayed a little time in one place, and once after he had done this, the whole tribe of people followed him when he went away, because they loved him so much. In 1849, he crossed the great Kalahari Desert and reached Lake Ngami, which he was the first white man to see. This was only one of the many discoveries he made. He reached the Zambezi River in 1851, and, later on, he made up his mind to follow it, see where it began, and where it entered the sea. It is impossible to tell of all his journeyings, how he crossed Africa to the Portuguese town Luanda on the west, and then followed the Zambezi right to the east coast. When he reached Luanda, he was nearly dead. He had suffered terribly from fever and for many days had had hardly anything to eat. After a short rest, he set off again, always writing down carefully what he had found out, and again he was nearly dead when he reached another Portuguese town on the west. But he left his men there and two months later had the joy of reaching the place where the Zambezi runs into the sea. After a year in England, he went to Africa again in 1858, and he was very angry when he saw the terrible cruelties of the slave trade. The Arabs who bought and sold the Negroes as slaves treated them worse than beasts. Livingston made up his mind to do all he could to put an end to the slave trade in Africa. Wherever he went, he set the slaves free but once he had to stand by while Arab traders killed hundreds of women. He had lost the four goats he had taken with him. His medicine chest was stolen, and he could do nothing to help himself. He was not heard of for a long time, and people thought that he must be dead. So a brave man called Henry Morton Stanley was sent out by the owner of a great newspaper to try and find him. When Livingston, worn out, thin from fever and half-starved, reached Ujiji on Lake Tanganyika. What was his joy to find Stanley waiting for him with food and medicine? He seemed to get new life from the meeting and started afresh to find new places. Stanley had to leave him in 1872, and Livingston was never seen again by white men. He traveled from Tanganyika to Benguiolo. But their fever and the terrible disease of dysentery came on again. He grew worse and worse, so that the natives had to carry him. On 27th April, he wrote for the last time in his diary. On 30th April, he could just wind his watch, and the next day the natives found him kneeling by the side of his bed, dead. They carried the body and all the dead man's books to the coast, where they could give them into the keeping of white men for they were anxious to do all they could to show their love and respect for their dead teacher. The body was brought to England and buried in Westminster Abbey. Stanley went out to Africa the next year and discovered the Edward Nyanza. Nyanza is the African name for lake. He went right across the center of the continent.
It was the travels of these brave men that made the people of Europe begin to wish to take the land of Africa for themselves. At the beginning of the 19th century, Great Britain got Cape Colony by the Peace of Paris. It was a strange people the British had to rule there. The Dutch settlers of the 17th century had married with French Huguenots who came later, and these independent and rather hard men were jealous of the English settlers who now flocked to South Africa. They hated the English for putting an end to slavery and the slave trade, and in 1835 a great number of them moved together, or trekked, as they say in Africa, northwards to Natal, where they founded a republic. But not many years later, Natal was made a British colony, and many pieces of land where the natives were rebellious were added to Cape Colony. Others of the Dutch, or Boers, as they were called, when they settled in Africa, founded the Orange Free State, east of Natal. Great Britain took that in 1848, but gave it back to the Boers to rule six years later. Other Boers settled north of the Orange Free State and founded the Transvaal Republic. But they fought so much with the natives that Great Britain took it from them in 1877. This did not help the English very much, for they had now to struggle with the natives. The warlike Zulus, a very savage tribe, rose under their king, Ketchweo, and after defeating the English in one terrible battle, they were beaten in 1880, and Zululand was added to Natal. This was a chance for the Transvaal. They had been afraid of the Zulus before, but now that they were beaten— the Boers rebelled against the English. They soon beat the few British soldiers in South Africa. They had been fighting for years against the natives and knew better than the English how to fight in that country. The British government, while new soldiers were still on the way to South Africa, gave back to the Transvaal the right to govern itself. This looked to the Boers as if Great Britain had been really beaten and they did not take much notice of the conditions on which Great Britain had given them back their independence. It was only a few years later, in 1884, that Germany seized a big piece of Africa, both on the west and east coasts. Gold mines were now discovered in the Transvaal, and gold seekers soon poured in from England. Johannesburg, the town in the center of the district, grew by leaps and bounds. The Boers had always been clever to take advantage of any chance, so they put large taxes on the newcomers, but would not allow them any share in governing the country. But the outlanders, as the Dutch called the newcomers, came by and by to feel very angry against this unjust treatment. The Ideal of Cecil Rhodes There was at this time in South Africa a young man named Cecil Rhodes, who saw all the difficulties. He had gone out to South Africa when he was only 17 because of his delicate health. He soon got sufficient money from gold digging to be able to do what he liked, and his one thought was that all the strange and splendid country he had seen should be for Great Britain. His health grew better, and he went to Oxford to complete his education. But it broke down again, and he was told he had only six months to live. He went back to South Africa and entered the Cape Colony Parliament, and when he was after a time strong enough to go back to Oxford to take his degree, he was already a statesman. He was becoming richer all this time from the Kimberley Diamond Fields. He saw the danger of the Transvaal blocking the way to the north and the equal danger that the German colonies on the east and west coasts should meet, and he persuaded the British government to take the huge tract of land called Bechuanaland under its protection. In 1889, he founded a South African company which had great powers over the land now called Rhodesia after Rhodes himself. Rhodesia stretched up to the German colony on the east coast and the Congo Free State. Bechuanaland and Rhodesia kept the way to the north quite open for Great Britain, and Englishmen began to dream of a great belt of land which should unite Egypt with Cape Colony and be all for Great Britain. 
Rhodes became prime minister or chief man in the government of Cape Colony in 1890. The outlanders were now thoroughly angry about their grievances, and one of them, Dr. Jameson, collected a band of men and tried to get their rights by fighting for them. The Boers easily beat them, and then, after such a short battle, began to think even more badly about the British. The Boers all over South Africa were roused and at last Sir Alfred Milner was sent to try and make peace between them and the English settlers. President Kruger was then head of the Transvaal, and he flatly refused to make the condition of the outlanders any better. The Boer War No one in Great Britain was expecting trouble when suddenly the Boers demanded things which could not be granted and in 1899 war broke out between Great Britain and the Transvaal. The Boers were good fighters. They could shoot straight and ride for days without being tired out. There were very few British soldiers in South Africa, and soon they had to retreat to Ladysmith in Natal. Fresh soldiers were at once sent out from England under Sir Redvers Buller, some of them were sent to Kimberley and the Diamond Fields, and some to help the soldiers in Ladysmith. Others tried to stop the Boers who were invading Cape Colony, but disasters came everywhere. The British soldiers, brave as they were, did not know the country, and were easily beaten by the Boers. More soldiers were sent out in 1900, and the great general... Lord Roberts was sent to lead them with Lord Kitchener, who had avenged Gordon in Egypt as his chief assistant. Soldiers came also from Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Things began to look brighter for the British when in February Lord Roberts surrounded the Boer General Cronje at Kudusburg and made him give in. There were 4,000 Boers taken prisoners in this battle on 29th February. And, the day before, Lady Smith had been relieved by Sir Redvers Buller. The British Army now in the Orange Free State, for all the Boer states were helping the Transvaal, found no resistance, but fever had broken out and many soldiers died. A free state was now taken and Lord Roberts marched into the Transvaal. The march was made quickly and sometimes the Boers won in small battles. But in June, the last real Boer army was beaten, and President Kruger had fled. The Transvaal was taken, Kruger sailed to Europe, and it was thought the war was over. But for two years, the struggle still went on. The Boers split up their army into small bands and attacked whenever and wherever they could. Lord Roberts had gone back to England, and Lord Kitchener built small forts all over the country. There were many small battles, and sometimes still the Boers won. Then at length, in March 1902, the Boers saw they could hold out no longer and went to Pretoria to ask for peace. The agreement was signed on the 21st of May, and the war was at last at an end. Since 1902, the peoples of South Africa have been allowed to govern themselves, and Cape Colony, Natal, the Transvaal and the Orange Free State have joined together, just as the first colonies in Canada did. There are still some things on which the Boers and the English do not agree, but they are learning to live together in peace, and the Union of South Africa, which is the name of the four colonies, is growing more and more prosperous. A railway from Cairo in Egypt is getting longer every day, and will soon meet one from Cape Colony. When the two join, the heart of the dark continent will be robbed of some of its mystery. The settlements of other European nations are also growing, as well as the British colonies north of South Africa, and the natives are learning to trust their white rulers and imitate their ways. End of chapter 46「Chapter 47 of the Story of the World – A Simple History for Boys and Girls」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Read by Sylvie Wolf. The Story of the World: A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 47: The Story of China and Japan. It was not until the 19th century that the countries of Europe had any real connection with the two great countries of Asia, China and Japan. Yet the Chinese had a civilization older than any in Europe. Their country is larger than all the countries of Europe put together, and more than 400 millions of people live in it. The Chinese are a Mongolian people like the Turks. They have yellow skins and straight black hair, which until lately hung in long plaits down their backs from the center of their heads, the rest of the head being shaven. The children's heads are shaven too. And until their hair has grown long enough to be put into a pigtail, it stands up in little tufts from the middle of their heads. But now most of the Chinese have had their pigtails cut off to show their liking for the new freedom, which is finding its way into their land. We may often see Chinamen in the streets of our big towns today, but before the 19th century, this never happened. For the Chinese had got to a certain state of civilization, and for hundreds of years they had gone no further. They wanted to have nothing to do with foreigners and to live their own life in their own way. Yet hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, the Chinese knew how to write. Before that time, too, they could build suspension bridges and had made the wonderful Great Wall, fifteen hundred miles long, with towers and fortifications. The wall was really a road on top, and along it the caravans traveled, which traded between Siberia and China. They had silk manufactures and made beautiful china, and they had discovered the art of printing 500 years before it was discovered in Europe. But China had never gone much further, and Europe knew little about her except the stories which Marco Polo told after his famous journey to the court of the Great Khan. And these people had not believed. Picture caption: A Chinese emperor of the ninth century, examining the governors of cities, from an ancient Chinese painting. End caption. In the sixteenth century, traders from Portugal stopped at places on the Chinese coast, and later the English followed. In the seventeenth century, tea was brought from China to Europe. No one had ever seen it before. But the Chinese would not let people go far into their country. When, in the 16th century, a curious Portuguese succeeded in getting to Peking, the capital of China, he had his head cut off. And still, in the 19th century, it was the same. The Chinese took no notice of all the wonderful things which were happening in Europe, but went quietly on in their own way. Japan, too, when people began to be interested in it. In the 19th century, was just as anxious to keep itself free from the foreigners, but the Japanese soon showed that they were a very different people from the Chinese. Their history does not go so far back. They are probably a people of mixed race, but they must have some Chinese blood in their veins, and are rather like the Chinese to look at. Picture caption: A great battle in Japanese history. Painted by a Japanese artist, from a great painting twelve feet long of the Battle of Ogaki by a famous Japanese artist, this was one of the greatest battles in Japanese history. It was fought in the 17th century and gave the shogun, a kind of hereditary prime minister, the supreme power in Japan, even over the Mikado, which he held until the awakening of Japan. To Western ideas in the 19th century. End caption. Some people think that there is a large Aryan element in their blood. We know that the Japanese had taken possession of their beautiful highlands at least in the first century after the birth of Christ. Their history was not unlike that of the peoples of Europe in the early Middle Ages. There was an emperor called the Mikado over all the land. But a kind of feudalism grew up in which great lords got all power. The Portuguese traders went to Japan also in the 16th century, and the Jesuits sent their missionaries to teach the people Christianity. But not much progress was made. Japan, like China, 
did not like foreigners, but in 1853, the United States sent some warships under Commodore Perry with a letter from the president to the Mikado, asking him to make friends with the United States. He pointed out to them how near the two countries really were. The Japanese did not like the idea. But when a few months later the Americans came for their answer, the Japanese said yes, for they knew that they had no fleet to fight against the nations of Europe and America if they chose to fight them. Soon, America, Great Britain, Russia and Holland all had permission to trade at certain ports with Japan. In 1862, some Japanese were sent to journey through Europe and America. Everything was new and wonderful to them. Their own land was very charming, full of flowers. It was from Japan that chrysanthemums were first brought to Europe. The people themselves were small but quaint and pretty, and wore graceful clothes of cotton or silk, with great white sashes. Theirs is a land of sunshine, so the top of the great mountain Fujiyama is covered with snow. They were fine artists, and everything in Japan then, as now, seemed pretty and clean. But in the middle of the 19th century, the Japanese knew nothing of modern inventions. And these first men from Japan who came to Europe were full of enthusiasms when they went back. But there were many men in Japan who still hated the idea of imitating Western ways. These men joined together, and overthrew the power of the great lords. The emperor got all power again, and they hoped he would send the foreigners away, but he did not. The old Mikado died, and the new one was full of enthusiasm too for the things which were to be learned from the West. Soon Japan had a navy and an army imitated from those of the countries of Europe. A new system of education was set up, and every child in Japan was sent to school. Tokyo, the capital of Japan, became the largest city in Asia and one of the greatest in the world. It has electric light, telephones and telegraphs, all learned from the West. By degrees, too, Japan has won a parliament through which the people can use their power. Thought the Mikado is still more powerful and important in some ways than most constitutional kings. The Japanese people have great respect and reverence for those above them and for old people generally. They are very honorable too and very brave. In some ways, they are the most wonderful people of our modern world for the quick eager way they have learned so many new things in so short a time. Japan, a small nation, after all about as big as Great Britain, first proved her new-found strength in the struggle with China. All this time, China remained as obstinate as ever, hating all new things. In 1840, she had been obliged to open up some of her ports to British trade and had given up the city of Hong Kong to Great Britain. But this was only after a war between the English and Chinese called the Opium War. British traders carried opium, which they got from the poppy fields of North India into China. Now opium is a drug which makes people sleepy and stupid when they eat it and ruins the health of people who get into the habit of using it. It makes people intoxicated in the worst way even than too much wine or beer. Some of the Chinese people grew very fond of opium, and the emperor tried to prevent the British from bringing it into China. A short war took place, and then the Chinese had to give in. A few years later, there was another war, in which France and England together destroyed some of the Chinese forts and marched to Peking. The Chinese emperor had put some English in prison. These were released but to give the Chinese a lesson, the wonderful summer palace of the emperor at Peking was destroyed by the soldiers. More ports were then opened. Soon afterwards, the English helped the Chinese soldiers to put down a rebellion of thousands of Chinese who had risen against the government following their leader, who was a madman who thought he was a prophet and ought to rule over China. 
This time, English and Chinese soldiers marched together against the rebels, and peace was made. At last, the United States and the great European countries were allowed to send ambassadors to live in Peking, as they do to all the capitals of other countries. The China-Japanese War broke out in 1894. It was about the peninsula of Korea, which lies between the two countries. It did not belong to either. But the Japanese heard that the Chinese were making ready to invade it. The Japanese sent word to China that this must not be. But the Chinese went on with their preparations. Then war came. Everybody thought that little Japan would be crushed by the great power of China. But the Japanese won on land and sea. The Japanese fleet won a great victory over the Chinese in Korea Bay. And then the Chinese ships sailed off to Port Arthur in Manchuria, but the Japanese landed and took the town, which is now one terminus of the Trans-Siberian Railway. Then China begged for peace. The Japanese were admired by all Europe. Our young soldiers had fought like heroes. A story is told of one boy who was blowing the bugle as he stood by his captain. A bullet struck him in the chest. But still, he blew till he dropped dead. But the Japanese had never really feared China. They knew that Russia wanted to take China for herself. And indeed, no sooner was the Treaty of Peace signed between China and Japan than Russia got France and Germany to join her in taking all that Japan had won. The Japanese waited their time. Meanwhile, in the year 19, many Chinese. Angry at the way in which the European countries had interfered in China, rose to attack the houses in Peking where the European ambassadors lived. The German ambassador was murdered in the street. Many missionaries who were trying to convert China to Christianity were murdered in the same way, or burned in their houses with their wives and children. Many of the ambassadors were besieged in Peking. But were saved when the armies of six countries, with Japan amongst them, marched to their help. So far, the relations between China and Europe have not been a success. Yet, the Chinese are a splendid people in many ways, full of energy and industry. When they become Christians, they are splendid men indeed. And just lately, men in China have risen to demand freedom too, like the peoples of the West. A new constitution has been planned. We do not yet know how it will work, but the Chinese sent a touching request for prayers to be said in England for their success in their new way of life. On Sunday, 27th April, 1913, prayers were said in most of the churches throughout Great Britain for, in the words of the Chinese message, the newly established government. For the president yet to be elected, for the constitution of the republic, that the government may be recognized by the powers, that peace may reign within our country, that strong, virtuous man may be elected to office, that the government may be established on a strong foundation. With Japan, as we have seen, things are quite different. In the year 1904. The Japanese felt themselves strong enough to demand their rights from Russia, and the Russo-Japanese War began. Before this, everyone had feared Russia. People had believed that she had a wonderful army, but neither her army nor her navy was a match for those of Japan. At the beginning of the war, the Japanese defeated the Russian fleet and landed their armies in Korea. Terrible battles followed. In any one of which the Russians lost more soldiers than were killed altogether in the Boer Year War. When peace was made, Korea was given to Japan. Before this, Japan and England had made the Treaty of Friendship. Both were determined to prevent the power of Russia from growing. England feared that Russia might attack her empire in India, and both were determined that China should be left with the Chinese. For this and other reasons, the friendship between England and Japan is very close. Both are island nations and have very much in common. End of chapter forty-seven.
Chapter 48 of The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Story of the World, A Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill. Chapter 48. Our World Today. Our world today is very different from the world of even a hundred years ago. Children, who have not had time to see many changes, can hardly understand how different it is. A hundred years ago, steam engines were only just being thought of. Before that, things had to be carried along rough roads and wagons from place to place. People who were rich enough traveled on horseback or in carriages, and for ordinary travelers in the eighteenth century, there were stagecoaches which traveled between the biggest towns very slowly and painfully, for all over England and other countries, too, the roads were very bad. Now, when we want to go to another town, we step into a railway train which carries us there at the rate of from thirty to sixty miles an hour. Even when the roads had begun to be made better, and the ruts four foot deep, got rid of toward the end of the eighteenth century, it took three whole days for a letter to be carried from Bath to London. Now we can post a letter in any town in England or Scotland and know that it will reach London by the next morning. In those days, families did not break up and scatter all over the world. When they did, it was very difficult for them to get news of each other. Even after Queen Victoria began to reign in England, People had generally to pay at least a shilling for a letter to be sent to another part of England. But then it was arranged that letters could be sent to any part of the British Isles for a penny. And now a penny stamp will carry a letter to our friends in any of the British colonies, so that, though people are separated by such enormous distances, they feel in some ways nearer to each other than people in different parts of England did a hundred years ago. The first real passenger train began to run in England in 1830. It went at the rate of twenty miles an hour, which seemed very terrible and dangerous to people then, and, sad to say, one man was killed on the opening day of this railway between Liverpool and Manchester. Now our express trains go at the rate of sixty miles an hour. By this time, it was found that steam could be used to drive ships instead of waiting for wind to fill their sails. It was thought very wonderful when a steamer called the Great Western crossed the Atlantic from Bristol to New York in fifteen days. Now it is regularly done in a week. More wonderful than the discovery of steam was that of electricity. Through it, people can send messages by telegram so that news can be had in a few minutes from places miles away, and through its use on the telephone, people can speak to each other from place to place, even from cities so far apart as Paris and London. Cables, enclosing telegraph wires, have been laid down on the ocean floor from England to America, and cablegrams can be sent so that in a few hours people in any part of America can have news from friends in Europe. Submarine cables are now laid between many places all over the world. But in the last few years, an inventor called Marconi has discovered that messages can be sent by electricity between two instruments without any wires at all. This would have seemed like magic to people a hundred years ago. It is a very wonderful and important discovery. Already it has been very useful. Ships in distress, which have wireless instruments, can ask for help from other ships miles away. It was through the wireless messages by Phillips, the heroic telegraphist on the great steamer, the Titanic, which was wrecked in 1912, that help came from the Carpathia, and the people who had been got into the lifeboats before the steamer sank were saved. Almost like magic, too, it seems that photographs can also be sent by electricity so that photographs of a football match or any interesting event can be sent from the place it has happened in, such as Leeds or Manchester, 
and the pictures will be published in the London evening papers an hour or two later. The daily newspaper, again, is a thing that was quite new to our great-grandfathers. There were daily papers in London at the end of the 18th century, but they were few and expensive. After the middle of the 19th century, they became common in other large towns, and now very few people feel quite happy without their morning and evening paper, in which they may read the things that have happened all over the world the day before, things the news of which would have taken weeks and months and even years to come to us before the days of telegrams. Electricity is used, of course, for light and heat, and new houses nearly everywhere have electric light, while even gaslight was not known a hundred years ago when people used candles or oil lamps. In the last few years, too, it has been discovered that man can travel through the air quicker and more smoothly than by the quickest express trains. The great invention of the airship has come to us within the last few years. Every few weeks some improvement is made, and airmen are learning to manage their ships more easily. But as yet, things are only at the beginning and already many brave airmen have lost their lives, as brave pioneers must often do. People talk of the days when nations will no longer fight at sea with the great ironclad warships, which also were first built in the nineteenth century, but will fight their battles in the air with fleets of airships. Balloons were invented at the end of the eighteenth century. In them also men can go through the air. But at first they could only go like sailing ships in the direction in which they were sent by the wind. Now, however, in the last few years, airmen have discovered how to make balloons go in any direction they wish, and the dirigible balloons are thought to be more useful by many people than even airships. Several airmen have now crossed the English Channel, and prizes are being offered for the first flight right round England and Scotland, and the first flight across the Atlantic. So we live in a world of change and adventure. Brave and clever people are doing wonderful things every day to try to make the world a more comfortable place. But even more wonderful than these changes in the things around us, changes most of which have begun in England and have spread all over the world, are the changes which have come over the minds of men. In most countries, now men may believe as they like, and religion is a matter for each person to settle for himself. This spirit of toleration and freedom is the thing which we ought to value most of all the things which make our world today different from the world of a hundred years ago. At the beginning of the nineteenth century, the laws against Catholics, which prevented them from taking part in the government of their countries, were withdrawn in England and Ireland. For hundreds of years, the Catholics in England and Ireland had been looked upon almost as criminals, and very hard laws had been passed against them. This was especially terrible in Ireland, where nearly all the people were Catholic. Up to this time the Irish had had their own parliament, but only Protestants could sit in it or even vote for the people who became members of parliament. But now this has changed, and at last the Catholic Irish were given the ordinary rights of citizens. The Irish Parliament was, however, given up, and Ireland, for the future, sent members to the English Parliament, as Scotland had already done for a hundred years. Many of the Irish have never been pleased with this arrangement, and Ireland may soon have home rule again. But Catholic emancipation was only one sign of a new spirit which was passing over the world. The new democratic spirit is seen, too, in the education of children. In nearly all countries now, children are sent to schools which the governments keep up, so that even the poorest people can give their children a good education. A hundred years ago, very many of the people could not read or write at all, and especially miserable were the children of poor people in England at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th. In the second half of the 18th century, manufactures had grown very quickly in England. Things which had before been made by people in their homes in the country were now made much more quickly in great factories built in the towns. This was through the invention of new machines. It was now found that even children could help to work these machines. 
and little children of six and seven years old were crowded into the factories, working from early morning till dark. But soon this was changed. Laws were passed which said that children should no longer work in the factories until they were older, and then only for a few hours. Now no boy or girl is allowed to leave school until fourteen years of age, and so every child has a chance of learning things that will help it to live a wise and happy life. The children of the British Empire, whether in Great Britain or the colonies, have also the joy of feeling that they belong to a great race, that all over the world people speaking their language and loving their country are living their lives in their own way. They can like and admire the people of other nations, but they cannot help loving the people of their own empire. It is this feeling of loyalty to the nation and the empire that led to the setting up of Boy Scouts in England, a great movement which has now spread to other countries. For while we wish that peace may be kept between the nations, we naturally feel determined to be ready to defend our empire if that peace is broken. In reading history, Children nearly always feel glad that they were born in their own time and not in the past, when there was so much cruelty and bloodshed. For, unfortunately, in many parts of the story of the world, it is tales of cruelty and intolerance which have to be told. But then, too, there are the tales of the heroes and saints and martyrs, the pioneers and discoverers, and all who have done their part to make our world today a better place. This is one of the great lessons of history, that we too should do our part honorably and well, and in reading the story of the world, think not only of the romance of the past and present, but of the romance of the future too. End of section 48 End of The Story of the World a Simple History for Boys and Girls by Elizabeth O'Neill